before we get this underway, I want to extend a most sincere thank you to everyone who contributed to this project. When I first decided to put the call out, I never imagined this many people would respond, and it makes me so happy to see that even 20 years later, my favorite game series has a loyal and diehard fanbase that is still very active. I also want to give a big shout out to Memer Deluxe 1111, alternatively called Meme Man, for creating the previous Battle Network Iceberg that I covered on this channel. Without that video, I highly doubt this project would be anywhere near as successful as it was. I also want to thank Kaisan, who agreed to share his notes with me, as he's been working on his own iceberg chart that encompasses the majority of the Mega Man franchise and not just Battle Network. I'll have a link to his channel in the description, and I would greatly appreciate it if you would show him some love and support as well. His contributions and conversations with me over Discord have helped me shave countless hours off this project, so it's safe to say that he helped with at least half of this chart. And so, without further ado, I present to you our brand new community collaborated Rockman EXE Iceberg Chart. There are over 200 entries on this list, with the entries ranging from well-known trivia to obscure oddities in the games to WTF moments from the anime and even some game-breaking mechanics. We also have some interesting theories and discussion points, some of which I haven't seen on any major forums or wikis. You may be curious about the color coding. Well, it's simple. While the version of this chart that I posted on Reddit for you to follow along with, link in description, has only white text, the one that I'm using for this video has color-coded text that relates to the entries from Memer Deluxe's iceberg. Entries that are written in gold are the ones that I think I covered well enough and don't need to repeat. Green entries are ones that I covered last time, but I have more to say on them now that we're talking about the anime and manga more in depth. And orange entries are ones that were created by topics that I thought were a bit too vague and needed to be split apart, like the entries spin-offs, toys, and manga. Before embarking on this journey, I'd recommend checking out the previous iceberg video I did so that this information won't need repeating. Link on screen and in the description. And of course, be advised that both that video and this one are absolutely loaded with spoilers for all things Rockman EXE. This is going to be a very long one, so grab some snacks and a drink and get settled in as we begin our deep dive into some more trivia, lore, and conspiracies surrounding Mega Man Battle Network. Base.exe I don't think that it's any exaggeration to say that the entire conflict of the second and third game centers around Base.exe. This isn't revealed until the end of Battle Network 3, however. So, Base's backstory is that he was created by Dr. Cossack to be the world's first independent net navvy, fully capable of using all of his abilities without relying on a human operator, and was nicknamed the Auto Navi. During the early days of the cyber world, there was an incident that caused every device connected to a program known as Alpha to go haywire and eventually be destroyed. Base was framed for the incident and was ordered to be executed by Scilab's elite navi corps. Although Base survived, he was badly injured with a slash mark across his chest that destroyed his navi emblem. He wandered the internet, battling and deleting all who approached him and taking their powers for his own with his unique Get Ability program. Even though Base didn't make a proper narrative appearance until Battle Network 3, he appears in Battle Network 1 as a secret boss and is mentioned in Battle Network 2 as a clone of him serves as the penultimate boss of the game. The real Base shows up as the super boss of the post game, but these events probably aren't actually canon. The reason the base is the crux of the story for Battle Network 2 is that Gospel's entire goal was to be able to create infinite clones of base. This was all orchestrated by Dr. Wily as a means to delete the Guardian program to unleash Alpha, trying to destroy the cyber world. But, since the Gospel project failed, Wily managed to manipulate the real base into siding with him and aiding his powers to World 3. At the end of the game, Dr. Cossack uses a pulse transmission machine to send his mind into the cyber world, where he and base have a confrontation, which leads to the Doctor being badly injured. After destroying the Guardian program, Base is defeated by Mega Man before being absorbed by Alpha. In the first three games, Base's trademark abilities include a wide variety of buster shots, a defensive shield called Life Aura, and his most devastating technique, the Earthbreaker. In Battle Network 3's post-game, Mega Man feeds 300 bug frags into the bug frag trader in Secret Area, and upon revisiting the area, he finds that Base has returned, but he no longer remembers his own name, only hungering for battle. Entering the fight will show that Base has gained the powers of the Gospel Virus Beast, being able to use its head as a cannon, as well as attacking with its claws. After the battle, Mega Man tries to get Base to remember his identity and how he used to have a bond with Dr. Cossack. Base refuses to listen and charges up another Earthbreaker, but he disappears in a flash of light. Though Base GS only appeared in Battle Network 3 and Battle Chip Challenge, this form has become one of Base's most iconic incarnations outside the main games. In Battle Network 4 through 6, Base only appears in side missions and the post game, no longer having an impact on the main story. In these subsequent fights, Base now has a new set of abilities, losing his Aura Shield and gaining new attacks such as the Dark Rings called Hell's Rolling and Dark Swords called Dark Arm Blades. His Earthbreaker makes a spiritual return in Battle Network 5 as his strongest attack, Chaos Nightmare, where he throws a giant ball of dark energy. But this energy ball is just the same sprite used for his two-column hitting Darkness Overload, but it's thrown from high in the air instead of being fired from his hands. 
His defensive barrier is referenced in the secret battles in the 4th and 5th games against Space Double X, but these can only be accessed with an E-Reader card, Base Cross, or Soul Cross, and rather than functioning more like an Aura Shield, which requires all the damage be done in one strike, it functions more like a barrier battle chip, which takes a set amount of damage before it drops. In Battle Network 6, Base's boss fight got another overhaul. He permanently loses his shield, as well as his Dark Arm Blades, Darkness Overload, and Chaos Nightmare, but now his Buster does not cause post-hit invincibility, and he can use a wide assortment of battle chips, including Dark Sword. This is a nice callback to a line that Shod said in Battle Network 2, stating that Base theoretically can copy any battle chip data to use whenever he wants. This time, Base's most powerful form is Base BX, where he has absorbed fragments of the opposite side Beast that Mega Man obtained. If you're playing Gregar version, Base can use Falzar's Tornado, and in Falzar version, he uses Gregar's Flame Breath, which is another throwback to Base GS. Defeating Base BX in the Underground seems to permanently delete him, as he actually explodes during a cutscene. But if you do the Graveyard Boss Rush again, you can fight against Base SP as many times as you want. In the Mega Man NT Warrior manga, Base's backstory prior to the main events of the series are nearly identical to the game version. After his introduction, he's a recurring character throughout the rest of the series, first appearing before Mega Man and Proto Man in the Undernet. The duo challenges Base, but they find themselves easily outmatched. This inspires Lan and Mega Man to train to become stronger, so that they can defeat Base when they meet him again. Base appears again when Lan's class is on a cruise ship. Mega Man, now having acquired Hub Style, can actually hold his own against Base, even managing to deal some pretty heavy damage. That is, until Base uses his Get Ability program to copy Hub Style's power. Base then proceeds to thrash Mega Man and has a moment of self reflection. Seeing Mega Man in such a hopeless state, given that Lan was unconscious at the time, Base remembers how it felt to have his human caretaker seemingly abandon him. However, Lan rejoins the fight, and Mega Man attempts to reassume his Hub Style form, but only has enough power for a small, super condensed energy beam that manages to pierce Base's Earthbreaker and then Base himself, as his defense aura drops whenever he uses this attack. Going for the overkill, got Base killed. Later, when the Dark Power Navis were invading the real world due to a dark energy field, Base is resurrected as Base GS, and the ensuing battle leads to Mega Man and Proto Man performing the first Double Soul. During the fight, Base seems to lose his drive and determination, no longer wishing to destroy all of humanity, now that he's been soundly defeated by the same Navi twice. Mega Man and Base share a moment of mutual respect, but it's broken up by the appearance of the two Dark Lloyds, Laser Man and Dark Mega Man. The next volume sees Dark Mega Man trying to absorb Base and use his power to open up a gateway to the World of Darkness. Eventually, Base breaks free from his confinement and makes a proper return during the battle against Nebula Grey, where he and Mega Man merge together to form Base Cross, effortlessly defeating the Dark God of Destruction. Base appears again at the end of the manga, absorbing Psybeast Falzar and teaming up with Mega Man to defeat the merged Super Psybeast. Base would also show up in other works, including the Nightmare of Battleship Stadium, as well as The Pair's Journey, which shows Base and Mega Man's Odyssey that takes place after the battle with the Psybeasts. The anime would give us a much different iteration of Base. His backstory is now different, most likely because the Rockman EXE anime was airing before the third game was released, and that is where Base's narrative backstory was first explored. He appears during the Grave arc, and, after failing to absorb the Great Virus Beast, seemingly explodes. However, it turns out that he takes control of a robot body and uses it to travel around the real world. Base returns in Access, but he plays a much smaller role, though he does revive Shade Man, who then goes on to battle against Dr. Regal and Cross Fusion Laser Man. In the stream arc, Base takes a big role early on, trying to absorb Mega Man and Proto Man's ultimate programs to become stronger in order to combat the looming threat of Duo. However, Base is easily defeated by Slur, Duo's herald, and then cast into the Undernet. He returns in the Rockman EXE movie and helps Mega Man defeat Nebula Grey, again, as Base Cross. During the final episodes of Stream, Base reappears and does battle with Slur again, but this time with more power as he absorbed what was left of Nebula Grey. Base emerges as the victor, deleting the extraterrestrial Navi. He promises that if Earth survives Duo, he and Mega Man will meet again. But that was a lie, because there were still two more seasons of the anime and Base never reappeared, for whatever reason. There is a bit more to Base's backstory in the anime, but I'll have to wait for another point later in the iceberg to fully elaborate on it. ACDC Town the starting point of every main game in the series, except for Battle Network 6. ACDC Town's recurring locations include Lance House, as well as the houses of Lance friends, Mail, Yai, and Dex. We also frequently visit Higsby's Battleship Shop and ACDC School. Starting with Battle Network 4, the entire town got rearranged, and it looks pretty weird. The entire town layout has changed, including the school gate being completely removed and replaced by Yai's mansion. Higsby's shop and ACDC Park are now on the opposite side of town, and the Metroline entrance has moved as well. The name of ACDC Town was taken from the name of Alternating Current and Direct Current Electricity. Although, with the Mega Man franchise's penchant for making musical references, we could say that it's a reference to the band ACDC. Some of the more interesting and strange trivia include the fact that there's a secret hidden Metroline underneath a statue in front of ACDC School, and that Metroline leads straight to World 3's headquarters. There's another strange secret, but we'll talk about that one later. 
It is also worth noting that for some reason, in the game files of Mega Man Star Force 1, you can find a fully rendered 3D model of ACDC Town. This is odd because the overworld of Star Force is still 2D, very much like the Battle Network series. I wonder what this could mean. Mega Man is Land's brother. I actually need to correct something that I said in the previous video. I said that Hub was stillborn. That's actually incorrect. Hub died when he and Lan were roughly a year old or so, from a condition called HBD, and this ailment is also affecting a side character from Battle Network 3 named Mamoru. This disease showing up in Lan's life again gave him and Mega Man the motivation to befriend and later protect Mamoru while he underwent surgery to cure this disease. In regards to the anime and manga, Hub is never mentioned. Not as Lan's brother, at least. Hub style does exist in the manga, but Hub isn't specified to be a person or program tied to Mega Man and Lan's DNA, and this power is even able to be copied by base. It may be hinted at that Hub still exists as Mega Man, though, because Mega Man was given to Lan at a young age to watch over him as a sort of big brother, and after the battle with Nebula, Lan's parents were actually showing more concern for Mega Man's well-being than Lan's. In addition to that, Hub Style's Perfect Synchro is similar to the effects of Hub.Bat, which Dr. Ikari states that any damage Mega Man receives will be inflicted on LAN as well. Though we see that every Navian Operator pair that uses Full Synchro suffers this to a certain degree, it's amplified by Hub Style's greater synchronization rate. So maybe he is Hub, but they never explicitly spell it out for us. As far as I'm aware, at least. The manga does have one short bonus chapter called Saito and Neto that was released alongside the 2016 reprint of the manga, but this chapter is just a bonus and not part of the main story. While Mega Man does confess to Lan that he is his deceased brother, but now in NetNavi form, the chapter ends with Lan waking up, showing that it was all a dream. Hub isn't mentioned in the anime at all, style change or otherwise. We do see that Mega Man was created by Dr. Ikari, and his data was given to Lan on a disc that is used to overwrite Lan's generic Navi, so maybe we can say that Hub was inside the disc? This could also be why Mega Man's data stayed behind inside the PETs of Lan's friends after Ferriman deleted him. The ghost of Hub wasn't willing to pass on so easily, and they just needed to put his soul into a new body. Compression Codes Ever get tired of your Navi Customizer programs taking up too much space? Entering certain button combinations while some of the programs are selected will cause one block to be removed from the program, freeing up more space in the Navi Customizer grid. You can find these codes at various parts in the games, and some of them are shown in the anime as well. Dark Chips As stated previously, Dark Chips are battle chips infused with dark energy. They grant vast amounts of power, but taint the user's soul with evil. Dark Chips themselves didn't appear in the manga, and they had a bit of a different function in the anime. In Access, Dark Chips were simply battle chips that stored large amounts of dark energy, and using them infused a Navi with a dark aura, granting increased power levels, but they did still sometimes show up as dark variants of regular battle chips. Although this sort of function is seen in Battle Network 5, as Dark Chips are an overworld obstacle that create clouds of dark energy that can only be traversed by Gyro Man or Shadow Man, it is worth noting that in the anime, Dark Mega Man can still call upon Dark Invariants of different battleships, like Dark Sword and Dark Wide Shot. In both the game and the anime, the rush that a Navi gets from a Dark Chip becomes addictive, and the Navi in question starts to develop a dependence for it, needing another Dark Chip to get the same buzz. In regards to the Dark Chips from Battle Network 3, I was actually incorrect on one point last time. While Base and Base Plus are Dark Chips and need either a Dark Hole or the Dark License Navi Customizer program, Base GS is not a Dark Chip and can be used freely. I apologize for this mistake. For those interested in Rockman EXE 4.5, the coding for Dark Chips apparently does still exist inside the game somewhere, since 4.5 was built on top of Battle Network 4's engine, but they aren't accessible. In addition to that, apparently the Dark Chip Select screen can still be accessed if one is playing the real Battle Network style patch for EXE 4.5 but I already made a full video covering this topic. On another note, if you want to use Dark Chips in Battle Network 4 without any sort of repercussion, there is an exploit you can do using Junk Soul, where you allow Dark Chips to appear and select them, but don't use them. Next turn, get Mega Man out of his worried emotional state, then activate Junk Soul, and the Dark Chips you selected will show up as the Junk Chips and can be used without any negative side effects, even after Junk Soul wears off and in either a normal or worried emotional state. This is weird to me. I wonder what the trigger for causing the evil state is if it's not just the act of using Dark Chips itself. Cross Fusion A mechanic exclusive to the anime, certain humans and navvies can merge together by using a synchro chip while inside a dimensional area in a process called Cross Fusion, which is kind of like if the operators could wear their navvies like a Power Ranger suit. In Cross Fusion, battle chips must be inserted into the PET prior to activating the fusion, and if one wants to change battle chips, the fusion will need to be broken and then reactivated. Needless to say, cross-fusion puts an enormous strain on the operator's body. Not every human can perform cross-fusion, as it requires a strong synergy between Navi and Operator. 
Known Cross Fusion members include Land with Mega Man, Shod with Proto Man, Mail with Roll, the other team navvies from Battle Network 5, except for Number Man and Higsby, and Ribita with Toad Man, but instead we get Miss Yuri with Needle Man, Dr. Regal with Laser Man, Blackbeard with Dive Man, Yuko with Circus Man, and Goro Misaki with Prism Man. The last pair of characters mentioned are exclusive to the anime. Mr. Famous in addition to serving as a bonus boss and chip peddler, Mr. Famous also runs a net battle school, even though we don't really get to attend. During Battle Network 3 Blue version, he'll give you some pointers in between battles with him. Mr. Famous is also featured on a poster in Land's room in white version of the game. It's also said that in Battle Network 4, Mr. Famous assisted Land's father, Dr. Ikari, in designing the new model PET. Mr. Famous's navvies include Gate Man in Battle Network 2, Punk in Battle Network 3, Kendo Man in Battle Network 4, and Grid Man in Battle Network 5. In the anime, Mr. Famous doesn't seem to have a regular Navi, and though he isn't seen net battling, he often provides support to our heroes in various other ways, including supplying them with extra codes and offering field support with dimensional areas during the access and stream arcs. In the Japanese version, his name is Meijin, and Lan always calls him Meijin-san, to which he replies, no need for formalities. This is apparently a reference to the man that he was designed after, Masakazu Eguchi. In the manga, Mr. Famous rallies together the strongest net battlers he can find in preparation for the invasion of the Dark Navis. He likely knew about the impending doom because he is close friends with Serenade, Lord of the Undernet. In this version, Mr. Famous' Navi is Punk. Sadly, he and his Navi are almost killed by being half-eaten by Desert Man. This leaves the two of them comatose, and we don't see them again after the incident is over. Another fun fact is that Mr. Famous' shirt changes depending on the game, and the number on the shirt reflects the anniversary of the Mega Man series, wearing a 15 in Battle Network 3 and 18 in Battle Network 6. This design also changes at different points in the anime, Mr. Famous was also a spokesperson in the commercials for Rockman EXE 5. Double Hero I dare say that Double Hero is the second most iconic program advance in the series, right behind Life Sword. This features Mega Man and Proto Man teaming up for a combo attack, hitting the entire enemy area. In the first game, the combination for Double Hero is Fighter Sword, Knight Sword, Hero Sword, and any of the Proto Man chips, all with a chip code of B. It does 400 damage. In the Battle Network 1 remake, Operation Shooting Star, this program advance returns, as well as having two other variants, those being Double Hero 2, which is the same combo of chips, except replace Proto Man with Burai, or Rogue, as he's known in English, and Double Rockman, which uses Barrier, Fighter Sword, Busker Sword, and Shooting Star Rockman. In Battle Network 2, the attack power was reduced to 70 damage per hit and hits 8 times, this time using Custom Sword, Variable Sword, and Proto Man. The same combo is used in Network Transmission and a less powerful version of the advance in Battle Network 3 called Deux Hero. Adding Slasher to the front of this chain creates the true Double Hero, which hits 10 times instead of 8. The program advance would not return until Battle Network 6, using Wide Blade, Long Blade, and Proto Man. Although the program advance was absent from Battle Networks 4 and 5, the DS version of BN5 featured the combo attack using the party battle system. If you have full synchro active as either Mega Man or Proto Man, and then switch to the other, the two of them will use this iconic tag team move. The Mega Man NT Warrior manga uses this team up twice. Once during the battle with Base, used to break his aura, and again later to wipe out all of Graves' navvies in one fell swoop. Rockman EXE 4.5 pays homage to this double hero versus base battle during the end credits, as the sprite animation shows Mega Man and Proto Man combining their powers to break through base's barrier. Note that this isn't base double X, yet he uses base double X's black barrier. As far as I'm aware, this combo is never called by name in the anime, but we see Mega Man and Proto Man teaming up countless times, so it's implied. Weird Jack Imports Anybody who's played any of these games for any length of time will know exactly what this means. Just take a look at any given Battle Network game. There are countless weird, random, or just unnecessary jack imports that have cyber worlds that lead to nowhere, but sometimes have hidden items or shops. Places like the Gargoyle statue on Hades Isle, or the wall on the World 3 Fortress in Battle Network 3, the Guardian statue in Akudin in Battle Network 2, suits of armor, picture frames, door frames, or toilets, etc. One that played a part in an actual level was a canteen that held a bomb detonator in Battle Network 2. I've seen this meme floating around, and I think it's 100% accurate. Invisible Paths It's not unusual for RPG games, or other games in general, to have invisible walkways that lead to secret treasures or to serve as obstacles to overcome. However, Battle Network has one instance of invisible paths that is notorious in the fanbase. The Power Plant stage in Battle Network 1. In Electroman stage, most of the paths are invisible, and you can end up spending entirely too much time trying to find your way around. This on its own wouldn't be terrible, but there's a soft time limit. Because you're in the middle of a blackout, your PET's battery is dying while Mega Man is moving. On top of that, the dungeon requires you to use batteries to light up new paths to walk across, and each battery only gets two uses before needing to be recharged from a nearby Mr. Prog. 
This dungeon is so nefarious that it actually got nerfed in the Operation Shooting Star remake, with the batteries now having infinite power and the invisible paths being lit up by slowly blinking dots. But aside from those, invisible paths are scattered all over the rest of the series after the first game. Secret Area This is the primary post-game of Battle Network 3, where the top-ranked Undernet navvies dwell. The entrance is in Undersquare, only accessible from the Undernet server in the Ura Inn bathhouse. When interacting with a hole in the center of the area, Mega Man dematerializes and descends into the secret area. This location can only be exited through the same portal, because the area is locked and jacking out is impossible. This location has a very holy vibe to it, with marble textures being surrounded by water, and it feels like a sanctuary, despite the dark navvies that dwell here. Our opponents are Dark Man, Yamato Man, whose name was stupidly localized as Japan Man, Serenade, and Base GS. Upon claiming the title of number one from Serenade, you gain the right to challenge the Serenade time trials. The trek through here is fraught with danger, as you must use the hammer key item to crush monoliths that contain powerful viruses, as well as circumvent the numbers security system, which requires you to destroy these towers in numerical sequence. The area is also home to bountiful treasure and some of the strongest viruses in the game. The Secret Area and its master, Serenade, apparently also make an appearance in the mobile game Phantom of the Network, but with a bit of different presentation. Copybots We covered these last time as well. Copybots, or copyroids, can house a net navvy and transform itself into said navvy, allowing them to interact with the real world, but they usually have restrictions on them that prevent the use of battle chips or other weapons, and only have physical strength comparable to an adult man. World 3 created giant copybots and used them to bring the Psybeast into the real world in order to unleash their wrath upon the Earth. In the Beast arc of the anime, copybots were created by Makoto Aoki, who is apparently an ex-girlfriend to Mr. Famous. The pair team up to perfect the project, and these copyroids serve basically the same purpose as the ones from the games. Ironically enough, the first enemy navvy to hijack one of these copyroids is Punk, though in the anime, Punk does not belong to Mr. Famous. Copybots did not appear in any of the manga associated with the Rockman EXE IP. Gospel The primary antagonists of the second game. Their members include Arashi Kazafuki and Airman, Speedy Dave and Quickman, Mercenaries Dark Miyabi and Shadowman, Princess Pride and Nightman, Magnus Gauss and Magnetman, and the solo navvies Cutman and Freezeman. Gospel's leader is a little further down the iceberg, so I'll talk about him later. The Net Mafia's crimes include attempting to murder Lan's friend Yai by exposing her to high amounts of toxic gas, trying to blow up the dam at the Akudin Valley campgrounds, literally deleting an entire nation's worth of net navvies and their king, hijacking the mother computer, which puts the entirety of Electopia's cyber world at risk, crashing an official net battler's meeting and putting the members through medieval dungeon traps, hijacking a plane and trying to crash it, and covering the net in ice, thus messing with the world's global environment. The final boss of Battle Network 2 is a multi-bug organism that carries the namesake of the criminal organization. It also bears the ability to transform its head into a copy of Airman, Quickman, or Cutman, and its trademark attack is a wide area of effect elemental breath weapon that switches to the target's elemental weakness. Gospel was also the second primary antagonistic force of both the anime and the manga, though in the localized versions they were referred to as Grave, for censorship reasons. In the anime, Grave served a similar role to the one they had in-game, with similar crimes, like attempting to destroy a dam and freezing a city. The Grave virus beast had a much different set of abilities, including traveling as a shapeless mass of slime, as well as engulfing and absorbing its victims. It nearly destroyed the entire cyber world, or at the very least, Net City, but Bug Saw Mega Man was able to basically outbug the bug and rebuild the cyber world while also destroying the virus beast. In the manga, Grave plays a much shorter role, only being around for roughly a volume and a half, Airman was destroyed by Hubstyle Mega Man after interrupting a friendly net battle between Lan and Shod. Though this action did cause Lan's PET to be destroyed, as Lan and Mega Man activated Perfect Synchro, which resulted in Mega Man going on a rampage while Lan was left catatonic until Mega Man expended all of his energy. After that, Grave hijacks a cruise ship that was hosting Lan's entire school class, and they attack the pair in an attempt to capture the Hubstyle's data. Mega Man and Proto Man team up to delete all the remaining Grave navvies at once but their remains culminate to form the Virus Beast, which was defeated by Hubstyle Mega Man, and then revived, and then shortly afterward, destroyed by base. And the unconscious operatives were taken into custody after the authorities arrived on the scene. Mr. Prog and Navi in Vending Machine This is just a little bit of humor in Battle Network 3. If you jack into the vending machine in the hospital's lobby, you find a Mr. Prog counting money, but he says he's missing 100 zenny. Right next to him is a purple Navi that's standing on top of said 100 zenny. This is just a fun little bit of personality in this game. The series is loaded with these moments, like the overarching haggle between two navvies in the Elect Town homepage in Battle Network 4. Dark Messiah Dark Messiah is the team-up of Gospel and Base. It first appeared in Battle Network 2 as the Dark Messiah Program Advance, or Darkness, as it was localized. This attack was basically a guaranteed victory since it does 3,000 damage a hit and hits twice, once with Gospel's Breath and once with Base's Earthbreaker, 
This program advance was accomplished by using Base V3, Anti-Navi, and any given Gospel Chip, which were event exclusives. In Battle Network 4, combining Dark Line, Bug Chain, and either Base or Base Anomaly will grant the Dark Neo, or Dark Messiah Neo, PA, in which Dark Mega Man uses an attack very similar to the Bug Charge Giga Chip, while Base attacks with Darkness Overload. In Battle Network 4, Mega Man must be in Dark Soul mode to use this advance, while it's fully accessible in EXE 4.5. In Battle Network 6, the Darkness PA returns again, this time with the combination being two Voodoo Dolls and Base or Base Anomaly. Dark Mega Man uses Gospel's Breath and Base attacks with Dark Sword. Other retro program advances and battle chips were similarly recreated in Battle Network 6, some cooler than the older ones and some with less flair. This combo attack is used in the NT Warrior manga and retains its original name, even in localization. The obvious reason for the name change is that Messiah is often associated with Jesus Christ, and calling someone a Dark Messiah would definitely raise some red flags. The Dark Messiah combo would serve as the inspiration for Base GS in Battle Network 3, as the Gospel organization tried to create a copy of Base via Bug Fusion, but of course this also is a throwback to classic Mega Man's Base and Trouble and their Super Mode Fusion. 3D EXE Model in Star Force 1 Within the code of Mega Man Star Force 1, there are some unused 3D models from the Battle Network series, one for Mega Man.exe, one for LAN, and one for a normal Navi, as well as the aforementioned 3D render of ACDC Town. While Mega Man does appear in Star Force 1, it's only as a 2D sprite, not a 3D model, and LAN and the normal Navi don't appear at all, let alone ACDC Town. The mystery deepens. Solo Navi Operators Solo navvies are a recurring element in the Battle Network series. As the name implies, there are navvies that don't have a visible operator. It's been stated in the lore that navvies always fight better if a human is operating them, unless they're based on EXE. There are some cases where a navvy doesn't have an operator that appears on screen, but there is a possibility that they do have operators, we just never see them. Freeze Man was apparently a solo navvy in Battle Network 2 and in the manga, but in Battleship Challenge, he is shown to be operated by Gospel's former leader. In the anime, Stone Man and Blaster Man were both solo navvies who worked for World 3, and they entered the N1 Grand Prix with decoy operators who were actually robotic drones underneath their disguises. So the jury's out. Some navvies apparently can be solo, but it's not known how they can use battle chips when it's been shown time and again that navvies need an operator to give them the battle chips. Again, unless they are base. Dark Mega Man in the anime could also summon battle chips at will. Child Kidnappings it has come to my attention that one recurring element of villainy in this series is child kidnapping. Several times, we see children being abducted or held against their will. In the first game, you have to rescue Dr. Freud's kidnapped son, who is being used as leverage to force Dr. Freud to sabotage the waterworks. In Operation Shooting Star, the remake of Battle Network 1, Miss Mad and Count Zap plan to kidnap Male, but they are stopped by the appearance of Star Force Mega Man. In Battle Network 2, though Lan didn't get kidnapped, when he took a ride from a stranger while in Netopia, the driver refused to let Lan out of his car until he managed to steal all of the battleships in Lan's pack. In Battle Network 3, during the zoo scenario, Dex's little brother Chisao is held hostage by animals being controlled by the World 3 operative Inukai, who is Beast Man's operator. In Battle Network 4 Red Sun, Chisao fakes himself getting kidnapped as a means of stalling Lan so that he'll have to forfeit the Den tournament, but he eventually turns himself in and reveals that it was all a hoax, allowing Dex and Lan to have their match. Later in both versions of the game, when Lan returns to Nitopia for the global tournament, he's knocked unconscious and wakes up in a hotel room that is locked without the key data, which is hidden throughout Nitopia's internet area. It would turn out that this was the preliminary for the global tournament, and it was all staged. It seems to me that this series is big on child endangerment. This extends to their navvies as well. At the beginning of Battle Network 4, Shade Man kidnaps Roll, intending to drain her of her energy. In Battle Network 5, Dr. Regal knocks out Lan and all his friends with sleeping gas, and then steals the PETs that contain Roll, Gutsman, and Glide, along with taking Lan's father hostage. There may be a few more instances that I forgot, but these are the most memorable ones to me. Yeah, a great kids game, where minors who are 11 years old and younger are frequently put in danger. Legends References Anyone who played these games will likely have spotted countless references to the Mega Man Legend series. Dolls of Data, Roll Casket, Tron Bond and the Serbots, the Serbot Rug in Yai's house, the Legends 2 poster in Land's room, the fact that Yai and Glide are references to characters from Legends 2, and so on and so on. But I think it goes even further than that. If you look closely at them, it seems that several battleship weapon sprites share some similar design elements to some of Mega Man Volnut's special weapons. The arm used for the Tornado battle chips looks like the Vacuum Arm attachment, some of the swords that Mega Man uses seem inspired by the Blade Arm concept art from Legends 2, and the Cannon battle chips look strikingly similar to the Ground Crawler weapon, also from Legends 2. Some others you may have to squint, but I see some similarities. Maybe Search Man's scope gun was inspired by the Spreadbuster from Legends 1? Eh, probably not. Some of the sound design seems to have been carried over in between series as well. Ah! 
Additionally, during Quiz King's Quiz in Battle Network 2, one of the incorrect answers to the question about Gauss's brother is Hippopotamus Gauss, which is a reference to how in Mega Man Legends, you can introduce yourself as Hippopotamus to the junk shop owner's wife. Oh, and this real-life servbot shows up in Battle Story Rock Band EXE. Another possible entry for this iceberg that I saw somewhere else was the idea that Battle Network and Legends took place in the same universe. But I couldn't find enough evidence between the two to draw a correlation, outside of this servbot and the fact that Yaito appears in both works, as well as several other Mega Man characters making small cameos in both the Legends and Battle Network series, on posters and such. It's a fun idea, but probably not true. Virtual Console Differences when the Battle Network series hit the Wii U Virtual Console in 2015, a number of changes were made. There were several subtle visual changes for people who have sensitive eyes. Some color palettes were toned down to be less bright, and rapid flashing effects were also toned down or dimmed so as not to cause epilepsy. The reason the palette was this shiny in the first place is likely that the first games in the Battle Network series came out early in the Game Boy Advance's lifespan, and the launch model did not have a backlight, so the screen would be dim and brighter colors would make it easier to see. The most important change, however, is that by accessing the communications menu in Battle Network 2 through 6, you're given the opposite version and PvP exclusive battle chips, and in Battle Network 2 and 3, you get the Gospel and Punk event chips. In Battle Network 5, the mod cards for Base Cross are available, letting you activate them at any time. Aside from those, the games remain mostly unchanged. Credit to the Rockman EXE Zone forum users for documenting these differences, as well as making patches that let us apply these changes to ROMs. Naming Scheme this is a feature that has been present since the earliest days of the Rockman franchise. The Rockman and Mega Man series love to make musical references. Rockman, along with Roll, are meant to be Rock and Roll, a joke that they milked in the 90s Mega Man cartoon. You let Rock and Roll go! No! Not Rock and Roll! Why would Dr. Wily want Rock and Roll? Proto Man's Japanese name is Blues, and we also have Bass and Treble, who were Forte and Gospel in the Japanese version. Rush, Beat, and Tango are also musical themes, as are the anime-exclusive characters Slur and Trill. The manga author Ryo Takamasaki wrote in one of his little shorts that he thinks that Blues should have a girlfriend, so he came up with Rhythm, making the pairing Rhythm and Blues to play off of Rock and Roll. Sadly, Rhythm never got to actually appear in the manga, because Ryo then got curb-stomped by several EXE characters who already existed but didn't appear in the manga at all. The EXE series specifically has some more puns and jokes in their naming scheme as well, going beyond just the musical references to have computer and internet jokes. LAN is wordplay for Local Area Network. Hub is another internet term as well. The Japanese names were Neto and Saito, which would have been Net and Sight. Dex's name is short for Index. Sean's last name, Obihiro, is apparently Japanese for Wide Belt, which is meant to be a pun on Broadband. And Meiru, or Meilu, which is simply spelled as male in the games, is meant to be a pun on email. And we have other characters and enemies that are referenced later in the iceberg. The Woodman Glitch There is an unfortunate glitch in Battle Network 4 if you play the game on an original DS or certain emulators. During the Woodman scenario, in the part of the game where you have to dodge the giant wooden spikes in the park area, for some reason, if the game is being played on a DS system, the game will experience severe lag in the overworld, but the game returns to normal speed when you enter a battle. I've heard reports that if the glitch lasts long enough, then it can cause the game to just completely crash or even damage save data, but I can't confirm these claims. This glitch was fixed on the Virtual Console release, even if you played on the original DS via the bootleg Battle Network Collection multicart, and it will almost definitely be fixed in the Legacy Collection re-release. Air Hockey A battle chip that appeared in the second half of the series. This chip is notoriously overpowered, especially in Battle Network 4. The chip acts like a real air hockey puck, ricocheting when it hits an edge and bouncing around. With a simple area grab and some attack ups, you can dish out devastating amounts of damage, especially since in Battle Network 4, full synchro can be achieved without countering an enemy, so rapid firing this chip back to back could easily double the damage output. Combine that with Metal Soul and Night Soul's A button charge ability, and Air Hockey trivializes most difficult enemies. Except for Duo Nebula Grey. 11th Chip Glitch if you exploit the Navi Customizer in Battle Network 3 by attaching enough programs that allow for extra battle chips to be used on the custom screen, as well as using custom style, you can actually surpass the 10 chip selection limit that's normally in play. During this glitch, whatever battle chip is placed at the second slot of your folder will now be selectable as an 11th chip, though not visible on the custom screen. Select any given chip and then cycle the cursor to the right, past the 10th chip, and to the inactive add button and press A. Now, you have an 11th chip, which can be selected every turn, as well as being manipulated again as the second chip in your folder. Like with other glitches we've talked about, I'm sure this one will be patched out when the Legacy Collection is released. Game Console References 
Since these games were first released on a Nintendo console, it's no surprise that we would see several references to various other Nintendo consoles. We see that Dex has a GameCube and some Game Boy Advances, a Famicom, a Super Famicom, and a GBA SP. LAN also has a Game Boy Micro and a Nintendo DS. But there are other game console references as well. In Battle Network 2, in the last area of the Mother Computer, you can see a large purple GameCube logo that's part of the texture of the level. In addition to that, the aesthetic of the Undernet actually looks kind of like the original Xbox, like the green circles and the black rectangles, even with the ribbed textures. If this wasn't deliberate, then this is one heck of a coincidence. On that note, why has the Legacy Collection not been confirmed for Xbox yet? Grazar. This is the fan name of the fusion of Gregar and Falzar. In both the Rockman EXE anime and the Mega Man NT Warrior manga, Gregar and Falzar merge together to form a Super Psy Beast, and in the anime, Cross Fusion Mega Man can merge both his beast out forms as well. However, in the games, the two beasts never merge. I also think there might have been a missed opportunity to have Grazar Beast Mega Man in the manga, because when Base gives his power to Mega Man, shouldn't that have given him Falzar's power too? Oh well. Folder back. Battle Network 3 introduced Giga Chips to the series. These are battle chips that have either extremely high damage output or excellent special effects. The absolutely most overpowered chip in the entire series is the Battle Network 3 Blue Version exclusive Giga Chip, Folder Back. It immediately refills your entire chip folder and reopens the custom screen. When I say the entire folder, I mean entire folder, including Folder Back. You can use your chips as many times as you want. And, because the first three games allowed the same program events to be used multiple times per battle, you could spam the strongest attacks in the game if you wanted. And, to make things even better, this Giga Chip has a star code, which means that it can be paired with any other battle chip. You could also put a Giga Plus Navi Customizer program on Mega Man and equip a second Giga Chip to unleash even more destruction. While several other Giga Chips returned throughout the series, like Delta Ray Edge, Omega Rocket, and the base series, this one never returned, likely due to balancing reasons. Portal in Gospel HQ this is a very odd moment in Battle Network 2. After defeating Freeze Man, when Mega Man returns to the Gospel HQ in Koto Square, he finds a giant swirling vortex that is spitting out evil navvies. Mega Man then proceeds to just straight up murder one of them in cold blood, only for it to be immediately replaced. Mega Man also never closes this portal, as his buster has no effect on it. We don't know where this portal leads. Where are these navvies coming from? Does the leader of Gospel even know about this? It never gets resolved. It's just kind of a loose thread that's left dangling. Net Agents in the Mega Man NT Warrior anime, three optional bosses from Battle Network 1, Mesa, Sal, and Miyu, all take up secret alter egos, calling themselves Net Agents and using the names Commander Beef, Black Rose, and Mysterio. They act as an intercept force, battling against the threats of World 3 and Grave during the early seasons. Though they are not considered officials, they apparently have battleship licenses, which allow their navvies to use battleships while inside Net City, which is normally prohibited. While the operators wear disguises to hide their identities, they make no effort to disguise their navvies, Sharkman, Woodman, and Skullman. This doesn't make a lot of sense because we see the operators using their navvies while not in their disguises. Also, Lan sees Sal in her Black Rose uniform, but without her mask, and says nothing. Is Lan just that oblivious, or does he not care? Either way, it is kinda nice to see some of the adult characters in the series taking initiative to try to keep the peace instead of always relying on Mega Man and Proto Man. Lan and Mail get married. During the end credits of Battle Network 6, a 20-year flash-forward tells us that Lan and Mail grew up, got married, and had a son named Patch. Lan becomes a scientist like his father, and Mail becomes a housewife, as far as we're told. Throughout the entire series, there has always been some romantic chemistry between the two, with Mail clearly having feelings for Lan, but Lan often being oblivious most of the time. The two of them even go on a date to a theme park in Battle Network 4. As we would see, this romance eventually blossoms, and the two live happily ever after. Ghost Navvies after a navi is deleted, fragments of their data are left behind and they wander the cyber world, occasionally materializing to attack casual bystanders. This was a means to rematch enemy navvies who had already been deleted in the game's story. What started as a game mechanic actually seems to have become a more or less confirmed piece of lore. In the later games, actual ghost navvies start to appear as part of the story and in side quests. BB Left Down Up This is a variable sword input in Battle Network 3, resulting in elemental sonic booms. Though the Variable Sword chip appears in multiple games, this combination and effect are exclusive to Battle Network 3. Ring.exe Ring is a Navi exclusive to Battleship Challenge and Battle Story Rockman EXE. She's operated by Mary Toa, and her primary attack is the Ring Rang. The two of them enter the Battleship Grand Prix together. Ring is also the only example of a Navi who is a gender bend of their Robot Master counterpart, who would have been Ring Man from the Classic series. I really wish that we had gotten to see Ring and Turbo Man used in games outside Battleship Challenge. Robot Master Blastman. 
This is the first time we actually have a character who started as a Navi and then got turned into a Robot Master. Blastman first appeared in Battle Network 6 as the first main boss, and then a Robot Master counterpart would show up in Mega Man 11, which was released over 10 years later. However, both versions of Blastman fight vastly different, with Blastman EXE using fire elemented attacks and the Robot Master primarily attacking with bombs. Colonel.exe I honestly feel like I did Colonel a great disservice last time. I only talked about the bare basic knowledge, but didn't talk about his role in the story or his motivations. In Battle Network 5, Colonel is one of the two possible team leaders, the other one being Proto Man. Colonel and his operator, Beryl, head the charge against Nebula and lead their team to liberate the Cyberworld from the Dark Lord's clutches. It's heavily implied that Beryl has a personal connection to Dr. Regal, as Beryl was actually raised by Regal's father, Dr. Wily. This is what led Beryl to join World 3 during Battle Network 6, as our former comrade becomes our enemy. It's for this reason that I personally view Team Colonel as the more canon of the two Battle Network 5 stories, as Colonel's role was significantly smaller in Team Proto Man. In the anime, Colonel and Beryl were introduced during the stream arc. Beryl is an operator from 20 years in the past, and he uses technology from the present day to send Colonel through a time portal called the Past Tunnel, and he often steps in to help Mega Man whenever he's in danger. In this storyline, rather than being raised by Dr. Wily, Beryl was simply one of Wily's friends before the Doctor became a mad scientist. Beryl is one of the humans selected to bear the crest of Duo, and he and Colonel act as mediators to help defeat asteroid navvies that are sent to Earth by Slur, one of the main antagonists of the stream arc. What becomes of Colonel isn't exactly clear. At the end of the arc, in order to understand humans better, Duo allows himself to cross-fuse with Beryl, and we see that Colonel is part of the fusion, but we never see him again, despite seeing a much older Beryl, the one from present day, talking to Lan after the whole incident is over. Yeah, stream gets confusing. There was another version of Colonel from the anime, but that one's covered a bit further down the iceberg. In the manga, Colonel and Beryl play mostly the same role they did in the games, even though they did act as a temporary antagonist, trying to incarcerate Mega Man because they viewed his vast amounts of power as a threat until he could prove he was trustworthy. After Nebula is defeated, Colonel partakes in a large battle royale to decide who is worthy of the legendary program that will be used to defeat the Psybeasts, and he is accompanied by some of the World 3 navvies from Battle Network 6. Though Colonel survives, he is heavily injured, leaving the battle to Mega Man, Lan, and Base. Base's Emblem when most people think of Base.exe, they likely think that this is his Navi mark, the gold circle with a black background and a slash mark through it. While that is the logo most often associated with him, this is not his original emblem. Based on the Mega Man NT Warrior manga, his original Navi mark seemed to depict a stylized version of the Forte musical symbol. Very fitting, since his name is Forte in the Japanese version. During the Alpha Revolt, this Navi mark was destroyed by an unnamed Navi who is using a heat blade. Although in the games, it's somewhat implied that Yamato Man may have been the one to give Base his scar, as he was one of the few Navis who was known to be a member of the Scilab Elite Corps. Despite Base having a different backstory in the anime, he retains his slash mark emblem, even though it's not a scar. Netopian Criminals both times we visit Netopia in the games, we run into problems. In Battle Network 2, on our way to the airport, a pickpocket steals all of Lan's money, and we already talked about the guy who stole Lan's battle chips. He sold the pack to Miss Millions, who we then have to battle to get our chips back. More than that, after Lan and Mega Man had a fight, Lan left his PET in the hotel room, and someone just waltzed in, jacked into the PET, damaged Mega Man, and stole Lan's passport, and you have to go on a wild goose chase to get it back. And again, in Battle Network 4, we get knocked out and abducted as part of the preliminaries for the global tournament. So yeah, rough country. Doesn't really surprise me that much, considering that the Natopian Cyberworld is connected directly to the Undernet. Battle Network 4 Spelling Errors It's a well-known meme at this point that the localized version of Mega Man Battle Network 4 is riddled with spelling and grammar errors. The most famous of these is in the Windman scenario, when Lily, Windman's operator, visits Lan's house, and Lan's mother says, What a polite young man she was. These spelling errors are so common that some Let's Players, including Shadowrock ZX here on YouTube and the contributors to the LP archive, have made a counter for all the times there's an error with the dialogue. As much as I actually like Battle Network 4, I can't deny the translation job was terrible. Crashman.exe There actually is no Crashman.exe. This is a little strange because Crashman, or Clashman if you prefer, is from Mega Man 2, the most iconic and well-loved game in the series. Every other Robot Master from Mega Man 2 got an Navi counterpart, but Crashman was left out. I can't help but wonder what he would have been like. Would they have stuck to his roots and made his design very similar to his Robot Master counterpart, like Airman, Quickman, or Cutman? Or would they have deviated from the original design and reinvented the character, like Bubble Man, Metal Man, and Stone Man? I guess we'll never know. As a kid, I imagined a rough outline of what a Crashman EXE would have been like, and just based on the name Crash and the fact that his hands look like drills, I imagined that he would have had a guard-breaking attribute, like Metal Man and Ground Man, but that's just from the mind of a kid who had way too much time on his hands. Kid Grave This is the nickname given to the leader of Gospel. 
The term actually comes from the English dub of the Mega Man Inti Warrior anime. The actual head of Gospel is Sean Obihiro, and the persona of Kid Grave, or Lord Gospel, is just a cybersuit used to disguise his physical appearance, until his super nabby is deleted. Concept art states that the Lord Gospel disguise is a magnetically shielded robe which blends together the real and cyber worlds, which is perfectly in line with how the vast amounts of radiation in the Kotobuki apartments was warping the real and cyber worlds together. Sean was pulling the strings behind Gospel from the safety of his headquarters, rallying people together from around the world to commit crimes for him. After the Gospel Virus Beast is defeated, Lan finds and reads Sean's diary, depicting his tragic backstory of how his parents died in a plane crash, and then he was forced to live with abusive relatives. Lan then proceeds to ask to be Sean's first friend. Later on, it's revealed that, via the cyber world, Dr. Wily was actually controlling Sean the entire time, meaning that Wily was the real mastermind behind Gospel. In Battleship Challenge, Sean enters the Battleship Grand Prix, operating Freeze Man. Dr. Wily manipulating Sean from behind the scenes is reflected in the anime, as Sean is completely absent and Kid Grave is instead an android used to serve as the figurehead for Grave until Wily decides to make his public return. Even Kid Grave himself didn't realize that he was just a robot until Wily pointed it out and then deactivated him. After the Grave Virus Beast was destroyed, Base took over Kid Grave's robot body and used it to move around in the real world, even being able to jack himself into the cyber world by grabbing the wires inside a computer. In the Inti Warrior manga, Sean makes an appearance very similar to the games, although first going under the fake name of Keiyuki. The persona of Kid Grave was just a hologram used to disguise his real self, which he lets disappear when he's cornered by Shod aboard the SS Queen Ocean Liner. After the battle on board, which saw the destruction of both Base and the Grave Virus Beast, Sean would later return to aid Mr. Famous and other net battlers in their mission against the Dark Navvies. It is stated that he was being controlled while acting as the leader of Grave, but we don't know exactly who it was, because Dr. Wily presumably died earlier on in the manga, and he never appeared again after the life virus was deleted. It's possible that it was the Quartet of Evil, or maybe the Dark Lords themselves, but we never really find out. In Battle Story Rock Band EXE, Sean is once again behind the Gospel Net Mafia, but Kid Grave is now merely a projection on a screen, which Sean controls from his laptop. Basically, Sean made his Lord Gospel persona into a VTuber. Name changes. This is a wide category, but I think it's worth covering. A lot of the characters had their names changed in between the English and Japanese versions. Some of the basics are Mega Man, who was Rockman, and Bass, who was Forte. But there are several others as well. Battle Network 5 had a character named Footman, who was localized as Gridman, both of which are just references to American football, since Gridman is a football player style navvy. Swallowman was localized as Larkman, and he was a bird type navvy. While a swallow is a type of bird, this name could lead to some unfortunate innuendos. Alpha's original name was Proto, but since Proto-Man is already in the English version, it makes more sense to call it Alpha. Even though Aquaman kept his original name in Battle Network 4, when Battle Network 6 was localized, they changed his name to Spoutman so as not to confuse him with the DC superhero of the same name. Eraseman's original name was Killerman. Not gonna lie, Eraseman sounds way cooler. But the worst one to me was Japan Man, who was named Yamato Man in the Japanese version. His Robot Master counterpart also shared the original name. Most of the main human characters had name changes too. As I said earlier, Lan's original name was Neto, Shod was Enzan, Mail was Meru, which is basically the same thing, Dex was Dekau, Yai was Yaito, Higsby was Higure, Count Zap was Count Electric, Miss Mad was Madoi, Miss Mari was Miss Mariko, and Miss Yuri was Miss Yuriko. Even though in Battle Network 2, they do reference Count Zap, but they call him by his Japanese name, and Miss Mari is referenced in Battle Network 5, but she's called Miss Mariko. There were several battle chips that had name changes as well. Hero Sword used to be called Paladin Sword. The Fireburner chip from Battle Network 6 was originally called Hell's Burner, and Forte's Hell's Rolling was respelled as Hell's Rolling. These are just a few instances, but there are countless other examples. Right Handed Mega Buster. Not really deep lore related, but just an observation that out of all of the main incarnations of Mega Man, EXE is the only one to canonically have the Mega Buster on his right hand. The other four main ones, Classic, X, Volnut, and Star Force, all have their Mega Busters on their left arms. Yes, I am aware that both Classic and X can use two Busters at once. But looking at Mega Man's final smash in the Smash Bros. series, these four Mega Man use their left arms as their Buster arm, but EXE still has his on his right hand. Even looking at the sprites from each respective game, when the sprites aren't simply mirror flipped, Classic and X both use their left arms for their main buster, and EXE still uses his right. Just a funny little observation. Classic Theme Remixes There are some music tracks in the EXE series that are remixes of the stage themes from the Classic series. All of the playable navvies in Rockman EXE 4.5 have remixes of their themes set as the PET home screen theme, and Fireman and Pharaohman both get remixes of their themes in Network Transmission. I just love little throwbacks like this. Chaos Unison. 
I think I already covered what Chaos Unisons do in-game well enough, but we didn't talk about the manga version. When Tomahawk Man and Mega Man attack Nebula's base, Nebula Grey infects Tomahawk Man with Dark Power. In order to snap him out of it, Mega Man activates his Double Soul, but this causes Mega Man to enter a Darkened Tomahawk Soul mode. The Dark Power eventually corrupts Mega Man's physical form as well, until Land manages to give Mega Man the willpower to overcome the darkness. Chaos Unison did not appear at all in the anime, as far as I'm aware. Z-Saber Zero's iconic sword from the Mega Man Zero series, brought to Mega Man Battle Network. This battle chip first appeared as a prize for defeating Zero in Network Transmission. While this version of the chip depicts EXE Zero on the artwork, every future version of this chip uses Zero's appearance from the Mega Man Zero games. This blade attacks with three slashes, one long, one wide, and one hero sword length, as well as an optional shockwave with the button input. Initially, it was believed that the only way to obtain this chip in Battle Network 4 was to link the game to Mega Man Zero 3, but in 2022, Grega Master, one of the top ROM hackers of the Rockman EXE Zone forums, recently discovered a lotto code that would yield the Z-Saber, even in unmodded versions of the game. The code for this chip still exists in Battle Network 6, but is inaccessible without hacking. The battle chip did also appear in the Mega Man NT Warrior manga and anime, both times being wielded by Proto Man and taking the form of a handheld sword, similar to how it's wielded by the legendary Reploid himself. Fan submitted navvies. The Mega Man franchise is no stranger to using fan creations for its bosses. This practice even goes as far back as Mega Man 2 on the NES, the most iconic game in the whole IP. While most of these fan made robot masters would go on to become navvies, there's also a plethora of fan created EXE exclusive characters, including Larkman, Gridman, Gateman, Kendoman, Kingman, Videoman, Mistman, Bullman, Cosmoman, Judgeman, Elementman, Circusman, and my personal favorite EXE character, Laserman. In addition to that, Clockman.exe from Operation Shooting Star is actually based on a fan submission for a Mega Man Star Force boss, and the original name was Clock Genius. I always like seeing these fan ideas being used in official works, and it brought us some of the best bosses in the series. Drillman and Pikman, two anime exclusive characters. They first appeared as competitors in the M1 Grand Prix. Pikman and Drillman. They were supposed to battle against Stoneman and Blasterman, but they were ambushed while training and were too damaged to compete. Drillman's name is actually incorrect. The Japanese name was supposed to be Drill Mach, not Drill Man. This was botched in the English dub. I can understand why it happened though, as the anime was actually being aired before EXE 3 was released, and Battle Network 3 was the first game that featured Drillman.exe. The real Drill Man would appear later on in the anime and would be defeated by Proto Man. When Pikman and Drill Mach reappeared in the Access episode Allegro, Pikman correctly calls Drill Mach Drill Maha, which is how it's pronounced in Japanese, but it sounds kind of funny saying this in English. Drill Maha, help me! memory limitations. It's been stated numerous times that content had to be cut from nearly every game in the series due to space limitations on the ROM. Some immediate examples are Duo Soul and Forte Soul from Battle Network 4, and this is often used as an explanation as to why so much extra content, outside the Boktai crossover, was cut from the localized version of Battle Network 6. Reportedly, the English script took up so much space that they had to remove two additional internet areas. I have yet to find a source to confirm this claim, however. Another sacrifice to this limitation is listed further down the iceberg, and will be explained later. Now, this next part is more so a personal theory, and I haven't seen anything confirming this, but I think that space limitations may be the reason why Mega Man's animations became more simplified starting with Battle Network 4. It's already been confirmed that this is why they went with smaller sprites, so that they took up less room in the ROM. We see that during the early games, we have him using things like hammers, pickaxes, giant fists, and roundhouse kicks, but all these were removed from the second half of the series. This is probably because, starting with Battle Network 4, the developers had to start incorporating full sprite sheets, not just for Mega Man's new transformations, the Double Souls, but also for the navvies that provided said Double Souls. This was likely due to the Operation Battle gimmick, where the 12 Double Soul navvies were playable, and thus need to share every animation that Mega Man could normally do. If you remember my comment on Battle Chip Challenge from the previous Iceberg video, I said that the animations were awkward because the boss characters didn't have full sprite sheets that matched the Battle Chip animations. Well now, several of them did, and this would continue on throughout the rest of the series. Space limitations could also be why the cross system only gave Mega Man a new bust over his base form instead of a whole new sprite sheet. Smaller files save space. And for those curious, if you look at the sprites in-game, Mega Man's style changes aren't actually a separate sprite sheet, but they're different animation offsets within the same base sprite that Mega Man uses. Again, this is just more of a personal hunch, but if this has been confirmed anywhere, someone please let me know. Movie Parodies A few times in the games and anime, we hear about some movie and TV shows that have spoof titles parodying real-life movies. In Battle Network 1, we can see some posters on the Dentown Movie Theater advertising Attack of the Killer P.E.T.s and Upgrade Impossible 3, starring Rom Cruise. That's clearly a parody of Mission Impossible 3, starring Tom Cruise, and Attack of the Killer Blank is a common horror or B-movie title. 
We also hear about the Bond Bunch, who seems to be a reference to the Brady Bunch, but starring the Bond family from Mega Man Legends. I would 300% watch that show. In Battle Network 4, when we reach Castillo, if you examine the pirate ship, you will see either a diorama based on Peter Pan, which is a spoof of Peter Pan, or another production named Tidemic Ghost. And while this title doesn't match a particular movie that I know of, the figures here seem to be a direct reference to Pirates of the Caribbean, with the three humans bearing resemblance to Will Turner, Captain Jack Sparrow, and Elizabeth Swan. Then, in the Access episode, Video Man Returns, the Japanese version of the episode heavily features a movie called Star Potter, referencing Star Wars and Harry Potter, and the sequel, Star Potter Reloaded, adds The Matrix Reloaded into the mix. The dub goes out of its way to very specifically not reference the title, but keeps telling us that Land really wants to rent this movie on VHS and is having a hard time finding copies of it. Truth be told, if there was a movie that was Wizards vs. Space-themed Battleships vs. a virtual reality and it wasn't a parody, I'd love to watch that one as well. There might be a few more, and I'm pretty sure I'm forgetting at least one, but these are a handful of the movie parodies mentioned in the series. Extinct Viruses So you may have noticed that in between games, sometimes battle chip art will change. There will be art of a virus that is used to give us certain battle chips, but in other games, the image is grayed out. This lends to the idea that certain viruses were deleted to extinction, as referred to in the BBS in Battle Network 2, when talking about the Bagworm virus. This was the developer's way of reducing the amount of battle chips, but still including them. Some of the best examples are Mine, Tornado, Trident, and Air Hockey, all of whom had their own Battleship series in their debut games, with three versions of the chip in question, but after the debut, they were reduced down to having only one chip. Some viruses that seem to have returned from so-called extinction are the Handy Viruses, which give us the Time Bomb Battle Chips, as they were in Battle Networks 1 and 2, but were absent from 3 and 4, only to return in Battle Network 5, the Piranha Viruses, which only appeared in Battle Networks 1 and 6, but yield different battle chips in the final game, and the Billy Viruses, which appeared in Battle Networks 1 and 4, both times yielding the Thunder Battle Chips. Other viruses that were absent from some games but returned with different battle chips include the Bug Tanks from Battle Network 5, previously called B-Tanks, and the Volgear, which used to give us Fire Tower in Battle Network 1, gives us Flame Line in Battle Network 4. However, these last two viruses never got grayed out battle chips. Whiskey Rap Battle Battle Network 2 got away with a lot of stuff that E-rated games normally wouldn't. One of the most infamous moments from this game among the fanbase is the Whiskey Rap Battle. During the Magnet Man scenario, you'll be on a plane headed back to Electopia when a killer spider gets loose and you have to set a trap for it, and you need to use whiskey as bait. You go to first class to get some, and the guy on the couch refuses to give you any unless you rap for him. This is extremely cheesy and cringy, but I love it. After you show him that Lan has bars, he gives you the booze. Why has this not been turned into a Friday Night Funkin' mod yet? Mr. Prog's Hands Believe it or not, the ears on top of a Mr. Prog's head are actually their hands. Yeah. According to this Mr. Frog in Battle Network 3, located in the computer in this door frame in Scilab, these are hands. Kinda funny. Battle Network Esports As far as I'm aware, Mega Man Battle Network is the only series on the Game Boy Advance that is competed at in the esports sphere. Even to this day, through the use of internet-capable emulators, fans of the game can battle with players across the globe. The N1 Grand Prix, which took its name from the big net battle tournament in Battle Network 3, is the biggest online community for Battle Network PvP at least it currently is, and probably will still continue to be, even after the Legacy Collection is released. There's actually quite a rich history behind Battle Network Esports, and I'll link a video that gives a better explanation than I can. So, we've already talked about Battle Network 4.5. It provides you with quite an array of playable navvies. But who is the canon playable navvy? Well, which of them is the only navvy who exclusively appears in this game? The answer to that is Starman. Okay, well, that's not entirely true. Starman also appears in Network Transmission, and his name is on Epitaph in a Graveyard in EXE 6. However, every other Navi in the game has a canonical operator, except for Napalm Man, because this came out before Battle Network 5, Junk Man, who was born from Scrap, and Bass, who is a solo Navi with a fully fleshed out backstory. But he also is a fan favorite, so it makes sense to make him playable. So, since Starman's operator is never revealed in Network Transmission, what if you were his operator the whole time? It would make sense, since Starman's inclusion was also part of a promotion with the Protoman version of the Battleship Gate, since it included his Navi data chip, but that means that you're the net criminal due to your involvement with the Zero Virus incident, spreading fake vaccines and such. Looking at it in that light, you are now on a quest to redeem yourself by becoming an official and deleting other net criminals. Now, we all know that EXE 4.5 isn't actually canon, but still, if we were to try to rationalize who is the canon main character, I don't think this is a bad theory. Anime Censorship The Rockman EXE anime was localized as Mega Man Anti Warrior, and it has the curse of being an anime brought to North America in a post 9 11 world, and it suffered a lot of censorship. Several characters' names were changed, for better and for worse. Fireman was renamed Torchman. 
I think that one actually sounds cooler. But Bomb Man, on the other hand, was renamed Blaster Man. When I hear Blaster, I think about laser guns and Transformers, not bombs. Though I will acknowledge that this is likely a reference to blasting with dynamite. But this would get confusing when Battle Network 6 came out years later and we had Blast Man. The strangest one, though, is Multanic Man, which is the localized name for Napalm Man. What even is Multanic? I can't seem to find a definition for it outside Urban Dictionary. Maybe it's supposed to be a combination of molten, which means melted, and volcanic? I guess it makes sense because Napalm Man is a fire-type navi who uses firebombs. To make it even stranger, there is an unused voice line in the DS version of Battle Network 5 where Len uses the name Multanic Man instead of Napalm Man. Multanic Man! Let's do it, Multanic Man! Double Soul! Multanic Soul! Chaos Unison! Multanic Chaos! This line was not used in the final version of the game, however. In addition to that, Color Man's name was changed to Wacko Man. I think this one's a bit more fitting, since Wacko Man seems to fit the whole clown aesthetic that he and Maddie go for, as opposed to just being called Color Man. But it may go a little bit deeper than that. Apparently, in the Japanese version, Color Man's name was Colored Man. For those who aren't familiar with American history, the term colored person or colored people is seen as politically incorrect to some when used to describe people of non-Caucasian lineage. There have been changes in sensibility over the years, and exact wording is important, but as it is offensive to some, and given when these came out, the early 2000s, I think that this is likely the reason it was changed during localization. Needleman.exe appeared in network transmission with his name unchanged, but in the English version of Access, he was renamed to Spike Man, most likely so as not to draw references to drugs or hypodermic needles. I don't mind this one so much. Those definitely look more like spikes than needles to me. Gospel was renamed to Grave, as gospel is often tied to the Christian faith, and making biblical references in kids' cartoons and anime here in the States is forbidden. And yet, Digimon and Beyblade got away with it somehow. Also, Beast Man was renamed Savage Man. This is probably to distance him from the Beast Man character from the He-Man franchise. Similarly, Aquaman had his name changed to Spout Man in both the anime and the localized version of Battle Network 6, so as to avoid confusion with the DC superhero. I think the same could probably be said for Star Man, whose name was changed to Nova Man. Apparently, Plant Man is also the name of a Marvel character, so Plantman.exe got renamed to Vine Man. What, does he like to make six-second-long viral videos? Next thing you know, they'll localize Clock Man as TikTok Man. Other name changes were added, but I think these were more likely for lip-syncing purposes as opposed to censorship, since when translating dialogue to English, lip-syncing with the footage doesn't always match. Metal Man was renamed Heavy Metal Man, Junk Man was renamed Junk Data Man, and Wind Man was renamed Wind Blast Man. Again, I think these were just for lip-syncing. The anime censored a lot of other features as well, including the names of several battle chips. Shotgun was changed to Blaster, Blaster battle chip. which again makes Bomb Man's name even more confusing. Cannon was changed to Laser Blast, despite High Cannon and Mega Cannon remaining unchanged. Laser Blast! High Cannon! Cannon! Battle Chips in! Guts Man's Guts Punch was changed to Guts Thump, Silver Guts Thump, which is absolutely stupid. So is Mega Man thumping Guts Man repeatedly here? Search Man's Scope Gun was renamed the Scope Blaster, and when Miss Yuri was going to shoot Miss Mari, she was holding what she called a Neural Disruptor. I have a neural disruptor, so if you don't do what I say, I'll overload your central nervous system. But it's clearly a gun, and the visual edit here looks awful. It looks like it was done in Microsoft Paint. Although, to be fair, the uncensored gun looks incredibly flat as well. Gundam Seed's run on Toonami did a similar thing, but better, and Yu-Gi-Oh!'s gun censorship is a well-known meme at this point. They were never allowed to say the word bomb. Things like Mini Bomb were renamed Mini Boomer. Mini Boomer! Fire Boomer! Additionally, they were not allowed to show a lot of physical impacts when it came to characters striking one another, so they would simply edit these scenes where a white flash replaced the frames that would show the impact, or simply cut away before the character was hit. Like in the episode Evil Empress Roll, Roll is supposed to slap Mega Man and knock him down, but they cut the footage before the impact and just show him falling on his butt. This kind of editing is especially noticeable in the early episodes. Justice League did the same thing. Like, watch this. The white flash seems to emphasize the impact of the hit, but in Inti Warrior, the flash actually has a build-up fade-out before the hit lands, and it looks awful. I know what you're thinking. Did 4Kids localize this? Actually, no. It was Viz Media. At this rate, I'd actually say the 4Kids would have been an improvement. In addition to that, they censored nearly every single sword-type weapon. At first, it wasn't that noticeable, since the blades of most of the swords were not standard steel color, so I thought it was just like a lightsaber effect or something. But when you see Shadow Man's katana or King Man's pawn swords all fuzzed out, that raises some eyebrows, and it looks terrible. Of course, anything implying that a human was physically being injured was also cut. When Shade Man impales Cross Fusion Laser Man with his claws, the shot cuts away, not letting us see the carnage. 
They also added a fuzz effect over some of the injuries on Navi's as well, despite it not looking anywhere close to organic, as is just pixels and data. It's most noticeable when Shade Man loses his arms. They apparently also didn't like to show anything that looked close to a gun, as several times when Mega Man or another Navi is pointing his buster or a cannon towards the screen, they cut a second or two from the localized version, as well as other somewhat extreme violence, like Stone Man getting stabbed in the eye, Elect Man getting impaled, or Magnet Man getting shot in the face. This just leads to some choppy editing and confusing moments later. Why is Stone Man's eye all damaged if we didn't actually see him take the damage in the English version? They also have some scenes that were cut so close that one frame of the shot they were trying to censor shows up in the final product. During the fight with Magnet Man, Mega Man is supposed to have a targeting reticle in preparation to blast him with a program advance, but they remove that in the dub, even though you can still see one frame of the shot. I'm sure that there's more, but these are some of the most egregious examples. We also get the basic kids anime localization nonsense, like calling food by the wrong name. Nobody in the world makes better cupcakes than my mom! Those are jelly donuts. Uh, I mean rice balls. I was talking about the stew. Stew! That's curry. This is made even worse by the fact that curry becomes a recurring food in the series, even in localization. I don't want localization changes, but if you're going to make them, at least be consistent. And let's be honest, what American kid watching this in the early 2000s would even know what curry was unless you were already a weeb? At least with curry, it could pass as like a beef stew or something. Let's have spaghetti for dinner tonight. <laughs> That's clearly not spaghetti. The sauce is white, not red. At least call it Alfredo or something. What does the Japanese version say? Oh, looks like I was wrong on this one. But who in the world eats spaghetti with a spoon? Some of the name changes were brought to the localized manga as well. The YouTuber Hensama has made a series of videos talking about the censorship for the first season of NT Warrior, and I'll link those in the description. Avengers reference. While posting in the Center Square's BBS, we see someone named Iron Man make a few posts. So the games can get away with having shared names with Marvel and DC characters, but the anime can't. Good to know. Prism Man. Prism Man is a character exclusive to the anime. He is operated by Goro Misaki, and these were the first two to attempt cross-fusion. Even though they failed at first, when they were later exposed to dark chips, the pair did achieve a successful cross-fusion. Fortunately, after being defeated by Mega Man, the two were put on the path to recovery, and Prism Man helped drive away Asteroid Bomb Man when he attacked the hospital's computer. Prism Man's gimmick is that he uses the Prism Battle Chip, which, when attacked, will disperse the damage to all the surrounding targets. His primary weapons are twin Tomfa that also serve as cannons, which he makes good use of during the battle with Gravity Man. He defeated the Dark Lord using Dark Prism, which apparently seals the target inside a labyrinth constructed of light inside an alternate dimension of the cyber world. Honestly, out of every anime-exclusive character, I think Prism Man has my favorite design, and I would love to see him appear in something like Rockman X Dive. Tori Freud Remember how I mentioned earlier that Freud has a son? Well, in the anime version, they actually gave him a name and made him a member of the main cast. His name is Tori in the English version, and Toru in the Japanese version. He's the operator of Iceman, and in their debut episode, they were the ones sabotaging the waterworks because his father was being held captive. So they basically pulled a role reversal. Also, anyone else notice that his hoodie in the early seasons seems to be a reference to Shotgun Ice from Mega Man X? Rush, Beat, and Tango, three robot pets from the classic series, brought to the world of Battle Network. Rush first appeared as a virus in Battle Networks 1 and 2, and would give you the pop-up battle chip, or Recovery 300, in network transmission. While in the Japanese version, the virus was named Rush, it was called Mole in the English release. There was a second, red version of this virus called Serious Rush, or Mole 2. Starting with the third game, Rush would then become a Navi Customizer program along with Tango and Beat. They would serve as PvP support, activating their effects if certain circumstances were met. If the enemy uses an Invisible-type battle chip, Rush attacks the enemy, eats the battle chip, and then paralyzes them. Beat steals the opponent's Mega or Giga chip, and Tango will restore Mega Man's HP by 300 and give him a barrier 100 if his HP drops into the red. In Battle Network 6, Rush could also be summoned in certain areas using Rush Food to create a Rush Road, making shortcuts across gaps in the floor. In the anime, Rush is Roll's pet Cyberdog, which was given to her by Dr. Ikari. He apparently has the ability to go between the real and cyber worlds at will. This ability led to him getting kidnapped by Bubble Man and having his powers exploited, turning him into the Rush Synchro Chip, which allowed Shade Man to enter the real world without a dimensional area. This special Synchro Chip is what enabled Mail and Roll to perform a cross-fusion later in the series. Apparently, the original design for this incarnation of Rush was supposed to be used in Mega Man Legends, and he didn't get along well with Data. However, the idea was scrapped and repurposed for EXE. Dark Chips are industrialized evil energy. I don't think that I was incorrect in my assessment last time about dark chips containing fragments of digitized evil human souls, but Mimer Deluxe pointed out that entries that were written in red on the previous iceberg were entries that were based on rumors that didn't have a concrete answer. It also turns out that evil energy is actually a reference to Mega Man 8. That reference flew completely over my head. 
Though I am a lifelong Mega Man fan, most of my time has been spent playing basically every other series but Classic. I don't dislike Classic, but I've just spent more time on the others. But yeah, in Mega Man 8, Duo, a robot from space, is programmed to hunt down and destroy all evil and evil energy. Prolonged exposure to evil energy can harm people and robots with good hearts, similar to Dark Chips. This kind of delves into the idea that Battle Network exists on the same timeline as Classic Mega Man, but we'll touch on that later. In the stream arc of the anime, evil energy is mentioned by Slur, described to be materialized selfish human desires, which was amplified by the asteroid navvies sent by Slur to aid humans with their selfish endeavors, and this energy is used in an attempt to activate Duo's comet to erase the Earth. This incarnation of evil energy shares no correlation with Dark Chips outside some of the asteroid navvies using the same bodies as some of the Dark Lloyds from Access. Ferroman.exe Ferroman is an interesting character in the Battle Network series because every incarnation of him is completely different, and he never plays the same role twice. In the games, Ferroman serves as a secret bonus boss in Battle Network 1 and 2, but a required story boss in Network Transmission. During his chapter, Mega Man states that the data from Ferroman's area is extremely old, so old that it may not even work on modern computers. In the anime, Ferroman was basically given Alpha's backstory from Battle Network 3, he was the control center for all of Psylab, which meant that he would run the entire cyber world, and was created by Land's grandfather, Tadashi Ikari. However, it was discovered that a virus infected Pharaoh Man, and Psylab feared that he would be too strong to control, so they sealed him away inside an isolated silicon chip. In the English dub, they say that there was a flaw in his programming that made Pharaoh Man become too power-hungry, thus causing Psylab to panic. But in the original Japanese version, it is stated to be a virus. During the finals of the M1 Grand Prix, Mega Man and Proto Man's battle gets so violent and destructive that Pharaoh Man is released from his prison, and he then proceeds to delete Mega Man. Pharaoh Man then sets his sights on taking revenge on humanity for betraying him, planning to destroy human society so that only he, and any Navi who will follow him, remains. He's shown to be extremely powerful, taking concentrated attacks from a literal army of Navis all at once, and even reactivating Psylab's control systems from within, even though they're supposed to be completely taken offline. After Lan and his friends manage to recover Mega Man's data and install it in a new frame, he and Proto Man team up to battle Pharaoh Man. Though he survived a double program advance, Pharaoh Man was weakened enough to be captured by World 3. Rather than allowing himself to be used by Dr. Wily, Pharaoh Man self-destructs, taking the World 3 base down with him. This arc serves as the basis for the Mega Man NT Warrior board game, with defeating Pharaoh Man being the main objective of the game. But his story doesn't end there. Dr. Wily survived the World 3 hideout exploding, and took the fragments of Pharaoh Man's ultimate program and reformatted them into the Grey Virus Beast. Pharaoh Man's personality components and the rest of his soul, however, reformed into a new Navi. And that Navi is Base.exe. This is honestly my least favorite incarnation of Base because of this fact. Due to Battle Network 3 being released while the anime was airing, the storylines diverged, and the showrunners likely didn't have Alpha or Base's backstory from the games to work with, so they essentially gave both roles to Pharaoh Man. In an attempt to become whole again, Base tries to absorb the ultimate program from the Grey Virus Beast, but he seems to be unsuccessful. The NT Warrior manga presents us with a much more benign version of the character, as Pharaoh Man exists merely as a guardian of an ancient treasure. All who seek it must battle against four legendary warriors, equipped with the style change ability. Though Pharaoh Man himself is not nearly as malevolent as his other counterparts, his pyramid is still riddled with traps and deadly viruses. Also, he is apparently from a civilization that supposedly predates modern day by tens of thousands of years. While this is the only instance of this we see in the manga, it does play into the idea of super-advanced prehistoric civilizations like Mu from the Mega Man Star Force series. Heck, Mu is even referenced in this manga, even though Star Force wasn't out at this point. During the trial, Mega Man and Lan obtain the power of Hubstyle and accidentally delete Pharaoh Man and the four legendary warriors in a terrifying display of power. Pharaoh Man is not angry, however, only wishing that this power be used to carve a newer and brighter future for the net and mankind. Vision Bursts one of the big plot points from Battle Network 5, Vision Bursts are basically image data that saves a particular moment of time from the real world, but only accessible in the cyber world. At various points in the game, you enter separate Vision Bursts that take you to the past, and you get to explore specific areas of ACDC Town, Oran Isle, and Scilab. The portal to each Vision Burst looks like a large blue door. It is kind of surreal to be in ACDC Town's past, as Lan and Hub had apparently just been born at this moment, and Yai's house wasn't even built yet. The Scilab Vision Burst is practically the same as the image data of Scilab inside Alpha from Battle Network 3's ending, making this a very nice throwback. Visiting the past helps Lan and Mega Man learn the secrets of Nebula's Soulnet project. Speaking of... Soulnet. This was a project started by Dr. Tadashi Hikari and Dr. Wily. The purpose behind it was to allow human souls to be linked together to create a better sense of understanding and kinship among all humanity. However, the pair knew that they would not be able to finish the project and decided to leave it up to their descendants, Yuichiro Hikari and Dr. Regal. The pair of scientists split the plans for Soulnet in two, and the Hikari program took on its own form, turning into a cyber dog named Gao. 
The Nebula set out to capture this program so that Dr. Regal could complete Soulnet and use it to taint the world with evil. Using smaller Soul servers, Dr. Regal then transmitted the Soulnet wavelength, infected with fragments of Nebula Grey, the program of darkness and hatred, to incite chaos across Electopia, causing everyone to act erratic. Eventually, Dr. Regal managed to construct a soul server that will cover the entire Earth, which he activates during the climax of the game, but Lan is protected from its effects due to a magnometal amulet that was made by his grandfather, as magnometal is the only known material that can block the soul wavelength. After the battle with Nebula Grey, the soul server, as well as the Nebula base, begins to self-destruct. After the heroes escape, Dr. Wily confronts Regal and reactivates Soul Server, causing it to overload, and uses it to erase the last ten years of his son's memories so that he would not fall onto the path of evil. While the sentiment that Wily doesn't want his son to follow in his footsteps of being an evil scientist is sweet, it's a shame that Solnet didn't end up being used the way it was originally intended. I bet that a perfected version of this concept could have led to untold powers within Mega Man. Quizzes it's a recurring element of the Battle Network series to have a series of quizzes to complete in order to earn various prizes. Most of the time, there are three stages of quiz. They are Mr. Quiz, or Quiz Kid, Quiz Master, and Quiz King. The strangest instance of this was in Battle Network 2, where an old man claiming to be the Quiz King apparently got possessed by a spirit when he was a kid, and has been in the dungeon of the Natopia Castle this whole time, waiting for someone to complete his quiz and let him pass on to the afterlife. Asteroid Navvies during the stream arc of the anime, Duo has decided to judge the Earth and decide whether humanity should be destroyed or spared. He sends his herald, Slur, to interact with humans, and gives them a means to fulfill any selfish desires they may have. These means are called Asteroid Navvies, or simply Asteroids. Asteroid Navvies take the form of Navvies that previously existed in the anime, and most of the time they are based on the Dark Lords from Access. Although some early arc navvies appeared as asteroids too, like Stone Man and Bomb Man. This sets up the primary villains of the week for the stream arc. While all these navvies appeared earlier in the series, the asteroid versions of the navvies would often be paired up with the original operators they had in the games, like Video Man with Vidi Narsi, Beast Man with Inukai, and Napalm Man with Firefox. Slur states that asteroid navvies aren't necessarily evil, but rather are a means to an end, and that any havoc wreaked by them is due to the evil and selfish desires of the operator. This runs contrary to what Slur says about how asteroid navvies have the ability to amplify evil and selfish desires within humans, so it seems that the asteroids were used by Slur to set up humanity for failure, stacking the deck against them, so to speak. I get that it was meant to be a test, but when the test itself is cheating, well, that's just a dick move. While I do like the idea of asteroid navvies bringing back some characters who may not have gotten enough screen time, I do think that it's a little bit lazy, given that they are all recycled characters. I guess it can't be helped when every arc of the anime up to this point has had upwards of 50 episodes. Gotta cut corners somewhere, I guess. Sealed Off Moves In Battle Network 4, during the Kendo Man scenario, we learned that Mr. Famous apparently had to expel one of his former net battle students who had great potential but was too ambitious and let his power go to his head. So when he was kicked out, Mr. Famous apparently sealed off his moves. This line is repeated by the former student, saying that ever since then, he hasn't even been able to defeat something as simple as a Metar. So, unless Mr. Famous did to his student what Aang did to Ozai, and this isn't just a horribly botched translation, what does he mean by sealing off his moves? If it affects his virus busting in such a way, then maybe it has to do with the ex-student's PET or Navi? We know that Mr. Famous helped develop the current generation of PET, and we have seen instances of PETs being modded or hacked before. In the same game, Lance PET gets hacked to make him stuck with a very bad ship folder, and in the manga, his PET has a lock put on it so that he can't jack Mega Man into the cyber world until the lock is removed. Furthermore, if we take into account the idea that Rockman EXE 4.5 is supposedly how canonical Navi operation works, maybe the controls on the operating system were tampered with so that the Navi either wouldn't function properly or his PET just can't use battle chips anymore? Maybe Battle Operation is a program run by navvies during net battles? Lan and Mega Man are always shouting, Battle Routine Set, and Execute, so maybe there is a reason for it? But what's to stop the guy from just buying a new PET or navvy? Maybe Mr. Famous used his influence to have him blacklisted from every possible store, as well as to the officials? Mr. Famous does travel the world, and he gets around quite a bit. This whole spat during the game takes place in Netfrica, after all. But what if it wasn't based on the PET or navvy? What if Mr. Famous physically disabled the guy's hands so that he couldn't operate his PET properly? In the game, during the Cold Man scenario, if the temperature gets too low, Lan will comment about how his hands are going numb, and the next time you enter a battle without raising the temperature, you won't be able to use battle chips. Maybe Mr. Famous damaged this guy's arms. This could explain why he said to the hostages, watch as I take away Mr. Famous's ability to fight. And then it looks like he kicked Mr. Famous in the nuts or something. Either way, I can't figure out what this actually means. The Mega Man knowledge base just has a brief reference to the situation, I'd like to look at the original Japanese transcript to see if there was a mistranslation or something. This is Battle Network 4, after all, which basically has the worst localization in the whole series. EXE Navvies on Star Force Battle Cards As a nice throwback to the Battle Network series, some navvies are shown on battle cards in the Star Force games. 
On the Life Aura Giga Class card in Star Force 1, you can see a shadowy figure that's clearly meant to be base. And in Star Force 3, the Swordfighter Battle Card series has Protoman Shadow in the background. Both of these are extremely fitting, as Life Aura was one of Base's trademark abilities, and Swordfire lets you strike with a very quick combo of sword slashes. Serenade. In addition to acting as the super boss for Battle Network 3, Serenade actually plays a very large role behind the scenes. The entire Undernet rankings gauntlet is based around the fact that Serenade is number one. Once Mega Man defeats Mistman or Bullman and gains the title of number two, Serenade grants him the Giga Freeze program to use on Alpha to prevent its reawakening. This program is absorbed by base, however, leading Mega Man to battle Alpha's core directly. After defeating Serenade, Mega Man not only gains the ability to fight base GS, but also to participate in the Serenade time trials, where Mega Man challenges a copy of all of the boss navvies in the game, minus Serenade and base. Completing this time trial will earn you the Serenade chip in white version, or Dark Aura in blue version. In Ryo Takemisaki's Mega Man NT Warrior manga, Serenade appears when Dark Power threatens the real world. Serenade gives Proto Man the Muramasa Blade as a means to battle the Dark Navvies, and bestows upon Mega Man the ability to use Double Soul. Serenade combating the darkness is a departure from the games, as in Battle Network 3, Serenade states that they are a Dark Navi, which is reflected in how Serenade's battle chip is classified as a Dark Chip. However, Serenade is a Navi of so much power that they were unable to fully materialize in the real world, and were not operating at their maximum potential, so they were easily deleted and absorbed by the revived base GS. It's later revealed that Serenade was actually close friends with Colonel, and we see this manifest when Colonel uses the Giga Freeze program to seal the portal to the Dark World, and how Colonel takes up a personal vendetta against Base, wanting to avenge his fallen friend. Serenade's ghost continues to haunt Base, not out of malice, but in an attempt to get Base to open his heart to others. Serenade appears in Battle Story Rockman EXE as well, although I can't really say what kind of role they play there because this manga isn't in English, which means that I can't read it. Ultimate Programs This is mostly a plot device used in the anime. It basically just means that the Navi in question has higher potential than other Navis, and they may have a few unique abilities. The six characters confirmed to have an ultimate program are Mega Man, Proto Man, Pharaoh Man, Base, the Grey Virus Beast, and Iris. Mega Man's ultimate program manifests as his ability to access Style Change, and then later, Double Soul. When the Great Virus Beast was absorbing the Cyber World and had already eaten Proto Man, Mega Man's ultimate program managed to overpower both its and Proto Man's ultimate programs at the same time, and after destroying the Virus Beast, Mega Man rebuilt the Cyber World. It's possible that this ability to draw power from those who freely give it, which leads to Double Soul, could also be what allowed Crossfusion Mega Man to absorb the power from all the Navi's Dr. Regal had captured, and then use it against Crossfusion Laser Man. Proto Man's ultimate program doesn't seem to have a solid manifestation other than just extremely high skills as a net battler and large amounts of power. Pharaoh Man's ultimate program seems to be tied to network control, as he was able to reboot Scilab's system after they were completely taken offline from within. After Pharaoh Man was deleted, his data was reformed into base, and the rest of the ultimate program was used to create the Grave Virus Beast. Wanting to be whole, base tried to absorb the beast, but its current body couldn't handle the vast amounts of data. It also seemed that Base's ability to absorb data takes influence from the Get Ability program in the games. He uses this ability to try to absorb Mega Man and Proto Man's ultimate programs, and when he succeeds in getting his hands on Mega Man's, the two merge together to become Base Cross. After the fusion breaks, Base absorbed what was left of Nebula Grey. The Grey Virus Beast has the same ability as Base, absorbing data to get stronger. It's likely that when Base tried to absorb the Virus Beast, that he managed to copy pieces of the ultimate program and gain back a fragment of his power. As for Iris, her ultimate program allows her to enter the real world and cyber worlds at will. She also has the ability to calm down navvies that are in a beast out mode. In the manga, Iris has the legendary program, but it simply exists as a power source that gives beast out Mega Man enough power to stand up to the world absorbing double Psy Beast, as well as allowing him and Land to resist being absorbed. Growing Servers when you reach Gospel's hideout in Kotobuki, you find that there is a dangerous amount of radiation being given off from the apartment building in the middle of town. The cause is apparently all the servers in the various rooms, being used to power Gospel's headquarters. When you get into the building, you find that Land's friends were already there, scouting ahead, and they mention that the servers are literally growing from all the radiation. You can see this when you enter the rooms, as the servers appear to be growing out of the floor. The texture on the floor panels is the same as the top of the servers, and some of them are only halfway up. First, a spooky portal that spits out evil navvies that never gets closed, then the Quiz King Ghost possesses a kid on vacation, and now we have computer servers literally growing out of the floor. The more I revisit Battle Network 2, the more WTF moments I find. I have no clue how to justify this one. Maybe the blending of the cyber world and human world due to all of the radiation is causing reverse digitization? Like, instead of objects being digitized, physical objects are manifesting in the real world from the cyber world, and literally building new servers to keep the power growing? I have no idea at this point. Mega Man figures in-game 
We already talked about the Legends dolls in the games, but there are also several instances where EXE characters are shown as action figures. In Land's Room and Battle Network 3, we see some figures from the Rockin' Action Toy line on Land's desk, as well as some rock cubes on the floor. In Battle Network 2, Dex has a figure of Gutsman on top of his TV, as well as a Gutsman poster on his bookshelf. Now these aren't figures, but in Battle Network 4, we also see that Higsby has hung up posters of Bass and Serenade in his shop, as well as posters of Mega Man, Roll, and Proto Man in Battle Network 5. Additionally, after you defeat each boss in Network Transmission, Land gains a new figure reflecting that boss. In the context of the games, I guess Lan might have a 3D printer and made these himself. However, in the stream arc of the anime, we see that Mr. Famous has figurines of several EXE characters, including Gutsman, Roll, Protoman, and several others. Maybe it's because all of them, except for Aquaman, participated in the N1 Grand Prix and had merchandise made of them? If that's the case, then why aren't they receiving any royalties? Sounds like they need to consult a lawyer. Virus Breeder in Battle Network 3, after a certain point in the story, you gain access to a virus breeder in Scilab, which lets you tame certain viruses by defeating said encounters in the cyber world or adopting them from some of the missions on the request BBS. Afterwards, you're given a battle chip that summons the virus, and feeding the virus's bug frags will increase the battle chip's attack power. This idea is revisited in EXE 4.5, where some female navvies offer to let you battle against their pet viruses, and in Battle Network 6, where you can defeat rare viruses and gain their data, which lets you enter them into pet virus battles for some rare rewards. Another possible offshoot of this is the fact that several times in the series, navvies will use viruses for battle, not only heal navvies, but also normal and security navvies. I guess in this world, viruses aren't necessarily evil and can just be used for combat if the situation calls for it. Also, in Battle Network 1, the Mr. Progs in the summer school in Dentown say that they used to be viruses that worked for World 3, but they were reformed along with Miss Yuri. So are Mr. Progs a type of virus as well, or are the viruses a type of Mr. Prog? Iris.exe Iris makes an appearance in both the Beast arc of the Rockman EXE anime, as well as the Mega Man NT Warrior manga. In the manga, she acts as the mediator for the Battle Royale among the powerful navvies who were summoned to the underground. The point of this tournament is to decide who the most powerful navvy is, and they would be bestowed with the legendary program to defeat Gregar and Falzar. She apparently can only be seen by those she chooses to appear before. She still is said to be Colonel's sister, but this opens up a few more questions. Firstly, if she and Colonel are siblings, and she carries the legendary program inside of her, then what does that make Colonel? And secondly, how do she and Colonel have a tie to the Psybeasts? It's never really explained, and just serves as something of a plot device to give Mega Man more power to stand up to the combined Psybeast. In the anime, she again has a tie to the Psybeasts, in that she can apparently help Mega Man control his beast out state. Like in the games, she can appear in the real world using a copybot. However, this one is merged with her data so that it completely digitizes when she moves between the real and cyber worlds. And while she's in the cyber world, she actually has a net navy form. Iris shares a few other similarities to her game counterpart, but those are spoilers for points later in the iceberg. Duel Masters Crossover You thought that Boktai was the weirdest thing that Battle Network ever did a crossover with? Think again. The Rockman EXE series also had a crossover with Duel Masters, of all things. In Battle Network 5, there are two Giga Class battle chips based on Duel Masters. One is the Phoenix, and the other is the Death Phoenix, and are in Team Colonel and Team Proto Man, respectfully. There was also a short film included with the Rockman EXE movie, Program of Light and Darkness, that depicts Cross Fusion Mega Man teaming up with Shobu to battle against enemies from both series, and both sets of characters make small background cameos in each other's movies. The reason for this crossover was that, at the time, both series had anime and manga being published by Shogakukan and TV Tokyo, as well as both IPs having toys released by Takara Tomy. In addition to the Giga Class battle chips, Base appears as a promotional Duel Masters card called Forte, Brave Fear Lord. Oddly enough, this crossover seems to be more or less ongoing. In 2016, a card was released that featured Rockman and Kata, one of the main protagonists of Duel Masters, and in 2020, both Rockman and Forte appeared in a special event for the game Duel Masters Plays. There was also a short little manga that featured the crossover called Duel Jack, where they showed off a couple of the crossover cards, like the Forte card that I mentioned earlier. In some ways, I guess this makes more sense than the Boktai crossover, but in some ways it makes even less sense. Mr. Match's Absence from Battle Network 5 Mr. Match is a recurring character who shows up in every Battle Network game, except for 5. In the first game, his navvy is Fireman, and he's an operator for World 3, who causes ovens to explode. In Battle Network 2, he's an optional boss, now operating Heatman. He plays no part in the main story. Match once again returns in Battle Network 3, having rejoined World 3, this time with Flame Man, and he attempts to burn down Scilab. During Battle Network 4 Red Sun, he's a contestant in the Den Tournament, once again with Fireman, and he tries to burn down the Den Dome. He appears later in both versions of the game, having a spat with Burner Man. This little firefight causes the net to literally be set ablaze. After a long streak of arsonistic actions, he ends off the series in Battle Network 6, as an elementary school teacher, operating Heatman again. 
So, where was he during Battle Network 5? According to a developer interview, while Nebula was out causing mayhem, he was out taking courses to become a teacher. How could they even think to let a repeat offender net terrorist, guilty of arson at least twice and a third attempt, anywhere near a school? That's just a terrible idea. Especially when the final group of antagonists is a revived World 3. Again! This is just one of the moments in Battle Network 6 that makes absolutely no sense. That said, I really do like Heatman in this game. I just don't trust the operator as far as I could throw him. But I guess if Ikichi Onizuka can become a teacher, anybody can. Another perspective that I've heard on this is that maybe Mr. Match became a teacher as community service in order to reduce his sentence? It definitely seems like he should be behind bars given how many times he's broken the law, and he even tried again in Battle Network 4. So maybe they cut a deal and made becoming a teacher part of his parole and probation? I still wouldn't trust him, but I suppose it's possible. Red Sun and Blue Moon were originally one game. This idea expresses the possibility that perhaps earlier on in development, both versions of Battle Network 4 were just one big game. While this point on the iceberg was contributed by Bigfoot Hunter V2, this is my personal headcanon when it comes to which versions are actually canon to the Battle Network series. But unlike the 5th and 6th games, which have to be one or the other from a story standpoint, in that your anti-nebula strike team in Battle Network 5 has to be either or, and Mega Man can only absorb one side beast in Battle Network 6, both versions of Battle Network 4 could theoretically have happened. Both versions of the game have the ability to unlock story scenarios from the opposite version, with the only real gameplay difference being which navvies you form a double soul with. Outside of that, the only real differences are the various miscellaneous aesthetic changes. The only thing that would need to change from there is who starts the cheer to give Mega Man willpower during the endgame panic. I think Sal makes a lot more sense than Mr. Match does, so let's go with that. On that note, it also makes a lot more sense for Laser Man to put Mega Man's Dark Soul into Guts Man, because you don't always fight Aquaman every time you play Battle Network 4, so Mega Man may not have met him on this playthrough. But Guts Man works in this scenario because we already had three whole games with Guts Man as a character. If we take the story of Battle Network 4 linearly, then I always imagined it as every tournament is just way, way bigger than they look, and Land fights all possible opponents before going on to save the world from Duo's asteroid. That's how the story would make the most sense with what we see in the final cutscenes, at least. Otherwise, how are we supposed to know who Chilski and Raika are? What if we didn't fight them on this playthrough? More than that, unlike Rockman EXE 3 and 5, which both had an initial release and then an updated second version later, both versions of EXE 4 were released simultaneously. This is further compounded upon by the fact that the version-exclusive scenarios and bosses can be accessed by linking the games together. And all of the Gigachip icons are present in both versions, unlike the other multiversion games where they don't use the opposite version's Gigachip images. Blinking Statue In Battle Network 4, when you go to Yumland, you find a giant Buddha statue that has a cyber world. If you wait long enough, the statue blinks. Yeah, its eyes open and close. Why is this a thing? Why creep us out like this? Ferroman EXE's Operator In every piece of media containing Ferroman.exe, he's always depicted as a solo navvy, even going so far as to declare himself as the supreme solo net navvy in the anime. I claim that I am the one true supreme solo net navi. However, on page 130 of the Mega Man Battle Network Complete Works, we can see concept art for his operator, who is a masked figure. While this operator never appears in the game, it does support the idea that maybe some of the so-called solo navvies do in fact have operators. The masked battler for solo navi concept was actually reused in the anime, as mentioned previously, with Stone Man and Blaster Man's fake operators being disguised robots. We already covered Operation Shooting Star, but I have a little more info to add to this one. At the end of one of the trailers for Operation Shooting Star, we can see what looks like Dark Mega Man appear, with some text that, when run through a translator, says, Beyond time, EXEs are now revived. Even though this looks like Dark Mega Man, I don't think it actually is, because this image was used in advertising material for Mega Man Battle Network 2, so this means that there was planned to be at least an Operation Shooting Star 2, but it never came to be. This is most likely because, apparently, the launch of the game was a complete disaster, with the game being relegated to bargain bins after less than a month. This isn't that surprising, though, since Operation Shooting Star was basically just Battle Network 1 with some small quality of life improvements, in addition to the Star Force crossover. But on the whole, it's just not of the same objective quality as Battle Network 5 Double Team DS. Who knows if Operation Shooting Star 2 or 3 will ever happen, though. Maybe if the EXE and Star Force Legacy collections sell well enough, we might get some OSS remakes on modern platforms, too. Not likely, but we can dream. Event Battle Chips Ever since the first game, there were event-exclusive battle chips. They were obtained either by attending events hosted by Capcom or by sending your cartridge into Capcom when they offered the service. 
These types of battleships include Base and Battle Network 1, Base and Rogue in Operation Shooting Star, Gospel and Gate SP in Battle Network 2, and Punk and Base GS in Battle Network 3. As far as I'm aware, the rest of the event ships were e-reader exclusives, like Duo, Grand Prix Power, Chaos Lord, Leader's Raid, the Psy Beasts, and Double Beasts. I could be mistaken, though. Undubbed Anime Seasons As I've stated several times before, the rest of the Rockman EXE anime after Access never made it outside Japan. The stream arc more or less follows the plot of Battle Network 4 and 5, with the main antagonists being Duo and Dr. Regal, though they're not working together, and several villains of the week are characters from Battle Networks 3 through 5. The Beast Arc is based on Battle Network 6, but takes several liberties, and has the cast jumping to an alternate universe to battle Gregar and Falzar, while the final season, Beast Plus, uses the remaining enemies from Battle Network 6 that didn't show up in Beast, as well as using characters from Phantom of the Network. Oddly, I still see a few people nowadays who aren't aware that there are more seasons beyond Access, so I think this is a little more obscure than expected. Changed Jackin Animations the English versions of Battle Network 2 and 3 had different jacket animations that were more simplistic than the Japanese version. While EXE2's animation was data spiraling into the cyber world, Battle Network 2's was just a bunch of colored dots covering the screen. As for EXE3, it depicts large blocks of data flying toward the screen, reminiscent of the jacket animation from the early seasons of the anime. In the English version, though, there simply is no jacket animation, just a white screen and a sound effect to transition between the real and cyber worlds. The animation from EXE3 seems to inspire the jacket animation for Battle Network 6, and a similar version is used in Rockman EXE in One Battle, which is the Wonderswan color version of Battleship Challenge. The rest of the games in the series maintain the same jacket animations from the Japanese versions. Religious References Scattered throughout the Rockman EXE IP, there are a few religious references here and there, and I do mean more than someone just saying the word, God. In Battle Network 2, you can jack into a statue in Utopia Castle that is depicted as a divine goddess, while inside this cyber world, Lan will remark that it makes him feel holy. In Battle Network 3, you visit a location called Hades Isle to participate in the N1 Grand Prix. While Hades is known to be the god of the dead in Greek mythology, the word Hades is often synonymous with hell. Even the Bible makes reference of Hades during the Book of Revelation. In Battle Network 4, you can see a statue in Utopia that is described as a stone statue of victory, but the cyber world is labeled as Goddess Comp, and Lan wonders if the goddess the statue is based on minds them being there. In the same game, you can also go to Yumland and find a giant statue of Buddha, which also has a cyber world. In the same area, you can find a statue of an elephant, which could be meant to represent Ganesha from Hindu mythology, as well as several smaller Buddha statues scattered throughout the entire town. Just the same, the village in Netfrica has several idol statues that you can jack into, including Nopopo, the village guardian deity that represents the connection between life and nature, which leads to the Netfrica area of the internet, the lion statue used during the Kendoman scenario, and of course, the accursed water god statue and cyber world. In the Japanese version of Battle Network 5 Team Colonel, you can find a painting of the Last Supper hung in the Queen Bohemia cruise ship, although in the English version it was replaced by a painting of fireworks due to censorship reasons. I don't recall any specific references in the other games, however, although in Battle Network 6, Base's tombstone describes him as the Cyber World's God of Destruction. In most of the games, you can obtain the battleships Holy Panel and Sanctuary. Holy Panels reduce damage taken by half, and Sanctuary covers your entire area in Holy Panels. The Giga Chip Holy Dream absorbs Holy Panels and fires them as ammunition. We also have battleships like Zeus Hammer, God Hammer, and God Stone. In the anime, there are also some statues on the lawn of Yai's mansion, and one of them bears the name Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom and war. In the English version of the Mega Man Anti Warrior manga, while Mega Man and Proto Man are battling the life virus, Detective Oda says he's not a praying man, but he hopes that our heroes find favor with the Almighty, which, given the phrasing, is most likely a reference to God from Christianity, Catholicism, or possibly Judaism. Instruction Manuals you ever looked at the instruction manuals for most of these games? They're kind of silly. Like, look at this from Network Transmissions Manual. It not only gets Lan's last name wrong, calling the family Hikaru instead of Hikari, but it also says that Lan's mother's navi is named Mama, and Dr. Ikari's navi is named Papa. That's not only silly, but also just wrong. I know both of them have navis, but their navis are never named. And in the Japanese version, Lan calls his parents Mama and Papa, at least in the anime. Also, when it's showing off the other characters, when we get to Shod and Proto Man's entry, it shows Bug Style Mega Man. Not only is the Navi wrong, but style change wasn't even in Network Transmission. Bug Style appears nowhere in the game outside of this manual. Funnily enough, they actually repeat this mistake in the manual for Battle Network 3, at least in the European version. And it calls Proto Man Blues, and it says that Shod is younger than Lan and his friends. Also, why does the manual for Mega Man Battle Network 3 feature so much art of Mega Man X, and even Gate from X6? 
I get that this game was released around Mega Man's 15th anniversary, but still, you're not even using the right characters. These are from a different series. In the North American version of the manual, it shows us navvies from Network Transmission. Even though Battle Network 3 is praised as being the best game in the series, this manual is just full of false advertising. And let's take a peek at Battle Network 4's manual. When we get to the page talking about the Double Souls, it calls Proto Soul Blue Soul. It should be Blue's Soul, at the very least. But even then, it's not properly localized. They mislabeled Aqua Soul and Junk Soul, too, having gotten the names backwards. At least Red Sun's manual manages to get the names of the Double Souls correct. When describing the story, one line of text reads, Mail encourages Lan to get some equipment. These stereos have Cyber Roll and Glide. How about trying out a Jackian device? That's a horribly botched way of describing the opening events of the game, where Lan finds Mail in Elect Town and he jacks into a stereo, where Mail's Navi Roll and Yai's Navi Glide are both hanging out. Just when you thought the translations for Battle Network 4 couldn't get any worse. There are other instances, but some of these are so funny that I think it's worth your time to check these out on your own. I'll drop a link for these down in the description. This isn't exactly from the manuals, but there was some box art from Mega Man Battle Network 4 that featured Cross Fusion Mega Man that was intended to be used for the PAL version of the game. As far as I'm aware though, the box art was never actually used. Graveyard Area This is a strange location in Battle Network 6. In the English version, we only get the second half, but in the Japanese version, we have access to the first area as well. The graveyard is accessed from a weird-looking portal in the undernet. The area's background is a gloomy, cloudy sky, and there are gravestones everywhere. Every epitaph bears the name of navvies from the previous Battle Network games, including the ones that were exclusive to Battleship Challenge and Network Transmission, even those that are still alive or that have been revived from backup data. In addition to that, stalking this area are several navvies that are chanting Navi Customizer Compression Codes. The Bug Frag Trader is located in Graveyard Area 1 in the Japanese version, but it was moved to Underground Area 2 in the English release. In Graveyard 2, you find gravestones bearing the names of navvies from Battle Network 6. At the end of this area is a blank tombstone, and approaching it will throw you into a boss battle against Base SP, who says that this grave is reserved for you. Returning to this area, you'll find that all of the grave markers for the World 3 navvies are glowing red. Examining them will let you battle against the RV versions of the enemy navvies. After defeating Base BX in Underground Area 2, Beast Mega Man SP can be randomly encountered in Graveyard 1, and Base BX can be randomly encountered in Graveyard 2. You can rerun the RV boss gauntlet and battle Base SP as many times as you like. This is a pretty cool post-game area, but why does this place exist? Why are there epitaphs for navvies who are still canonically alive? Who is documenting the deletion of every navvy that Mega Man has encountered? There are a lot of unanswered questions here, and we need some explanations. Different versions, starting with Battle Network 3. Even though the North American release of Battle Network 3 was localized as blue and white versions with a simultaneous release, the Japanese counterparts were a different story. Initially, there was Rockman EXE 3, and then a few months later, an updated black version was released. Both games were brought over to the USA, with the original EXE 3 becoming white version and EXE 3 black becoming blue version. These version differences apparently came about as orders from the higher-ups when they were almost finished with the final game, and the notable version differences were added to justify the release of two separate games. After this, the remaining mainline games in the series would all feature two versions, Battle Network 4, Red Sun, and Blue Moon, Battle Network 5, Team Proto Man and Team Colonel, and Battle Network 6, Cybeast Gregar and Cybeast Falzar. Strangely enough, it seems that the continuity in between the second half of the series seems split down the middle, with recurring characters that were only featured in one specific version of each game, but not the other. For example, Shuko and Aquaman appear in Battle Network 4 Blue Moon, and then reappear in Cybeast Falzar, while Rika first appears in Battle Network 4 Red Sun, and then again in Team Proto Man. As far as releases go, Red Sun and Blue Moon had a simultaneous release, and were also packaged together in a Japanese-exclusive double pack that featured the Grand Prix Power e-reader card. And the Japanese version of Team of Blues was released before Team of Colonel, although the international release got both versions of both games simultaneously. The time in between releases could explain why the prologue and epilogue of both versions of Battle Network 5 are slightly different. This is what I meant earlier about Team Colonel seeming to be more canon than Team Proto Man by revealing that Barrel has a tie to Dr. Wily, thus setting up his character arc for Battle Network 6. Navi Marks the emblems on each navi do more than just identify them, at least in the manga and anime. In the manga, during the Psybeast arc, several powerful navis are summoned to the underground to partake in a battle royale, with the goal being to defeat as many of the other combatants as possible, as well as gathering their navi marks, which all contain emblems of power. After defeating countless opponents, Searchman, Protoman, Tomahawkman, and Colonel all give their emblems to Mega Man, since he's the only one who has the power of a Psybeast, and thus is the only one who stands a chance to defeat Gregor and Falzar, at least until Base shows up and absorbs Falzar's power for himself. 
This Navimark mechanic seems to be a bit of a downplayed version of the cross system for Battle Network 6, as the Link Navi cross system from the game never made a proper appearance in the manga, despite Mega Man using all of his other primary transformations. Transarm also doesn't make an appearance, but Transarm was basically just a bare bones version of Double Soul, mechanically speaking. In the anime, it seems that Navi emblems act as something of a weak spot, as we see Mega Man's cross fusion is broken on more than one occasion when his Navi emblem is damaged. We see a similar effect with Cross Fusion Prism Man and Needle Man, as both of their Navi marks were destroyed and the cross fusion ruptured. Although in these cases, it's stated that the Navi marks are where the core of the Dark Sinker Chip's power is located. More than that, whenever Mega Man gains a new Double Soul, the emblem of the corresponding Navi starts glowing and then Mega Man acquires a new form. Mega Man and Proto Man's Navi marks also seem to be where their so called ultimate program are contained. Although, it is kind of funny during the later arcs of the anime where operators have PETs or other objects that bear a Navi's emblem before they meet the Navi that the emblem corresponds to, like Inukai and Asteroid Beastman or Mr. Famous during the Beast arc as he still has Punk's logo on his belt, despite him not operating Punk in this series. Shod and Rika's Ages Canonically speaking, Shod and Rika are both still kids. Shod is supposedly 11 years old, just like Lan, unless we believe that error from Battle Network 3's instruction manual. And in the games, Rika is reportedly 13. This makes absolutely zero sense from a narrative standpoint. Both of these characters act way too mature to be the ages that they're said to be. But we have confirmation here. Using the Wayback Machine and Google translating the text on this page about Shod, it says, 5th grader, from a different school than Neto's. Even though he is an elementary school student, he is an official net battler. He has solved many online crimes. Therefore, his virus busting ability and his pride is top notch. He's a nice type to say the least. His in game dialogue begs to differ, but continuing on. He thinks that his Navi Blues is just a tool, and he can't understand the friendship between Neto and Rockman. He is a rival. There apparently are also some beta screenshots that depict him at the same school as Lan, as the two were originally supposed to be classmates earlier on in development. So, despite him looking and acting like he should probably be somewhere around 15, and the fact that he's already finished high school, he is canonically 11. This is something that I've never personally been able to accept. Mostly just because when you try to tell me that the badass Eugene Shod is only 11 years old like Lan, my suspension of disbelief goes out the freaking window. Especially if you're gonna say that he was Mayor Kane's bodyguard in Battle Network 6, or the leader of the Anti-Nebula Strike Force in Battle Network 5. Being great at net battles is one thing, but even if he does possess all of these impressive skills, there's no way they'd allow someone who's only 11 or 12 to do these kind of things. As for Rika, him being 13 is still a stretch, but they do seem to have aged him up a little bit in the manga and anime, making him look more like he is, at the bare minimum, 17. So if Jotaro Kujo can be 17, then I could buy Rika being a soldier at 17 as well. The Navi Master At the end of the Triple S license exam in Battle Network 2, Lan has to battle against the Navi Master, who has copies of every friendly Navi in the game, making Lan fight a V2 boss rush. Winning this will give Lan the right to challenge the final virus survival battle in order to obtain the Triple S license, which then allows him access to deeper parts of the net and the treasures that hide there. But who is the Navi Master? It's none other than Lan's father, Yuichiro Hikari. We know that Dr. Hikari does create navvies, as he designed Mega Man, but why does he have copies of all of these other navvies? Having image data of Gutsman or Gateman is one thing, but all of the others? Why does he have a copy of Proto Man and Heat Man, especially since Heat Man is operated by a former World 3 member? Or copies of Thunder Man and Snake Man, who are from overseas. Is Dr. Ikari hiding something from us? From a gameplay perspective, this is just meant to be a boss rush, and that's par for the course in the Mega Man franchise, and we have a Gospel Navi boss rush in the last stretch of the game. All that's missing are the Navis from the World 3 area and base, and we'll have a boss rush for every Navi in the game. Buster A Chip This seems to be a placeholder battle chip. It's only obtainable using hacks or glitches, and doesn't really do anything. The best guess we can make is that originally, the Mega Buster was going to be a battle chip before it was assigned to the B button. The chip art is kind of bland compared to other battle chips in the final version of the game and seems to be from very early on in development. The description of this chip is, get closer to hit faster. I wasn't able to get the chip to show up in my game, but I'll link a Reddit post in the description showing a bit more of this battle chip. There are plenty of other unused battle chips in the series as well, but this one is probably the most well known. Unused Battle Chips Continuing the tangent, there are a number of battle chips that either go unused or are only accessible by using cheats or hacks. In Battle Network 1 and Operation Shooting Star, there are some dummy chips whose description reads ID and some number. The ones that I could uncover didn't do anything in Battle Network 1, and neither did most of the ones from OSS, but two of them actually had an effect. ID 23 was Star Force Mega Man Shield, and ID 24 was a Guts Punch. In addition to these, Battle Network 5 and 6 have some battle chips that can only be accessed via a battle chip gate or hacking. Some of the chips for Battle Network 6 include the Z-Saber, as well as Sync Trigger, which instantly activates full synchro. 
Using Grega Master's old battleship editing program, I was able to reinsert the Z-Saber into the game, but I couldn't get Sync Trigger to work. Other unused or chip gay exclusives include Punch Arm, Needle Arm, Puzzle Arm, Boomer Arm, Dark Sword, Dark Thunder, Dark Recovery, Dark Invis, and Dark Plus. The Arm chips change Mega Man's charge shot into various weapons, and the Dark chips absorb bug frags upon use. Other unused chips include various event or e-reader card exclusive chips, as well as some of the chips that were removed when the Boxite crossover was cut out of the English version of Battle Network 6. Judgeman's Unused Attacks Out of all of the unused battle chips or attacks in the series, Judgeman in Battle Network 6 has some of the strangest. He apparently would give Mega Man specific commands along the lines of, Mega Man, thou must not move. If you were to do what he tells you not to do, it's assumed that there would be some kind of punishment. But since the attacks go unused, we can't be sure. Other lines say, Thou must not use a battle chip, and Thou must not area grab. And it is possible to reactivate the dialog box when hacking, but there's no punishment attached to it. For more info, you can check out the Cutting Room Floors page on Battle Network 6. LAN survives a lethal dose of radiation. Remember how I mentioned that the servers in Gospel's headquarters were literally growing due to the amounts of radiation? Well, it gets worse. LAN was constantly being exposed to high amounts of radiation during the final stretch of the game. And, during the final battle specifically, the radiation reaches extremely dangerous levels, described by Mega Man as exceeding 50,000 times the normal levels, when the server output was at 100%. At 150%, it doubled to 100,000 times normal levels, and Mega Man said that Land's radiation-resistant mag suit wouldn't be able to shield him from anything higher. As time went on, the output climbs upwards of 600, if we do the math based on the figures we were given, at a 50,000 times increase along with a 50% increase in server power, then that means that when Land blacks out, he is caught in a radiation wave that exceeds 550,000 times normal levels. I'm not even going to pretend to know how radiation works, and my math is probably wrong, but if Land's legs went numb at 150%, he blacked out at 600%, and the server power kept going up on its own, Land should not still be alive after this incident. Or at the very least, he should have suffered long-term damage. If this were any kind of realistic, assuming Land survived this, at the bare minimum, he should have been sterilized and his future son, Patch, shouldn't exist. The LP archive delivers some commentary on how radiation works and can give you a better picture of what Land would have actually been in for given all that radiation. Shade Man's Immortality Out of every Navi that has been deleted multiple times in the series, I dare say that Shade Man is the one that is the hardest to permanently kill. You don't understand. Being revived with backup data or dark energy is one thing, but this guy has survived weapons specifically designed to kill him twice, if we take the Boxite crossover as canon. After deleting him in the main story of Battle Network 4, Mega Man comes across Solar Boy Django in the Undernet, who just got done battling a revived Shade Man and sealed him in a coffin, trying to use the Pile Driver on him. For those unfamiliar with Boxite, the Pile Driver is a weapon blessed by the spirits of the sun and the earth, designed to permanently destroy vampires and other immortal creatures by directly attacking the dark matter within their souls. The rest of the side quest involves us retrieving the solar sensor and then reducing Shade Man to dust. But that wasn't the end. Shade Man returns in Boktai 2 as a post-game boss, and Django repeats this process in his world, meaning that Shade Man was put through the pile driver twice and apparently is able to keep coming back. I shouldn't be too surprised though, since the Count kinda did the same thing, but I digress. And then, Shade Man returns again during Battle Network 5 and is deleted and revived multiple times, AGAIN, after being destroyed by a weapon used specifically to kill vampires, twice. Either the pile driver ain't all it's cracked up to be, or Shade Man is just that stubborn. Let's count all the times he was destroyed and revived. Deleted by Mega Man, then Django in Battle Network 4, and then purified. So that's two, maybe two and a half. Defeated and purified by Django in Boktai 2, so that's at least three. And then in Battle Network 5, deleted once in Oran Area's Liberation Mission, at least twice in the Dark Chip Factory, and once again in Nebula Area, making a total of seven times we've had to kill the same vampire to get him to stay dead. Funnily enough, there's only one time in the story of the mainline games where you fight him as a normal boss, and that is in the Dark Chip Factory in Battle Network 5. Every other time, there's a different win condition attached to the battle, like needing to use Dark Chips or deleting him within three turns during a Liberation mission. This whole unwillingness to die thing is made even more infuriating due to the fact that every other incarnation of Shademan.exe is defeated relatively easily. In the NT Warrior manga, Mega Man literally just tears him apart with his bare hands after getting angry enough. In Battle Story Rockman EXE, Mega Man uses the Gundel Soul to weaken him before finishing him off with a Proto Man and Proto Soul combo attack. In the Solar Boy Django manga, Shade Man was tough, but was defeated after Django combined his solar powers with the Mega Buster to blast a hole through him, leading Shade Man to retreat back to the Cyber World. 
In the anime, Shade Man was incredibly resilient and actually was temporarily defeated, but he was restored by base, only for Cross Fusion Laser Man to effortlessly defeat him in quite a graphic display, if we watch the Japanese version. Shade Man would later appear again in stream, but this was due to time travel shenanigans and it was not revived under his own power. You can see he still has the wounds he got from Laser Man. He was later defeated by Colonel and Mega Man, and was deleted by forcibly removing his own Navi Mark, which contained his Dark Lloyd essence, in an attempt to corrupt every Navi in the world with his Dark Lloyd factor. Yeah, that episode got complicated. Mod tools are illegal. In Battle Network 3, there was this annoying mechanic where certain Navi customizer programs can't be used because they give you an error code. To bypass this, you have to obtain the mod tools from some shady guy on Beach Street. The mod tools will let you enter a code to bypass the error and make the programs work, but you have to know what the code is to enter it. Some of these are talked about in various BBS boards that you can find at the different net squares in the game. As for them being illegal, I'm not sure. I don't remember seeing anything specific about the mod tools being illegal, other than them being an extra add-on that was not intended to be included with the standard issue PET, and some of the programs you access using them seem kinda sketchy in nature, like Dark License and Hub Batch, since Dark License grants you the ability to freely use Dark Chips, and Hub Batch seems to unlock Hub's dormant soul within Mega Man. And again, it's an optional pickup from a sketchy guy, who acts like it's a really big secret, asking you not to tell anybody that he sold them to you. So, I guess they could be illegal since hacking is still very frowned upon even in the Battle Network universe? But if they are illegal, then why did Shod, who is an official, which is basically a cyber cop, freely give away an error code on the Scilab BBS when someone else was asking about it? But the mod tools have a secondary function as well. Extra codes. There's a neat trick you can do in Battle Network 3 if you have the mod tool key item. After running your Navi Customizer, if you don't get an error message, you can input a series of codes using the mod tools that will give Mega Man some enhanced abilities, like more HP, increased buster power, etc. Some extra codes have negative side effects while in use, and some don't. The extra codes are also featured as a plot device in the anime. Mr. Famous gives these extra codes to Lan and Mr. Match at different points in the series. The only one being shown, though, is the one that grants Mega Man 200 extra HP. Oddly enough, in the English version, during Lan's battles with Planet Man and Magnet Man, they changed the code that appears on screen, yet left it unchanged when it was being used by Mr. Match during Heat Man's battle with Freeze Man. For the record, the code Mr. Match uses on Heat Man is the proper 200 HP plus code, but the one that Lan uses is not a real extra code. In the Japanese version, the code was the same all three times. I guess maybe they wanted to give two different codes for two different operators? Either way, this incarnation of the extra codes shows that using it puts an enormous strain on the Navi, despite the code being used to grant them extra HP. Maybe this is why mod tools are illegal? Extra codes and powerful programs with error codes are too dangerous to be used in regular net battles? Make note that neither Mr. Match nor Lan have mod tools, and yet they still use the plus 200 HP extra code. And after the code is used, their navy is drained of almost all their energy. Maybe the mod tools allow this handicap to be circumvented so they're not allowed under normal circumstances? Who knows? Miss Yuri Did you know that Lan's teacher, Miss Mari, actually has a twin sister? Her name is Miss Yuri, or Yuriko in Japan and she teaches at the school in Dentown. She's a former World 3 agent, and she helps Lan by providing him with some of World 3's access codes for deeper parts of the net. At the end of the game, she's kidnapped, along with Mr. Higsby, before Lan rescues them. In the anime, Miss Yuri plays a completely different role. While she is still Miss Mari's twin sister, she was separated from her family after a plane crash left her on the brink of death. She was only saved by divine intervention from Duo, who chose her and Dr. Regal to be his probes to observe humanity. Dr. Wily found the pair stranded on a beach after the plane crash and decided to raise the girl as his own daughter. Miss Yuri would then go on to become a main antagonist during the access arc of the anime, being the operator of Needleman, or Spike Man in the dub, as well as a master of disguise and deception. She's the one responsible for Prison Man and his operator turning into Dark Lloyds, and she eventually tries to murder her sister, Miss Mari, except in the dub they called this a Neuro Disruptor, which would fry a person's central nervous system. She uses a Dark Synchro chip to perform a cross-fusion with Needleman, and battles with cross-fusion Mega Man. She has a change of heart, though, and saves Miss Mari from Dark Proto Man, resulting in both her and Misaki being blown off the bridge they were standing on. Miss Yuri would later return as an ally to Lan and Mega Man, helping the battle against Duo's asteroid navvies. Horned Pink Navi. This is an oddity that nobody seems to have an answer to. During Battle Network 2's ending credit sequence, on more than one occasion, we see a pink navi with a pointy head. It kind of looks like it has a fishy virus attached to it, but this navi appears nowhere else in the game and it doesn't have an independent sprite sheet. It just seems to be an offset of the sprite sheets used for the normal and security navvies. Remember earlier how I said that Mega Man's style changes were all part of the same sprite file? The same can be said here. 
I looked at the sprites myself using an old program created by Grega Master, and scrolling through the various animations and palettes assigned to the normal Navi sprite sheets, we see that they have this horned head on them in some animations for whatever reason. I'm not sure if this was a reference that was unexplained or an easter egg from the developers, but either way, we'd like some answers, though we'll likely never get them. NT Warrior Manga This entry refers to the Rockman EXE manga created by Ryo Takamasaki. I gave it heavy praise last time, and I stand by that. Great writing, great art, great action, and truthfully, probably my favorite incarnation of the story behind Rockman EXE. Beyond the three works that I mentioned last time, the main story of the manga, Runaway Blues, and Forte vs. Serenade, Takamasaki also wrote a story that covers the time from the defeat of the Cybeasts to Mega Man's return to the Cyber World called The Pair's Journey, and other short stories, and we're still getting new chapters of the manga to this day. We recently got Forte, Time of Reunion, as well as Mega Man Battle Network 20 Year Reunion, which was in English by the way, and more chapters are on the way. To celebrate Rockman EXE's 20th anniversary, an item called The Treasure Box was released, which contained Runaway Blues within it. As a promotion for the manga's re-release, there was a compilation of manga chapters that were given voiceovers and sound effects. This 12-minute video contains segments from the first four volumes of Takamasaki's EXE manga. I'll have the link to this one in the description. While the extra works will likely never get an official English release, we fortunately have fan translations to fall back on. I'm glad that we're still getting new releases for this series, even to this day. Swordman's Multiple Personalities a feature exclusive to the anime, but the Dark Lloyd and Asteroid Navi Swordman.exe has multiple personalities, based on whichever large sword he happens to be using for his headpiece at the time. They all have different voices, but don't seem to have that much difference between personalities on the whole, though the red one seems to be the main personality, and the other two act more like just separate entities who can take turns controlling the body. Network Transmission The GameCube spin-off that chronologically takes place between Battle Network 1 and 2. Instead of an RPG, this game is a platformer, like Classic Mega Man. Battleships are still used in-game and are obtained as drops from enemies. This game also features several unique bosses that don't appear in the main series, including Swordman, Gravity Man, Starman, and Zero.exe. The gameplay is fun, but the boss difficulty is extremely high. There are some discrepancies in the timeline, though, as Lan is shown having the PET used in Battle Network 3, even though this takes place between Battle Network 1 and 2, and characters he encounters in this game apparently don't remember him and Mega Man in later games, including Quick Man, Shadow Man, and Pharaoh Man. If you can get your hands on it, I say that it's a must-play for any EXE fan. There apparently exists a concept art of a special GameCube controller that was meant to be released alongside this game, but it never came to be. Some characters and events in this game were used in later arcs of the Rockman EXE anime, including The Professor and Zero.exe. Count Zap and Gauss are brothers. Exactly as the title says. Count Jack Zap and Magnus Gauss, the operators of Elecman and Magnet Man, are, in fact, brothers. This fact is likely well known by those who watched the Mega Man Inti Warrior anime, but was probably lost on the Western audiences who might have only played the games or read the manga. The reason for this is that the translation for the first two games actually botched the connection between the two characters. We don't learn Count Zap's first name during the course of Battle Network 1, and during Quiz King's Quiz in Battle Network 2, they mistakenly call Count Zap by his Japanese name of Jack Electricity. In the story, we do have one line of dialogue where Gauss makes mention of his brother, Jack, who was adopted into a wealthy family, but again, we didn't know that Count Zap's first name was Jack. They don't even call him by this name in Battle Network 6 when we're talking to his wife and Zap. And, well, in the manga, Count Zap and Gauss are never even in the same room together or have any sort of interaction. The anime is a much different story, with the two of them butting heads and having electrically charged net battles on more than one occasion, each one trying to one-up the other. The rivalry goes so deep that Count Zap continued to fight against Gauss, even though when they found out that Dr. Wily was behind Grave, the other two present World 3 members decided to retreat. He even went so far as to order the severely damaged Elect Man to pull Magnet Man into the path of Mega Man's Mega Death Burst program events, deleting both navvies in the process. Soul Battler Takeshi This is one character that has never had a physical appearance in the games, but he shows up on the BBS boards. As a character, he's based on one of the real-life announcers for official tournaments held by Capcom. As an announcer, he has had various outfits at different tournaments. He also had a commentary appearance in the Rockman EXE 15 Shunin Arrange Best Tracks, commenting for the EXE 4.5 track. There is also an e-reader card that featured the character. I wonder if he'll have an appearance in the Legacy Collection, maybe as an announcer for the online multiplayer mode, similar to how Ribita does for the tournaments in EXE 4.5. New Game 100 This is another rumor from back in the day. Every time you completed the game by defeating Duo and saving your game, when you select New Game Plus again, a number increments next to your Continue option on the title screen. It's been rumored that if you reach the number 100, or beat the game with 99 next to the Continue option, that your entire save file will be erased because the counter cannot increment higher than 99.
However, it seems that speedrunners have debunked this. The counter will not increment higher than 99, and the save data is not corrupted afterward. Still a fun rumor, though. Aneta and Silk When it comes to the various works in the Rockman EXE IP, most of the time character traits remain consistent throughout all versions. Dex is full of himself and often gets in over his head, Shot is an overachiever with self-worth issues, Yai is a spoiled little rich girl, Male has very little personality outside of being a romantic interest, and so on. However, the anime changed up a few characters quite drastically compared to their original game counterparts. One such was Aneta, who first appeared in Battle Network 3. In the game, she was a World 3 member and the operator of Plant Man. However, in the anime, her role is entirely different. She was just a civilian, and her navi was Silk.exe, a nurse-type navi who was her only friend. Aneta was undergoing physical therapy when the hospital caught fire, and she sent her navi in to try to solve the problem. However, Silk was deleted by Proto Man, causing Aneta to seek revenge on him and Shod, leading to her seeking out Nebula and planting a dark longsword in Shod's battleship holder in an effort to corrupt Proto Man. However, she later found out that Silk had been corrupted by the Dark Aura that was causing the network problems in the first place, and Silk had asked Proto Man to delete her so that the system would restart and Aneta could escape. When Proto Man hesitated, Silk purposefully jumped onto his sword, sacrificing herself to save her operator and the remaining patients in the hospital. After Aneta reveals that Dr. Regal is behind Nebula, Miss Yuri kidnaps her, and the ensuing battle leads to Proto Man using a dark chip in order to stop Shade Man from destroying both Lan and Shod. While Aneta did get what she wanted in a roundabout way, she felt guilty for having inflicted the same pain on Shod that she felt after losing Silk, and would later befriend the Net Savers, helping out however she could. While the Navi Plant Man does appear in the same arc of the anime as Aneta, the two of them never interact, leading to both of them having vastly different character arcs in between mediums. In the games, Aneta was basically Sal if she decided to go to the same extremes as those hardcore environmentalist terrorists from Battle Network 4, since she was willing to attack a hospital while patients were undergoing life-saving surgery, all in the name of protecting nature, because she believed that Net Society was harming nature. I have to say, the anime version is much more interesting and far more memorable. EXE Fan Games in addition to there being various ROM hacks of the Battle Network series, there are also several fan games that either take influence from Battle Network or are fan-made sequels or reimaginings. The most well-known of these is Battle Network Chrono X, which is essentially a fan-made Battle Network 7. It takes place after Battle Network 6, and Lan and Mega Man are thrown back into the fray when a new enemy appears. This project has been in development for over 10 years, and currently Demo 5 is available for the public to play. I believe the developer said they're on the verge of releasing Demo 5.1, which will be a big update. Rio and I played Demo 5.01 on stream, so you can check that out, but I recommend you play it for yourselves. Another one is called Mega Man Battle Network Overclocked, which is the first two scenarios of Battle Network 1, but done in 3D style. The developer stated that this is more so a proof-of-concept demo, and that they do not have any intentions of making a full game, if I understand correctly. But stemming from that, I think there is also another 3D Battle Network 1 demo made by a separate team? Someone correct me if I'm wrong on this one. Another one that I just recently found out about is Mega Man Cosmic Network. From what I could dig up, this project is still a work in progress, and currently there's not a publicly available demo. But when there is one, I definitely want to check this out. Another one that's decently well known is Shanghai EXE Genzo Network, which is basically if Toho characters fought using Mega Man Battle Network gameplay style. This one is a PC fan game and not a ROM hack. This is another one that Ryo and I plan to explore in the future. We also have Open Net Battle, which does require some coding knowledge to use properly, and it lets you add your own navvies, sprites, and so on. Once we can get it working properly, Rio and I will definitely be playing this one. Some others that are a bit lesser known are Grid Force, Grid Masters, Triwing, and End Cycle Versus, all of which fight on a grid similar to the Battle Network games. These are available on Steam. Not exactly a fan game, but One Step from Eden also uses a similar style of combat and is on Nintendo Switch. Another one in the similar veins is Phantom Rift, which is available on mobile. A video showcasing all of these was made by Debonair Livestreams, and I'll link the full video below. BN1 Credits Warp Here's some speedrun tech for ya. There's a glitch in the end game of Battle Network 1 where extinguishing two specific flames inside the first World 3 base computer will set a flag that triggers a credit warp if you decide to stop right there and then return to ACDC Town. This glitch was discovered by the Reddit user Skims is my name and apparently also does work on Operation Shooting Star. Pikachu Carpet so it turns out that the Pikachu rug in Yai's house isn't only in Battle Network 3 White, but it's also in the first two Battle Network games. I just completely spaced on this when I made the first Iceberg video. I guess I didn't remember it because I didn't really spend a lot of time in Yai's house in the first two games, so I just kind of forgot it was there. Robot Master Torchman while Torchman may be the localized name for Fireman.exe in the anime and manga, there is a Robot Master named Torchman who's introduced in Mega Man 11 alongside Blastman. 
But if we want to be completely accurate and go back even further, there was also a robot master from the non-canon Mega Man 3 DOS game. While Torchman EXE and Mega Man 11's Torchman are both very fire-based, both shooting flames from their hands, DOS Torchman seems to be more based on a welding torch, and his portrait graphic is a reskin of Magnet Man's portrait from Mega Man 3 on the NES. Kinda funny how the DOS game of all things made an appearance in the EXE series. Star Coliseum This is a bonus mode included with Operation Shooting Star, where you can play against some friends or play solo and battle against base. You can play as Mega Man EXE, Star Force Mega Man, or Proto Man. Winning this minigame will earn you points, which you can exchange for battle chips to use in the main game. You could use this to get your chip folder pretty buffed up at the very beginning of the game, if you want to take the time to play the Coliseum enough. Region Exclusive Toys Of course, because Rockman EXE first started in Japan, they got some exclusive figures that we didn't get over here. In my opinion, the coolest line of these was the Rockin' Action figures, which were very poseable and roughly 4.5 inches tall. They came with a Navi, as well as several weapons and a virus to fight. The known figures in this line are Mega Man paired with Rush, Proto Man who didn't get a virus, Base paired with a Bunny, and several style changes for Mega Man with various viruses. Wood Shield with a Red UFO, Heat Guts with a Metar, Elect Guts with a Metar 2, Aqua Custom with a Flappy, Elect Team with a B-Tank, and Hub Style with a Brushman, also released in Transparent with a Brushman 2. When the Anti-Warrior era started, Japan also got some exclusive figures and model kits paired with various battle chips as well. This included characters that didn't get toys over here, like Metal Man and Shade Man. Now these next ones, I'm not sure if they were region exclusive, but I never saw them in stores here in the States. In the English toy line, there were many figures for Sparkman, Burner Man, another Mega Man and Proto Man, Base, and even the Grey Virus Beast. I only say they're region exclusive because the only way I've been able to find them in the past was on eBay shipped from Australia. I got my hands on Base, who came with a Blizzard battle chip, and Burner Man, who came with a Gundel Soul 2. I wanted the Grey Virus Beast figure, but I haven't been able to find it since. There are some unreleased NT Warrior figures that either got prototypes or promotional art for them, but they never hit store shelves. These include 5-inch figures for Burner Man, Shade Man, Freeze Man, Wood Shield, Aqua Custom, and Elect Team Style Mega Man, as well as many figures for Aqua Custom Mega Man and Shadow Man. For the last two, I've actually heard conflicting reports. Some say they were released but were exceedingly rare, and others say that they were never actually released. There was also supposed to be a role-themed Battleship booster pack, but it never saw the light of day as far as I'm aware. On that note, we also have the North American Advanced PET-2, which has a prototype, but it never went into full production. Just a little bit of fun trivia for you, the only Giga Chips in the Advanced PET Battleship series to not get a physical chip were Signal Red and Black Barrier, if we don't include Duo since he was an e-reader exclusive. I'm not entirely sure why these two didn't get chips made, though. According to the Mega Man knowledge base, Life Sync also apparently wasn't released in Japan, despite it being released elsewhere. Apparently, Torchman also got a Battle Chip booster pack in Mexico and Australia, and they're even harder to find than the Series 3 minifigures that I talked about previously. There are countless other rare or exclusive figures, but I just wanted to give you a small taste of what's out there. I wish I had the money to collect all of these. Number doors aren't random. Some more speedrun tech for you. According to Terrage42, the number doors in the school computer that don't have a specific answer, like the number of desks or books in a room, actually aren't completely random. If I understand his explanation correctly, there are a set number of possible answers that it could be, and each time the game is reset, it chooses a different number from a pool of possible answers, and apparently cannot be RNG manipulated. I did some combing of the Battle Network speedrun Discord server, but so far I haven't found a way to explain it myself, but if you'd like some more info, then check out Taraja's speedruns of the game. I personally am not a speedrunner, so I'm not the best one to talk about this kind of trivia, but I thought it'd be interesting nonetheless. I'll plug some of his videos in the description, as well as on the screen, so you can check him out for yourself. Alpha. Again, I think I covered Alpha's game counterpart well enough. In the Mega Man NT Warrior manga, Alpha exists, but it's only talked about in passing without actually doing much. It's said to be both the prototype of the internet and the link between the normal cyber world and the dark world. Base GS manifests out of Alpha's core before Alpha is destroyed by a shockwave from Base. Beyond that, Alpha has practically no presence in the manga. In the anime, Alpha doesn't exist, but its role is given to Pharaoh Man, as I stated earlier in the video. One of Scilab's earliest super-advanced AI constructs to control the cyber world, but was too powerful and was sealed away. Alpha also appeared in Battle Story Rockman EXE and is an antagonistic force, before being destroyed by Mega Man and Lan. Lan in Star Force It's already been established during Battle Network 6's end credits that Lan goes on to become a scientist, and during Mega Man Star Force 2, you can find diary entries left behind by him that talk about the future of all the main EXE cast. Lan apparently developed a new system called the Link Theory, which would help people become closer together, creating a bond deeper than normal friendship. This would go on to be developed into Link Power and the Brother Bands in Mega Man Star Force. Also, as mentioned earlier, there's a 3D model of Lan in the code of Star Force 1, for some reason. New Battle Network Mobile Game 
There have been rumors about a new Battle Network mobile game circling for years, unrelated to the Japanese dumb phone mobile games. Not much is known about this idea, although it apparently was something separate from Rockman X Dive. If we did get a new mobile game centered around the Battle Network world, if it wasn't a remake of the dumb phone mobile games, then I think it'd be cool to see something Pokemon Go style, where you could customize your own Navi and travel around the real world, battling viruses or participating in boss raids on Navis from the EXE series, and maybe setting up bases similar to gyms. We can dream, but it's unlikely to happen anytime soon, because it seems that the Go game fad is dying out, and honestly Capcom doesn't really care enough about Mega Man to put that kind of effort into things. Unused Sprites like with most games from the GBA era, there are plenty of unused sprites in these series. You can see most of these on the cutting room floor, but let's go over some of the more interesting ones. From Battle Network 1, we see that Shaud and Mail have unused running sprites. I assume that these would have been used during the game's ending sequence, as World 3's fortress was exploding, rather than them just walking like they did in the final version of the game. The spooky viruses, which give you the invis battle chips, apparently have some unused laughing animations, and Metars and Volgears have a flinching animation. Some of the cars that drive around Dentown have unused vertical and horizontal sprites, unused since the streets are all at right angles. Woodman has an unused overworld and mugshot sprite. In the early drafts and promos for the game, Woodman was slated to be an enemy, so he was likely going to be an early boss, but was replaced by Fireman and demoted to an optional boss in the final cut of the game. In Battle Network 2, we have some placeholder panel sprites, since Battle Network 2 is the first game to introduce new panel types. We also have an unused Battle Chip graphic that shows a bunch of static, though a similar graphic is used in Battle Chip Challenge. In Battle Network 3, the twin viruses have some color palettes that go unused, and Mr. Famous has some animations that never get used, including him adjusting his glasses and leaning over like he's out of breath. Or maybe his old student that got his move sealed off came back in time and punched him in the gut here too. Battle Network 4 has a pink palette for the normal Navi battle sprites that goes unused. This won't make sense, since pink normal Navis have been around since Battle Network 1 and were also featured in Battle Chip Challenge. Sparkman also has a normal overworld sprite, despite never showing up outside of the hollow display in the Den Dome computer. And each of the Double Souls also has a different color palette reflecting the various karma states. Battle Network 5 features some unused overworld sprites for both Napalm Man and Tomahawk Man. They appear to be injured, probably intended for use following their boss fights in the story. Larkman has some unused color palettes for his overworld versions. These look awesome. In Battle Network 6, the Pulse Bulb enemy has some unused animations where they have this little thing that spins around their center. Currently, we don't know what the trigger for this animation is. Mega Man also has an animation to use Tomahawk Swing while not in Tomahawk Cross. This one is in the game, but it's called unused because it's only legitimately used when this cross is active. Remember that the sprites for the crosses in Battle Network 6 are just an upper body layered on top of Mega Man's normal sprite. So for most of the unique attacks that Cross Mega Man needs to do, normal Mega Man also needed a sprite for them. Except for Charge Cross's tackle move. That one is tied to the Cross's sprite, not to base Mega Man's sprite. There are more, but I thought these were some of the more interesting ones. Again, you can find most of these on the cutting room floor. King Chaos. One of the super bosses of Battle Network 5. Though King Chaos himself as a boss isn't super obscure, we don't really know much about him as a character, or the Dark Realm that he controls. Given the name and that he's described as Hatred Incarnate, I think that it's possible that he could be tied to the Chaos area from Battle Network 4.5, since Laser Man describes it as a place that swirls with hatred and dark power. If you listen closely, the Chaos area's theme has some musical similarities to the Undernet and Nebula area themes from Battle Network 5. As a boss, King Chaos resides in the deepest pit of Nebula area, and can take the form of Nebula Grey, Base, or Dark Mega Man. His battle chip, Chaos Lord, shows the animation of Nebula Grey disappearing into a portal, only for Base to materialize and then use Chaos Nightmare on the enemy. If King Chaos is the ultimate entity of darkness and hatred, and Duo is the ultimate good, then we really need to see these two throw down. It's implied that Duo at least knows of King Chaos' existence, as completing the first Nebula Area Liberation mission grants the player a Justice One battle chip, which is the giant Duo Fist. This chip is given to us via a mysterious disembodied voice, the same voice that grants you the other two Duo-themed chips, Meteor Knuckle or Big Hook, after defeating the Chaos Lord for the first time. Glide, Roll, and Zero Battle in Battle Network 3 these are old rumors from back in the early 2000s. There are three separate rumors on how to encounter these characters in Battle Network 3. To encounter Glide, you supposedly only get one chance at the beginning of the game. After dinner, on the first night, you're supposed to go to Yai's house before you go to the school, where she will let you net battle her. When you walk around ACDC Town at night, Yai isn't even in her house, so this is a flop. This description was taken from Cheat Code Central. I remember hearing another version where you could supposedly battle Yai after defeating Flashman, just go to her house before heading home, but this too is a bust. 
Sadly, there is no glide battle in any of the EXE works. This was always weird, because in the anime, Glide uses several high power and rare battle chips, like Life Aura and Hero Sword. In the manga, he was seen using a Vulcan gun while he was possessed by a virus. In the games, his trademark attack is Glide Flash, which I'm not sure exactly what it does. He used it to extinguish some flames in World 3 Base's first computer in Battle Network 1, and again in Battle Network 6 to destroy some enemy navvies who are using copybots, but that's done off-screen. However, Midnight WV4 posted a video of what he imagined a glide battle would look like by hacking a battle in BN6. As for how to fight Roll, the most common method I hear is that while you're doing the Undernet rankings, after getting rank 8, you go to Higsby's shop and you'll find Mail hiding behind the Number Man cutout. She'll challenge you, and defeating her will not give you a Roll chip, but instead a battle chip called Flower Petal V2. This too is false. This time, though, it seemed a little more believable, as Roll actually has an in-battle sprite, and she would first appear as a playable and fightable character in Battleship Challenge, and would later be an opponent in Battle Network 4. The Zero Battle is the most obscure to me, as I don't remember hearing about this one until I started combing old archived posts for info on the Roll and Glide battles. The trick to this is to obtain the first five stars on the tile screen, and have defeated the Omega Navvies. Go to where Serenade was in Secret Area 3, and step on the panel at the back of the platform. The Zero Alpha encounter supposedly happens in Dex's homepage, and the beta version is randomly encountered inside the Number Man cutout in Higsby's shop. After all of this, you can battle Zero Omega instead of Alpha at the end of the game. The first form of Zero supposedly had 1500 HP, while its Alpha form had 1900, Beta had 2400, and Omega had 3000. This was a hoax as well, but somewhat believable back then, since Network Transmission, which came out around the same time, featured Zero.exe, as well as Higsby's shop having a poster of Zero, and in Dex's house, there's a big Z on the welcome mat, referencing the Mega Man Zero title screen. And the fact that the North American instruction manual for BN3 showed Zero.exe, along with the other Network Transmission navvies, really didn't help matters. Again, none of these are real, but are fun rumors from back in the day. As we get further and further into the age of the internet, and we can record gameplay more easily now, rumors like these are getting harder and harder to fake, so people are a lot more skeptical. While I don't like spreading false information, I do appreciate these rumors inspiring the imagination of others, and getting people talking about these games even more. Battleship Gate I already touched on what the EXE 4 and 5 versions of the Battleship Gate do, but I didn't talk about the fire points of the one for EXE 6. The Beast Link Gate can be used to change the player's default navvy, or to have Mega Man in permanent Beast Out form. Certain battleships are Battleship Gate exclusive, and cannot be obtained in-game. Best of all, this does not require Operation Battle Mode, unless you control your navvy fully. This gate is also compatible with the Battleship Stadium Arcade game. In addition to that, in the Japanese version of Rockman Zero 3, slotting in the Meteor Red Sun or Blue Moon Ray battleships into a battleship gate that's plugged into the GBA will unlock some minigames where you can play as the Guardians from the Mega Man Zero series. In the English version, these are unlocked by other means. The battleship gate is also mentioned in Battle Network 5, even in the English version. The reference is on a flyer inside Higsby's shop. In the anime, the battleship gate allowed battleships to be used inside a dimensional area either as independent attacks or to provide weapons to a cross-fuse navvy. In the Beast Arc, the humans of Beyond Ard used terminals that were shaped like Beast Link gates to store their navvies instead of using PETs. Higsby is evil. Evil may be a bit of a stretch, but he does seem to value rare battle chips above all else. In the first game, and his first appearance in the anime, he's willing to put teachers and students in danger in order to get his hands on rare battle chips. He has stated verbatim that he would never part with a rare battle chip, saying that he'd rather sell his business than just give a rare chip away, even to a friend. During Battle Network 3, Higsby has Lan run several errands for him to get his shop back up and running, including trying to get some clients to pay for their purchases, which counts as child labor, and some of them get violent, releasing viruses at Mega Man, which counts as child endangerment. He even says, don't tell Miss Mari, who he not-so-secretly has a crush on. In Battle Network 4, he has Lan spread flyers around to promote his business. Again, child labor. In the manga, Higsby only appeared in the first two volumes, but he never really states what his motives for joining World 3 were but he does inform Lan of their imminent attack on the Metro Line, leading to Mega Man and Gutsman defeating Stone Man. So far, not really seeing anything that counts as outright evil. Just a little chip-obsessed and slightly less than scrupulous. Although, when we get the first Dark Chip in Battle Network 4, we take it to Higsby, and he seems to know a lot about it, and Merc Lan, knowing what happens to navvies who use Dark Chips. So, aside from just being an expert on Battle Chips, how does he know about these? Just what are you hiding, Higsby? Protocross in Battle Network 6 as far as I'm aware, this doesn't actually exist. It's just another rumor from various gaming forums. It is kind of strange that there isn't a Protocross when there's been a Proto Soul in the previous two games, and Proto Man is playable with a Game Shark or Battleship Gate. Maybe Proto Man was intended to be in Leak Navi in early drafts of the game? It wouldn't surprise me. 
There are some videos on YouTube where someone did a sprite hack to replace Mega Man with Protosoul Sprite, but again, it's just a hack, and not something that's actually in the final game. Mario References So, it turns out that the Mario reference I pointed out last time actually wasn't the one that Memer Deluxe was talking about. That one was supposed to be a poster in the Metro line in the first few games, where you see some weird figures wearing red and green, similar to Mario & Luigi. The reference that I made was to the red hat and overalls hanging in Yai's house in Battle Network 3 Blue version. Others have also pointed out some more potential references that I didn't consider, like the anime-exclusive Sledgehammer Brothers, or Crusher Military Brothers in Japan, who are twin hammer-wielding navvies, one red and one green. It's common knowledge that one of the Mario Bros. most iconic weapons is a hammer, so that could be a reference. Another possible Mario reference is Tensuke, who is Top Man's operator, who has a big mustache and wears reddish-orange clothes, and has a twin brother who wears green. But even if these are just coincidence, I found another definite reference in the stream arc of the anime. In Episode 16, these two brothers, named Harry and Mac, appear to be modeled after Wario and Waluigi, Harry being short and fat and wearing yellow, and Mac being tall and gangly, sporting purple attire. And of course, they both have mustaches, as well as white gloves and hats similar to the Mario Bros. Mac wearing purple could also be a reference to the mini-boss of the first level of Mega Man X3, who is a reploid with purple armor, also named Mac. Dangerous Mega Buster Toy so, apparently back in 2004, World Against Toys Causing Harm, also known as Watch, made a Most Dangerous Toys of 2004 list, and the NT Warrior Toy Mega Buster and Cyber Sword combo ended up on this list. Quote, Watch out! Children are encouraged to experience the futuristic world of cyber adventure with the Mega Buster Cannon and Cyber Sword. The rigid plastic blade extends approximately 9 and a quarter inches from the plastic sleeve, designed to slide onto a child's arm for combat. This was listed as hazardous for potential impact injuries, so they were afraid of kids hurting each other with the sword attachment. Yes, this blade right here. So rigid. So rigid that it's completely hollow and I can bend it. Watch out, this thing's so dangerous you could probably rob a cyberbank with this. Yeah, they're full of crap. Nobody's getting injured with this thing unless you stab someone right in the eye or down the throat. Also, I'd just like to point out that the site this is from, toysafety.org, it doesn't exist anymore. The screenshot that I use for reference is from the Wayback Machine. Get wrecked. Slur. We have another anime-exclusive character on our hands. Slur was one of the primary antagonists of the stream arc. Slur served as Duo's herald and would give asteroid navvies to humans, telling the operator to use them to fulfill their desires, testing to see if they were worthy of surviving Duo's judgment. Slur was an extremely formidable opponent, being able to tank three program advances at once without a scratch, as well as defeating both base and colonel rather effortlessly and mortally wounding the powerful Dark Mega Man. Slur's primary method of attacks were summoning wires, either to bind the opponent or to use them to redirect oncoming attacks, and sometimes turning them into swords for close quarters combat. At times, it appeared that Slur would act of their own volition, seemingly without Duo's instruction, as they were the one who destroyed a set of ruins that the Crestbearers were exploring. While Duo seemed to have a very just mindset, taking things in black and white, willing to give humans a fair shot at redemption, Slur seemed to have contempt for humanity, often setting them up for failure and sabotaging the efforts of our heroes. Slur was defeated and deleted by base during their rematch in the final episode of Stream. Trailers Beta Like the title says, there's a trailer that depicts a beta version of the game, which has some apparent changes from the final version. We can see some visual changes, like the PET icon being different, and some of the battleship icons have also changed, and the access portals for the different home pages all seem to have a swirling vortex on them. There's also a catchy remix of the Battle Network theme that I can't seem to find anywhere without the sound effects laid over it. I'll have a link in the description for this one as well, if you'd like to watch it in its entirety. This isn't on the video, but on some of the early promo material, there was an issue of Coral Coral Magazine that showed a dog named question mark question mark question mark question mark, meaning that the character of Gao might have played a part much sooner in the series than in the final product. I'm not sure what the role of the dog would have been, but it makes sense, considering that Land's home in ACDC Town always has a doghouse. Dr. Regal's Death Dr. Regal is one of the few humans we've actually watched die in multiple ways. During Battle Network 4, Regal attempted suicide by leaping from a tall platform, not wanting to be taken into custody by the officials. However, he returned to Battle Network 5. How he survived is never explained. At the end of the game, 10 years from his memory are erased, effectively killing the leader of the Dark Chip Syndicate, and Regal goes on to work at Scilab to help make the world a better place. In the anime and manga, however, he doesn't get such a happy ending. In the manga, after the battle with Nebula Grey, Dr. Regal is hiding out in a submarine far below the ocean surface. However, Base infiltrates the onboard computer and destroys the sub from the inside out. Given that explosion, I think it's safe to assume that Regal went to a watery grave. Regal dies a total of three different times during the anime. 
His first death was during a plane crash that only he and Miss Yuri survived, but they only survived because Duo spared them and turned them into his probes to observe humanity. Deciding to use the science he learned from Duo for evil purposes, Dr. Regal became a villain and created Dark Synchro Chips, becoming Cross Fusion Laser Man, who was deleted by Mega Man, and what was left of Regal was blasted into the Undernet. In the dub, they simply said that they couldn't find Dr. Regal after Laser Man was destroyed. From there, he was able to reform himself with a body that he could use to go between the real and cyber worlds, although he did seem to need a dimensional area. And finally, during the last episode of Stream, when Regal tried to use the power of Duo's Comet for himself, Duo interfered and rapidly aged Dr. Regal until there was nothing left of him but his skeleton. So yeah, it sucks to be Dr. Regal outside of the games. Mr. Famous's Wristband Remember that item that you could get from the Lotto Machine in Battle Network 3, Mr. Famous' wristband? That item that did absolutely nothing? Well, it turns out that there was a purpose for it. Rumors suggested that somehow it was tied to the Punk Battle Chip, claiming that if you had the wristband and deleted Punk with a busting level S, with Collect installed on your Navi Customizer, then you would get the chip. Well, they were right about it pertaining to the Punk Battle Chip, but not about obtaining it. The only way to obtain the Punk Battle Chip was either to cheat, go to a Capcom distribution event, or to play the updated Virtual Console version of the game. What the wristband actually does is power up the battle chip, as well as allow different command inputs to change what attack Punk will do. Mad Roller becomes Mad Wave Roller, where Punk will attack in a wave pattern instead of just circling around to hit the closest enemy. Pressing left and B will make Punk use shield and chain. If you use this battle chip while your Mega Buster is fully charged and are standing on the back row middle panel, then Punk will use Punk Chain. If you do the same thing and press down right, down right, Punk will use double go round. So yeah, mystery solved. Navis on Battleship Icons Throughout the Battle Network series, we see several battleships that feature navvies or characters as the mascot for the battleship, but we don't know who these navvies are. Some examples are Bronze, Silver, and Gold Fist, Zeus Hammer, and the Fighter Sword, Knight Sword, and Hero Sword chips. Firstly, who is Zeus.exe? Secondly, why does he use a hammer? I don't recall Zeus ever using a hammer in Greek mythology. I know that Thor from Norse Mythology uses a hammer, and both he and Zeus are gods of thunder, but the hammer doesn't have electric properties. Just another odd occurrence, I suppose. But what about Godstone and Oldwood? Godstone's attack animation is very similar to Stone Man's Navi chip in Battle Network 1, and Oldwood basically attacks with Wood Tower the way Woodman does. But both of these count as summonable battle chips, where you need to have a hole in front of you to activate them. An orb drops from the sky, and the entity manifests from the hole before attacking. The only other battle chip in the game to do this is Lava Dragon, which is a fightable virus in the game, so are the Godstone and Oldwood entities actually viruses that were in an earlier draft of the game but were cut before its final release? Another similar one is the Lance Battleship, but that one was retconned to be in the same family as the Side Bamboo Chips from Battle Network 4. Come to think of it, in-universe, why is Mega Man on so many battle chips? Is Mega Man well known enough to be the face of so many battle chips even outside the games? Other battle chips in the series like Guts Punch, Muramasa, Anubis, and several network transmission chips like Zero.exe, Z Saber, and Needle Cannon feature existing navvies, so I think this implies that the previously mentioned battle chips may be showing us viruses or navvies that exist in the lore, but we don't know anything about these characters. There is some fan art for the Goldfist navvy though, credit to Higure-san on DeviantArt. There is another mysterious battle chip icon character that appears outside the games, but we'll have to talk about them later. Deleting Humans Sometimes, we forget that we're dealing with actual net terrorists in these games. We get so caught up in our own battles that we forget that a lot of times, humans are operating the navvies that we're fighting. We have at least two instances where the failures of the enemy is not tolerated, and they are deleted as a result. In Battle Network 2, after Airman is deleted, Arashi is on the phone with Gospel Headquarters inside the Marine Harbor Metro line, and the briefcase in the corner of the room turns out to be a bomb. He's caught in the blast and not seen for the rest of the game. Although, an email later says that there are no reported injuries and only minor damage was done to the train station. In Battle Network 3, after Inukai failed to delete Mega Man a second time, Dr. Wily claims that he was deleted for his incompetence. This opened up a pulse transmission machine for Land to use during the final battle against Alpha. During Battle Network 6, when the former World 3 members decide to betray Wily, an army of navvies and copybots tried to attack them, screaming delete the entire time, but they were destroyed by Land's friends' navvies, also using copybots. As for whether or not Arashi and Inukai are actually dead, I'm not sure. Both of them appeared in Battleship Challenge, but the canon of that game is very questionable. Base Cross Just adding a little info for this one. In the manga, Dark Mega Man absorbed base while he was comatose. This leads to a half-formed Dark Base Cross, where Dark Mega Man can use some of Base's powers, like the Gospel Cannon. However, Base's soul begins to fight back and manages to expel itself from Dark Mega Man, creating an opening for Mega Man and Proto Man to counterattack. When the proper Base Cross happens during the battle with Nebula Grey, Base Cross Mega Man is so powerful that Nebula's ultimate weapon is mere child's play for this new combination. However, the sheer amount of power can't be contained within Mega Man's body and it starts to fall apart. 
It is also worth noting that this iteration of Base Cross was created by Base absorbing Mega Man with his Get Ability program as Mega Man was dying, but Base wanted to be the one to kill Mega Man personally, and this activated the Double Soul at the same time. But instead of the Soul Navi being left in a near deletion state as they feed power to Mega Man, this is a true fusion of Base and Mega Man's consciousness, along the lines of a DBZ style fusion. Base Cross also appeared in a bonus chapter of the manga called The Legendary Berserker, in which an enemy called the Devil Virus was threatening the cyber world. Despite all the strongest navvies fighting against it, they stood no chance, but Base Cross was able to destroy this enemy in one strike. In the movie, Base and Mega Man were both being absorbed by Nebula Grey, and Base tries to take Mega Man's ultimate program to gain more power. However, it backfires, and instead of Base just getting stronger, Base and Mega Man fuse together into Base Cross, which effortlessly dispatches Nebula Grey. After the battle, they collapse from exhaustion, and the fusion breaks, with Base disappearing into a black hole and Mega Man logging out. Land's Descendant in Star Force 4 while Mega Man Star Force 4 was cancelled and will likely never be revived, some of the few pieces of info we could find on this development suggest that one of Land's descendants would have appeared in Star Force 4. His name was apparently Kazuma, and he and Geo Stellar would have become outlaw hackers, wanted by the Satella police and fetching a bounty of 8 million zenny. Aside from that, not much else is known about Kazuma or Star Force 4. Liberation Warp Glitch in early releases of the Japanese version of Brockman EXE 5, there was a bug that can act as a wrong warp and put you in a location you're not supposed to be. If your max HP was a specific value, and then you enter and exit a liberation mission, you will be warped somewhere else. Some of the wrong warps are harmless, just putting you in inaccessible areas, while others are more damaging. With certain values, when you jack out, Mega Man is no longer in the PET, so you can't jack in. This softlocks the game and you have to reset. There's a list of buggy values on the Rockman EXE zone, as you can see here. The glitch only exists in the Japanese GBA version of Rockman EXE 5, and was fixed for the Virtual Console release. Additionally, there's one glitch discovered by Hero Ron, where the game softlocks on completion if you don't save at all, with the game freezing during the final cinematic. The glitch does work in the English version. Video Man is Analog Video Man is a competitor in the theme park tournament in Battle Network 4. His operator, Vidi Narsi, states on more than one occasion that Video Man shoots all of his footage in analog rather than digital. This very idea just makes no sense on paper, since navvies are entirely digital, as they are literally made of zeros and ones. I should state that Video Man trying to convert from analog to digital, as well as his operator's ambiguous gender identity, are both meant to be metaphorical, mirroring the analog phase-out that took place around the turn of the century. However, it seemed that the writers of the anime decided to take this line literally. Video Man is not only analog, but he seems proud of this fact, gloating about how his tape is very useful in combat, and saying that a DVD wouldn't be as effective. Interestingly, he seems to be able to hijack film reels used in the movie theaters, and use VHS tapes infused with copies of Mega Man to wreak havoc in the real world by damaging TVs and monitors and such. More than that, in both Access and Stream, we see that Land uses different methods to disrupt the playback copies that Video Man uses, like magnetism and moisture. So yeah, Video Man is analog, and being a cyber being composed entirely of zeros and ones, this makes absolutely no sense. But that does make me wonder, what would a digital Video Man look like, and how would his abilities differ? Navi's Bleed Last time, I stated that there was only one particular source I could find about Navi's bleeding, and that was the Mega Man NT Warrior manga. But it turns out, there are other instances. Thanks to NetNaviFan2 for pointing this one out to me. In the Japanese version of the anime, during Magnet Man's fight with Elect Man and Mega Man, Mega Man punches Magnet Man in the stomach and he coughs up a dark fluid. It doesn't look like vomit, so it could be taken as blood. The scene was removed in the dub version. In the fan-translated version of Rockman EXE 4.5, when you encounter Base in the Chaos area, just before the battle starts, he says, I will bathe in your blood. If anybody would know whether or not navvies have blood, it would be Base. So, case closed. Navvies bleed. EXE characters in Gigamix There's a manga for classic series Mega Man called Megamix, and its later chapters are called Gigamix. During these chapters, several Battle Network characters make cameos, including Shod, Speedy Dave, Princess Pride, Mr. Match, Ring's operator Mary, Aquaman's operator Shuko, and Sparkman's operator Terry. Later on, we also see Dingo, Raul, Chilski, and Rika, and several normal navvies and security navvies make cameos as guard robots, along with some Reaver bots from the Legends series. Maybe Battle Network and Legends are on the same point in the timeline after all? Nah, probably not. It's just a really cool cameo. Battle Story Rockman EXE Another manga that roughly follows the story of the Mega Man Battle Network games. The art style is, in my opinion, a little more cutesy than Takamasaki's art style. The proportions are off just a little bit. Characters have big heads and big eyes. The action looks pretty good, and I like that we see the Gundel Soul making an appearance. 
The story only runs up to the beginning of the Battle Network 4 arc, ending with Mega Man about to challenge Laser Man. Currently, I can't read the story from this one since there's no English version. The manga only exists in Japanese and French. I did recently buy all four of the French volumes, and plan to do a full review of this manga after I use Google Translate to decipher the story. I should also state that there was a re-release of this manga, Japanese only, and it adds some more chapters that don't seem to be canon to the main story, but seem to take direct influence from the anime and games. Dr. Regal knocks out Lan and his friends with sleeping gas and kidnaps his father, just like in the game, and it seems that the manga chooses the Team Proto Man route. During the battle with Nebula Grey, Base and Mega Man once again merge to form Base Cross and defeat Dark Mega Man while they're at it. And they have some extended Operation Shooting Star chapters that show not only Geo and Sonya in the past, but also now Luna. No, that's bad! You're gonna alter history too much by doing this. Doc. Doc is a side character in Battle Network 2 that shows up toward the end of the game. During the Freeze Man scenario, large chunks of ice are causing mayhem all over the internet, thus causing negative effects on the real world, and the various colors of ice can only be destroyed by using a vaccine program. When Mega Man needs one made, he's told to look for the Doc. After learning the keyword to call for Doc, which happens to be World 3, Mega Man meets him in Undersquare. Despite hanging around the Undernet, Doc takes the form of an official Navi, and is generally pretty good-natured. Doc helps Mega Man by making a vaccine for him, which makes traveling around the cyber world easier until Mega Man defeats Freeze Man, which causes all the ice to disappear. So, I have a few questions. Why does Doc look like a police Navi if he spends all of his time in the Undernet? Why is his call sign World 3? If he is a former World 3 member, then why does he help Mega Man fight against Gospel when Gospel is being controlled by Dr. Wily, the mastermind behind World 3? These questions go unanswered because, as far as we know, Doc never appears again. Before revisiting the series while making this iceberg, I always thought that he was in Battle Network 3, as there are two navvies who have the same sprite as him that I could see being Doc in this narrative. The first one is the orange navvy that stalks Mega Man throughout the Undernet, and then saves Mega Man from base during the Flame Man scenario. He knows who base is, and apparently has some dark powers, as he can summon Dark Aura at will. This is more than likely actually Dr. Cossack's navvy, though I don't recall us ever getting a confirmation of this. The second one is an official Navi who gives you the job request, help with rehab, and he rewards you with the World 3 pin, letting you access certain gates that you couldn't before. You can see the correlation here. As much as I want these to be canon, Doc's manner of speaking is just too different for them to be the same person, and we'll just have to add him to the growing list of oddities from Battle Network 2. Shade Soul Another phony rumor from back in the day. With the introduction of Double Soul in Battle Network 4, as well as the unused Forte Soul and Duo Soul, some rumors were spread around about other souls that Mega Man could possibly obtain. One such was Shade Soul, and this description is as follows. Use Dark Chips and allow Dark Soul to activate, which I'm guessing means let your HP drop below 1. Repeat this 3-5 times, and then keep doing this. You will then see that Mega Man's icon in the Emotion Window has started growing fangs. You must also have already unlocked all 6 Double Souls, and have defeated Base, and have the 5 Evil Chips. Needless to say, this one is complete bogus. I've only been able to find one source that archived this rumor, which is the Wayback Machine's archive of game winners, but I remember seeing it flowing around on several sites back in the day. Like with the roll and glide battles, because we have the internet to fact check these claims now, these kinds of rumors are becoming more and more rare, and gaming websites are holding submissions to a higher standard. Not gonna lie, I do wish that we could see Mega Man with a Dark Lloyd Double Soul. The manga does give us something of a halfway formed laser soul for Dark Mega Man, though. Alpha is the D-Reaper. We've talked about this on the channel before, but any fan of Digimon Tamers would notice some striking similarities between Alpha, the final boss of Battle Network 3, and the D-Reaper, the final antagonist of the third Digimon series. Both grew and evolved beyond the control of their creators, overstepping their original programming, becoming a global threat, both take the forms of giant red goo monsters that destroy or absorb everything it touches, its final form is a monolithic shape with a single eye and strange fins on the side of its head, and the main heroes, human and digital, have to merge together to defeat it. To use one of Donut's quotes from Red vs. Blue, There's coincidence, and then there's outright plagiarism! I'm gonna have to sue somebody. I've noticed some other similarities between Rockman EXE and Digimon, but I think that that deserves its own video. A lot of times you could say something's coincidence, but you'd be hard-pressed to defend the case that Alpha didn't blatantly copy the D-Reaper. Mama Zap is dead. In the anime episode, Don't Mess With Mama Zap, Count Zap returns to his old family home, following the defeat of World 3 during the Pharaoh Man incident. Upon arriving, Count Zap's mother berates him for his failure, leading the Count to sabotage the bus that Lan was riding on, ensuring that it would break down outside the mansion. He then impersonates his mother and challenges Lan and Mega Man to another net battle, this time with the Zap family tradition of shooting electricity through the operators as their navvies receive damage. Mama Zap watches the entire scheme unfold, but it appears that Lan can't see her. After Count Zap is defeated, he wakes up, thinking it was all a dream, and states that his mother passed away ten years prior. The mansion also appeared to be in complete ruins, implying that it was all in his head. 
However, Mega Man states that he heard a woman's voice cheering for Count Zap during the fight. So the best conclusion I can draw is that Mama Zap is a ghost who creates illusions, like the whole mansion being rebuilt from the rubble. Muramasa Muramasa is a battle chip that can be found in every Battle Network game, including the Battle Chip Challenge and Network Transmission spin-offs, as well as the Mega Man Star Force series. Muramasa is the personal sword of Shadowman.exe, and in Battle Networks 1 and 2, you obtain the sword from him. For the rest of the series, starting with Battle Network 3, the sword is still obtainable, yet the chip icon removes Shadow Man from the artwork, and he is replaced with a spooky-looking purple aura. In the Japanese versions of the game, this variant is known as the Muramasa Blade, instead of just Muramasa. No matter the incarnation, however, it converts damage into attack power. You lose 500 HP, you deal 500 damage. So, why is this interesting? I think it's worth discussing, since in Battle Network 4 and 5, the Muramasa Blade is an evil chip, meaning that Mega Man can only use it if his karma is at an evil state. It is also one of the five evil chips needed to access Black Earth in Battle Network 4. Even so, in Battle Network 5 Team Colonel, Shadow Man still has the weapon and calls it by name during the story. So, this begs the question, does the chip originally belong to him? Is the Muramasa some supernatural sword that can exist outside of Shadow Man's code? Why can he use it if he's not a Dark Soul Navi? Or is he a Dark Soul Navi? We did see that in the Access arc of the anime he used Dark Chips. Or are the Muramasa and Muramasa Blade two distinct weapons? In Rockman EXE 4.5, because Shadow Man doesn't have a battle chip, defeating him yields the Muramasa Blade instead. In the Mega Man NT Warrior manga, the Muramasa Sword is given to Proto Man by Serenade, and it contains anti-dark properties, as well as giving Proto Man a new style change, the Muramasa style. It is also a usable battle chip. In the final bonus chapter, showing Mega Man and Proto Man having a rematch in which they both display power far greater than anything we've ever seen, Proto Man has the Muramasa reforged by some legendary blacksmith in the Cyber World, and the Muramasa can then split into three separate blades. I get that the game and manga follow different rules and canons, but it's still a strange occurrence that I think is worth discussing. In the same manga, we do see that Shadow Man still has a sword, but he never calls it by name. In the anime, Muramasa just seems to be a standard battle chip that anybody can use, and Shadow Man's swords are just called the Shadow Blade, at least when he's in cross-fusion mode. Battle Network 3 Secret Ending During the post credit scene of Battle Network 3, we see someone asking where they are and if they are alive, only to be answered by a growling noise. The rest of the post credit scene shows us that Dr. Ikari found the remnants of Mega Man inside Alpha's ruins, rebuilt him, and then put him back inside Land's PET. This isn't really a secret ending, as this happens every time you beat the game. In the second half of the series, beating the final boss after collecting every emblem will grant you a special screen or sequence, but that's not the case here. What makes it secret is what is actually happening here. It's heavily implied that the one speaking is base, and the growling entity is either the bug frag trader, as it growls when interacted with, or possibly an incomplete multi-bug organism similar to Gospel. This is revealed when you encounter base GS in the post-game, which is triggered by feeding 300 bug frags into the bug frag trader, and then leaving the cyber world, and then returning. This could be meant to imply that the post-game of BN3 is actually canon, unlike the other games where it's kind of ambiguous. This would make sense, because originally, Battle Network 3 was meant to be the last entry in the series. Rockman EXE was originally a horror game. According to the developers, the original draft of Rockman EXE was intended to be a horror game combined with an, at the time, trendy card battle mechanic. The original design reportedly featured a device that you would put on your finger that would measure your heart rate and connect to the Game Boy Advance in some sort of way in an attempt to make a game you can enjoy while your heart pounds. The developers even visited a haunted house to gain some inspiration, but not much else has been revealed about the original concept. The card battle system became battle chips, but the horror game concept seems to have been almost completely lost over time. We do see some spooky elements in the Battle Network series, like recurring supernatural instances, such as ghosts, possession, digitized human souls, and evil spirits. I can't help but wonder what a horror-themed EXE game would have been like. I also think that the device that connects to the GBA would have been similar to the cable used to plug the Game Boy Advance into a GameCube, being inserted through the link cable slot on the top of the system, but that's just speculation. Navis in the Real World There are several instances throughout most Battle Network media that depicts Navis in the real world in one way or another. In the games, most of the time, it's a person in a costume, like these instances in Battle Networks 3 and 4. In Battle Network 6, Navis can of course be brought into the real world with a copybot, but there are some unexplained instances of Navis appearing in the real world. In the end credits of Battle Network 1, we see Mega Man materialize in Land's room. This one is likely just meant to be a visual metaphor about how Land and Mega Man are closer now, with the revelation about Hub. In Battle Network 2, there's a Mr. Prog hiding behind this terminal in the mother computer area of Scilab. In Battle Network 3, you can see this cloaked undernet Navi hiding behind the Tree of Life in the hospital basement. If you wait long enough, you can see him leave his hiding place. Talking to him will earn you the Poltergeist chip. He doesn't leave afterwards, by the way. He stays there. 
We also have the Mr. Prog and Tab Shop in Battle Network 6, but this could just be due to a copy bot. These instances aren't given an explanation, and may just be for humor, since they don't seem to impact the story in any way. In the manga, during Volume 6, a dark energy field has covered the Earth, which caused a distortion in reality, resulting in several navvies and viruses being able to manifest in the real world. After base GS was defeated and Alpha was destroyed, the dark field dissipated and the cyber beings returned home. Later, at the end of the manga, when the Psy Beasts merged together, their sheer power output caused a distortion that brought them, as well as Mega Man and Base, into the real world. In the most recent EXE manga, Forte Time of Reunion, they appear to be talking about a technology that will bring navvies into the real world, but I can't read this because it's currently only in Japanese, so I can't provide any further details. In the anime, there are a few instances of programs appearing in the material world as well. The program Rush and a giant cat virus are said to use something of a solid hologram to project their avatars. Navis and viruses can manifest inside a dimensional area, and this is where cross-fusion is performed. Rush was transformed into a synchro chip, which allowed Shade Man to manifest in the human world without a dimensional area, and during stream, asteroid navvies could appear if their operator slotted in a dimensional chip. So, the laws of the universe mean nothing, and navvies can appear where they're not supposed to, in various circumstances. Rockman EXE Wonderswan A platformer game for the Wonderswan color. It seems we've come full circle with this one. Rockman EXE Wonderswan actually loosely follows the story events from the anime adaptation. The gameplay reflects some of the elements of both classic Mega Man and Network Transmission, in that it has platforming, pitfalls, and sliding, as well as battle chips. This one was a Japanese exclusive, but there is an English ROM hack, and I would love to see it re-released sometime in the future. Full Metal Alchemist reference. In episode 44 of Rock Band EXE Stream, when the gang starts exploring a haunted house, we can see a suit of armor that looks similar to the armor used for Alphonse's body in Full Metal Alchemist. It's similar in design, especially around the shoulders and the top of the chest plate, but the helmet is different. I'm not sure if this was an intentional reference or just a coincidence. Cybeast Cult. This one is something that definitely needs further expanding upon, but in Battle Network 6, you encounter a group of undernet dwelling navvies who worship the Psy Beasts, as well as statues and monuments to the beasts throughout the cyber world. At different parts of the game, they appear to make trouble for Land and Mega Man, using chanting to awaken the beast within Mega Man and causing him to go on a rampage. This group is only briefly used in the story, but not really in the postgame. I wish they had more elaboration, like, when were they formed? Where's their headquarters? Are they tied to the evil spirits that get summoned by the Psy Beasts? And so on. Just another ID to add to the list of unanswered questions from the EXE series, but I bet that they were really mad when we deleted their idols. EXE Sprite in Star Force 2 So the crossovers between Star Force and Battle Network are pretty well documented at this point, but maybe they were intended to be even greater. There's an unused sprite of Mega Man.exe in Star Force 2, but it's not the same one from the previous game. This sprite seems to be updated. This would seem to imply that at some point, the Battle Network Easter Egg would have gone a bit further, with Geo and Mega Man.exe having another interaction instead of just finding Land's diary entries. But sadly, it was cut, and we didn't get to see Mega Man.exe again. Net navvies are made from DNA. At the end of Battle Network 1, Dr. Ikari states that he's been experimenting on creating a new generation of navvy using DNA from humans. He says that the purpose for this was to allow for greater synergy and understanding between navvies and humans, basically giving navvies a soul of their own. Even these stock normal navvies say that Dr. Ikari gave them greater emotions, praising him for doing so. The closest Dr. Ikari could get was to make a navvy's DNA 95% the same as their operators. This line of study led to the creation of Mega Man, allowing Hub to be reborn after his death. Mega Man is described as a new generation of navvy, sharing 99.9% .9 of the same DNA as Lan, until Hub.Bat was used. While this part doesn't sound too strange at first, since we're always playing as Lan and Mega Man, the odd part is when you think about every other custom navvy with a soul. How does that work across the rest of the Battle Network universe? Does this mean that every operator injects their own DNA into the Navi to make a stronger bond? What about operators who have more than one Navi? This whole, Navis are made from DNA to make them more human line started out as a deus ex machina, but ultimately leads to some plot holes or some story elements that need better explanation. It's kind of like how in the classic timeline, Mega Man X supposedly is the first robot with free will, but that directly and blatantly contradicts the rest of the classic series lore. Net navvies are dead. We already talked about the graveyard area and all the gravestones that have the names for every navvy in the series, so does this mean that every navvy really is dead? Several recurring characters have been deleted at one point and revived using backup data or dark power. I should also state that this point and the previous one were sourced from a separate iceberg that was in Spanish, and the original version of this entry stated NT navvies are dead, or made from DNA. I'm not sure if this meant network transmission navvies or is just an abbreviation or typo of net navvies. Maybe all current navvies are digitized DNA from a deceased human. I guess we can add Halo's AIs to the list of things the Battle Network has ripped off in that case. PETs in Dump 
In Mega Man Star Force, if you visit the dump in Dream Island, you can find a giant pile of Battle Network 6 style PETs in the area labeled Scrapyard 1. Examining the pile will give you the text Old School Communication Terminals. Before transers, almost everyone had one. This makes sense, given that the game takes place 200 years after the Battle Network series, and technology has progressed even further. It is kind of sad to see that 200 year old trash still hasn't been properly disposed of, though. This also raises the question as to whether or not the Link PET-EX was the final model of PET, considering that after Battle Network 2, a new PET was introduced in every game, and each game only takes place a few months apart from each other. So, did they just jump straight from this PET to Transers? Oddly, there's no Cyber World or Wave World inside this pile to explore. This area is also where you encounter the ghost of Corone the 14th, who can wave change into Crown Thunder. I don't think he has a direct connection to the pile of PETs, but why of all places is he stationed right in front of it? Mega Man Buster and Blade In the early drafts of Rockman EXE, the game was originally planned to have three separate versions. According to the Mega Man Battle Network Complete Works, the temporary names for these versions were Version A, which stood for Anime, where the main characters would have been Lan Hikari and Mega Man.exe, Version B, where the main characters were Samai Kazumi and Mega Man Buster, and Version C, with Roto Kazumi and Mega Man Blade. Samai and Roto were meant to be twins, and each different version would focus on the perspective of each character. Version B and C were planned for simultaneous release before version A, and version A would be released alongside the anime. I imagine that it would be similar to Digimon World's Dawn and Dusk for the Nintendo DS, which has the same basic story, but different main heroes and other version differences. One other notable character that didn't make the cut for the final game is Mike Keenan, who apparently was a net bounty hunter of sorts. His original role was to be the operator of Roll.exe, before giving Roll to Mail and then taking control of base. This original concept sounds very interesting and lets us get a glimpse of the early ideas and ambitions, like the fact that the anime was already being planned before the game was even released, and that version A was apparently based on the anime script. This concept was sort of reworked into Rock Band EXE Wonderswan, which loosely follows the events of the anime. One concept I really wish they had stuck with is the part where it says, we won't make it so that you have to purchase all of the versions to acquire every chip. They broke that promise starting with Battle Network 2, where you originally needed two copies of the game to obtain every battle chip in order to 100% complete the game, because some battle chips were only obtainable through PvP, and this persisted throughout the rest of the series. Phantom and Legend of the Network These are two Japanese-exclusive Rockman EXE mobile games. If I'm not mistaken, Phantom of the Network takes place between Battle Network 4 and 5, while Legend of the Network seems to take place between Battle Network 5 and 6. However, as far as I'm aware, both of these games are considered guidance, meaning that neither one is actually canon to the main story of the series. Both games introduce some new characters, including Hatman and Jamming Man in Phantom, as well as Nobody, Sherry's, and Rideman in Legend. While Phantom seems to take the pretty standard story setup used in most of the earlier games, Legend takes a bit of a different approach, having Nobody and Sharice be from the ancient Atlampian civilization. This plays into the previously mentioned idea of hyper-advanced prehistoric civilizations, and we would see a similar idea revisited in Mega Man Star Force 2. Phantom of the Network had an expansion called Battler's Tower. Both of these games were only available through certain Japanese dumb phones, but the services have been discontinued. There was a fan attempt to remake Phantom of the Network, but Capcom had them shut down. Currently, there is another preservation project in the works trying to dump both of these games and translate them to make them accessible to the public. Here's hoping that the project will be a success. Because the Rockman EXE anime ended before it could adapt to the elements of Legend of the Network, none of the characters from the second mobile game made an appearance in the anime. The Cyber World Supernatural Properties I wasn't exactly sure how to phrase this one, since it's sort of multi-layered here. But, as the Cyber World continued to grow and evolve, it's become more and more linked with the human world. Humans can send their consciousness into the Cyber World, and navvies can come into the real world. And certain human-like characters can cross dimensions and enter the Cyber World completely. But the main focal point that I want to have here is more so related to the digitizing of human souls, and how the Cyber World may be tied to the human afterlife. We already discussed how Hub's soul became Mega Man, and how Dark Chips are digitized evil souls, but in Battle Network 4, we have another supernatural instance. In the Den Tournament, in both versions of the game, Lan faces off against a girl named Yuko. She is a grade schooler who Lan plays with before their battle in the tournament. Later, Yuko's father approaches Lan, telling him that Yuko has the ability to summon Cyber Ghosts, and Mega Man has to go throughout the internet and lay the Ghost Navvies to rest with the Cyber Sutra. After the battle in the Den Tournament, Yuko reveals that she herself is also a ghost, and now she can be at rest. She departs for the afterlife, leaving her Navi behind. I can only guess that her father started caring for the Navi afterward, but that's not important. So we have at least three confirmed instances of human souls affecting the cyber world in one way or another. This is something that's kind of spooky and pretty cool. In the manga, we also get the implication that the dark power that taints Navis can also have the same effect on the Operator, leading to the corruption of their soul as well. 
This is also reflected in the anime when Miss Yuri used a dark chip on Prism Man, which Prism Man then sent to his operator via the hospital equipment, implanting him with dark power again. And then we also have the evil spirits from Battle Network 6, which, unless they're basically just some strange super virus, they're just kind of weird and are out of place in Battle Network 6, seemingly more in line with Battle Network 4 or 5. Bottom line, the cyber world is more than just the internet in the Battle Network world. It seems to be something of a bridge between the human world and possibly the afterlife, since we see the human souls can directly interact with cyberspace. Onimusha Blade Warriors The Onimusha series is a string of games released by Capcom, featuring several figures from Japanese history and folklore, like Oda Nobunaga, Miyamoto Musashi, and Kojiro Sasaki. In the PS2 game Onimusha Blade Warriors, Mega Man.exe, accompanied by Lan, are a playable character. They are unlocked simply by being in the story mode as Samanosuke Akechi. Mega Man has access to the ground style and bug style, as well as a few different sword type weapons from the EXE series, including Paladin Sword and the Muramasa Blade. He's also the only one to have a 2D character portrait. It appears to be based on the cover art for Battle Network 3. Zero from the Mega Man Zero series is also unlockable using Mega Man.exe. These two are incredibly out of place, but are likely in the game since these two were the running Mega Man series at the time. Out of every cameo that Mega Man has made in various fighting and crossover games, I think this is the strangest one, except for maybe bad box art Mega Man appearing in Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Hidden Zenny in ACDC School As part of the legendary tomes side quest in Battle Network 3, you're tasked with collecting three different tomes and returning them to a ghost navi who is hanging out in the Hades Isle cyber world. After collecting all of the tomes, if you don't immediately return them, but instead go to the teacher's lounge in ACDC school and examine the small statue, Mega Man will notice that it bears the same markings as the tomes, and you'll find a whopping 300,000 zenny inside the statue. So many questions, so little time. Why is that much zenny being kept inside the small statue? Why is it in a school? What connection does this statue, and possibly the school, have to that ghost navi and these tomes? Although, after seeing how the schools in the Battle Network series love to hire X-World 3 members and the fact that the hidden metro line that leads right to the World 3 base is hidden underneath ACDC school, nothing should surprise me at this point. Arcade Games In addition to all the Japanese exclusive spin-off games, we also have three arcade games to bear the Rockman EXE name. The first one is called Character Metal Series Rockman EXE. This footage from Alicia Pixels shows some gameplay. It looks like a board game with some mini-games, but I can't read Japanese, so I'm not really sure what's going on. The second one is called The Metal Operation, and it looks like another board game, this time using assets and sprites from the Game Boy Advance games, and having the theme of Battle Network 5. The main goal is to defeat Nebula Grey. Again, I'm not sure how the combat system works. The third one, and most easy to understand, is Battleship Stadium, which plays similarly to a turn-based RPG game. You fight using battle chips for the Link PET toy game, and though inspired by Battle Network 6, this arcade features some characters that didn't appear in the game, like Dark Proto Man and Falls Our Beast Base. Credit to Emmanuel EXE for the footage of this and the metal operation. Original PET Design When someone says Original PET from the Battle Network series, most people think of this, the flip-open handheld from the first two games, and the early volumes of the manga. But in this regard, we're actually talking about the early concept art, where the PET looks much bigger. The concept art depicts a laptop-sized PET being used to net battle, as well as battle chips that are roughly the size of playing cards. I'm not sure if the laptops are the PETs themselves, or if they are simply carried around to be used as a terminal, and you would plug your PET into the laptop, and the navvies would battle from there. Either way, it's neat to see how concept art and designs have changed over time. On another note, in the Mega Man NT Warrior manga, we see that Mesa has quite a unique-looking PET. Given the context clues from the manga, where a flashback chapter shows Lan with his PET saying that it's the newest model, and in the anime where Mesa seems to be a bit behind the times, I think it's meant to imply that he's using a very old model PET. Dark License slash Memory in Battle Network 4 Dark License was a Navi customizer program in Battle Network 3 that allowed the players to use dark gigachips without needing to open a dark hole. When Dark Chips showed up in Battle Network 4, this time with different mechanics and consequences for usage, there was a rumor about Dark License returning, this time with the function of allowing Mega Man to use Dark Chips without losing any of his HP. This Navi customizer part was alternatively called Dark Memory. This NCP was apparently either an event exclusive or only accessible via an e-reader card. So far, I can't find any solid evidence on whether or not this program actually existed, or if perhaps it itself was an effect of an e-reader mod card. The person who apparently knew the most about Dark Memory was a member of the game FAQ forums who goes by Nigoli, who mentioned the program in a blog post showing off his e-reader cards. In preparation for this video, I actually reached out to Nigoli, asking about the source of the rumor, and he said that it seems to be due to a miscommunication or faulty info. 
The original source for the rumor seemed to be a website called Planet Mega Man, who posted scans from Coral Coral Magazine, and they might have gotten some of the details wrong, as they have messed up some information in other times as well. However, he swears that he remembers seeing some info on Dark Memory before, but after years of research, he can't seem to find the original source of the rumor or evidence that it ever existed, so this may be an instance of the Mandela Effect. Part of me wants to believe that Dark Memory may be real, however, given just how many people seem to recall it existing at one point or another. Even as recent as 2016, I've seen people talking about this program as if it was real. One user on the Rockman EXE Zone forums was requesting a ROM hack of Battle Network 4 where they could use Dark Chips with no consequences, and they say that they could use Dark License, but think that it's impractical because it supposedly takes up the entire 5x5 Navi Customizer grid. On top of that, another user commented on the same thread, chastising the OP for wanting to use Dark Chips in the first place, and says that not caring enough to use Dark License is just sad. Again, these posts were from 2016. Unlike other rumors in this chart that have been thoroughly debunked, I would like to think that maybe Dark Memory has some truth to it. Since Gregomaster was able to find that Z-Saber Lotto code, maybe he can also find the code for Dark Memory as well? The Cyber World is a simulated universe. Even though most of the time, the cyber world and net society are talked about as though they are merely web domains or collections of data, at least in technical terms, when you look at the build of the cyber world, it's clear that that isn't the case. Why do things like water, ice, fire, and plants exist in the cyber world? Why do navvies have things like cyber tea and coffee? Why would they need accessory chips for clothing or vehicles? If everything was just inside a computer, like the description implies, then there's no need for any of this. Virus busting shouldn't be combat carried out using weapons, it should just be some antivirus software. And again, how can someone who is made out of zeros and ones not be digital? The only logical answer here is that the cyber world is a simulated universe, which humanity is attempting to make more and more like their own, or shape it to their own desires. Or alternatively, maybe the cyber world has always existed, but was inaccessible, and when humans built the current version of Net Society, they opened a gateway, or otherwise gave it a means to manifest. If we're taking Legend of the Network, the anime, and manga as canon, then we have ancient civilizations with advanced technology that became lost over time, until the modern iteration of the cyber world. In simplest terms, I think Digimon's digital world is a good comparison. While the gateways to the digital world are computers, the world exists as its own separate entity, similar to our own, but also different. This is one of those instances where you have to just suspend disbelief and ignore the technicals and just enjoy the world build and story setup. Otherwise, we cannot justify Video Man being analog. No, I still haven't let that go. Anime Alternate English Dub We all know about Mega Man NT Warrior, but there was a second, more faithful English dub for Rockman EXE aired in Southeast Asian countries. This dub was apparently very accurate to the Japanese version, with no censorship and all the names being kept the same. The series has reportedly been found and posted to Telegram. Midnight made a post about some of the VCDs on Twitter, and I'll link those in the description. Copy Man Copy Man is a boss from Battle Network 3 and holds the number 3 slot in the Undernet rankings. He apparently has the ability to copy the form of any Navi he sees, and when Mega Man battles him, Copy Man takes the form and abilities of Gutsman, who just returned from Netopia after a long stretch of training. But we never see him again after this, and never learn his true form. This is one of the best ideas in the Battle Network series, but it's not developed at all. Copy Man could have been an overarching villain. Where did he come from? How did he get these powers? What is his true form? We'll likely never know the answer. But there does exist a fan-made sprite of a Copy Cross Mega Man that shows an interpretation of what it would have looked like if Copy Man was a Link Navi for Mega Man. The design takes influence from the Copybots from Battle Network 6. Credit to Availation for the design. I would love to see a continuation of Battle Network 3's Undernet ranking system with Serenade and Copy Man making a return. Speaking of Serenade, I think it might be possible that Copy Man was one of Serenade's underlings, not only because he had an Undernet rank, but also because the navvies in the secret area that give you the Serenade time trials also can copy the form of other navvies. Maybe Copy Man used to be one of them? I've heard it suggested that perhaps the navvy on the Navi Recycle chip is Copy Man's base appearance, since the Navi Recycle effectively copies the navvy you last used and brings them back. While we've discussed unidentified navvies on some pre-existing battle chips, doesn't it seem kind of weird that for this chip specifically, they create a unique piece of art for a nameless character, when this chip only summons characters that have unique identities? Other battle chips like Balance, Marking, and Counter all feature navvies who have unique designs, and several chips like the Anti-Series, North Wind, and Coming and Going Roads feature generic navvies. But again, the designs already exist. So, going by our line of thought from earlier, if these unidentified navvies on these chips are unnamed characters, then maybe this unnamed navvy is actually Copy Man? 
There is a reference to Copy Man in the anime as well. In the episode Chisau's in Town, Noodle Man, the navvy that belongs to the Udon shop owner, shapeshifts himself to look like Guts Man and takes the name Nuggets Man, or Cuts Man in the Japanese version. Cuts Man's the name! Oh god, no! Time paradoxes. Anytime that a story messes with time travel, there are always some form of inconsistencies or paradoxes. We have at least two separate times when the EXE series has used time travel, once in the stream arc of the anime, and another in the game Operation Shooting Star. In stream, things seem to mostly be unaltered by the time travel done by Beryl and Colonel, leading to the idea that the entire thing could be a causality loop, which means that the attempts to change the future end up causing the future that was trying to be changed. There are a few inconsistencies, though, namely Beryl. We see that present-day Beryl died of old age, and we see his funeral. And yet, at the end of the season, we see him delivering a message in real time to Lan and the other bearers of Duo's Crest, and he's still alive. They also state that only Data can travel through the past tunnel, which is why Colonel could help Lan and Mega Man, but Beryl couldn't until he had himself digitized, using the device that Dr. Regal was using to digitize the Earth in the events of the movie. And yet, in that same movie, we see Beryl jump through a space-time distortion to end up in present day instead of the past. While he doesn't leave Regal's base with Lan and stays behind, I don't think we ever actually watch him return to the past. I guess it's implied that he jumped through another distortion, but we don't watch it happen. Additionally, during the movie's end credits, we see this shot of him overlooking a city, but we don't know when or where that's supposed to be. I remember someone saying that Colonel had three different versions in the anime, one for the main series, one for the movie, and one for the Beast arc, but does this incident really count as a separate version? It seems to be the same Colonel and Beryl, just possibly displaced in time. In Operation Shooting Star, however, we would see a full butterfly effect if these events are meant to be taken as canon. Not necessarily for Clockman kidnapping Roll, but the fact that Geostellar just freely walks about in the real world as Star Force Mega Man and other humans can see him. Even the World 3 operatives mention how weird it is that a navvy that looks like Mega Man is out and about in the real world. Even if no lasting damage was done by Clockman, this points the idea of Navi's being in the real world in people's minds. On a similar note, going back to Stream, though Beryl lives 20 years in the past, he has a PET from the modern era, and Shod's father, the owner of BlazeQuest, sees this PET and comments about how it seems to be totally wireless. It's worth noting that in the anime version, BlazeQuest would develop the advanced PET, which was, in fact, totally wireless. So it's possible that Beryl having the modern PET gave Shot's father the idea to pursue this technology more seriously, thus making another causality loop. So we have two good examples of time travel messing with things here. Stream is seemingly a causality loop, while Operation Shooting Star should have a butterfly effect. It makes me wonder what Capcom might have had planned for the cancel Operation Shooting Star sequels that were teased but never released. Rockman EXE Operation Shooting Star Versus This manga is pretty obscure. I actually had to re-record this entry because Rockman Scans on Facebook recently posted a download for this manga and it has been fan-translated. Basically, it's a big advertisement for Rockman EXE Operation Shooting Star. It features a character named Raito and he's fighting against other players and, because they're playing the same game, they're all using Rockman EXE. Raito eventually wins by using the double Rockman program events. That is nothing special, but there's one thing that makes this manga interesting. It turns out that this character, Raito, is actually likely Lan and Male's son, Patch, because Raito is his Japanese name. Look at his design, too. He has red hair like Male, and he wears the Hikari family emblem. However, it's possible that this Raito may not be Lan and Male's son, because according to this translation, his name is listed as Amino Raito, instead of Hikari Raito. Either way, we have at least one confirmed appearance of Raito in the most recent manga by Ryo Takamasaki, which actually shows us the 20-year flash-forward from the end of Battle Network 6. Too bad we still don't have anything for his canonical navvy, Mega Man Jr., though. Beyond Art This is a parallel world featured in the Beast arc of the Rockman EXE anime. According to the Mega Man knowledge base, this is not the name of the parallel Earth, but rather it's a term that means the world beyond, and is used to differentiate the alternate world from the main one. This is a post-apocalyptic world where a disaster with a dimensional area caused the cyber world and real world to merge, and navvies can materialize under their own power. This resulted in the Psybeasts Gregar and Falzar being unleashed upon the real world. As to be expected, Beyondard's version of Dr. Wily is to blame. The inhabitants of Beyondard are also parallels to that of regular Earth, but we also have characters that did not appear elsewhere in the series, namely the majority of the Link Navi operators from Battle Network 6. It should be noted that some of the Beyondard counterparts of the pre-existing characters are actually more in line with their game counterparts than the previous anime versions. Beyond Art Beryl split his kernel into two separate entities, creating Iris in the process, and Beyond Art Vidi Narsi is already paired up with Video Man instead of receiving him as an asteroid. There is no main Earth counterpart for Iris, and the only anime version that exists is from Beyond Art. Battle Network predicted the future. I suppose a more appropriate way to phrase this would be Battle Network predicted the modern day. 
But today is 20 years in the future from when the series was first released, and the advancements in technology that we have run very similar to the everyday world of Battle Network. PETs were basically smartphones before smartphones. You can send emails, use video calling, store electronic money, swipe credit cards, and of course, browse the internet to do things like shopping and chat on message boards. All of this with a device that fits in the palm of your hand. As time went on, PETs could connect to devices without wires, and our smartphones can connect to things like TV and radios using Bluetooth. While we don't quite have navvies yet, we have digital assistants like Cortana, Siri, and Alexa. The real-world deep web is akin to the internet in that it can be extremely dangerous, being a popular hangout for criminals, real-world and cyber. And of course, there are some particularly nasty viruses out there. Esports are now viewed by thousands of people for large prizes, making it a close equivalent for net battle tournaments. After all, in the opening line of the English dubbed anime, Land says, life is like living in a video game. It's the year 2000X, and it's almost like living in a video game. Our vehicles are also incorporating more and more computers and internet devices, and countless aspects of our daily lives are now centered completely around our internet society, with everything from our kitchen appliances to our school supplies being jacked in, so to speak. When asked for their opinions on how the modern world seems to reflect Battle Network, the developer said that the real world had finally caught up with their vision, and that the inspiration for their world was something that was a possible near future, and the in-universe technology that seemed advanced at the time was made with the idea of stretching just a little further, creating a world that they would like to see and was still believable. I hope that our technology does keep advancing, because I really want my own net navy. Vic was a meteorologist. Vic is the operator of Element Man, and one of the members of World 3 in Battle Network 6. Prior to joining Wily's gang, Vic was apparently a meteorologist. The reason that he joined this criminal organization is to get revenge on the weather station that fired him from his job after the construction of Mr. Weather, a robot that can control the weather. As far as I know, they don't directly say this in the game, so you'd have to read about it elsewhere. He does have the role of being a meteorologist in Rockman Beast Plus, but he's not a very good one, being fired for mispredicting a typhoon. Later, he hears Lan and his friends talking trash about his failed forecast, and he attacks them while they're at the water park, using Element Man to mess with the waterways, causing whirlpools and such. He's defeated by Spout Beast Mega Man. EXE Plushies in ZX In Area H of Mega Man ZX, which is an amusement park level, you see a crane game going in the background, picking up plushies of various characters from the Classic and Zero series. If you wait long enough, you'll see that the crane eventually picks up plushies of the Sortie and Bunny viruses, as well as a plushie of Male. This serves as another possible link between the EXE and main timeline series. Duo is Meteor G. Those of us who played Battle Network 4 and Mega Man Star Force 3 would immediately notice several similarities between games. Mega Man gains new forms based on other characters, the main plot is that a giant meteor is heading towards Earth and Mega Man has to stop it, the main enemies want to hijack the meteor and use it to subjugate mankind or destroy the Earth, and just look at Dread Joker and Laser Man side by side. That and both of them have giant laser attacks. Anyways, the main plot of Battle Network 4 is that a meteor is about to crash into Earth, and after failing to change its course with a laser, the Space Observatory discovers that the asteroid has a cyber world, so they plan to send a navy into it to change its course. After Mega Man accomplishes this, Duo, the operating system of the anti-planetary missile, commends him for his journey in strength, agreeing to spare Earth from judgment, but saying that he may return one day. Fast forward 200 years, and another giant meteor that also has an onboard cyber slash wave world that Mega Man can enter is heading towards Earth, and the final boss is the core of this asteroid. And yet, canonically, this is not Duo. Like, I get that Meteor G is comprised entirely of noise waves, but come on here. It makes way more sense that Meteor G would be Duo's asteroid. What if Duo's operating system eventually got corrupted due to how long it was flying through space, being exposed to vast amounts of various types of cosmic radiation, and that caused it to turn into a giant ball of crimson, corrupted wavelengths, thus altering the inner cyber world? What if Meteor G's core is actually what's left of Duo, and it's still trying to accomplish its mission by destroying the Earth? This would make Star Force 3 way more interesting, as well as making the similarities between it and Battle Network 4 seem more warranted and less lazy, because otherwise it just looks like a copy and paste. Even if it's not canon, I still accept it as canon. An alternative viewpoint for this could be that maybe Meteor G and the Crimson Dragon are possibly the EXE Universe stand-in for the evil energy entity the duo was chasing in the Classic series. As an energy, Crimson causes innocent EM beings to go berserk, so it's kind of like evil energy. Serenade in Battle Network 6 According to an interview with the developers, Serenade was planned to be in Battle Network 6 at one point, but due to lack of space on the cartridge, their interactions had to be cut. This interview comes from the Rockman EXE 6 Ultimate Navigation Comp Guidebook. I can't help but wonder how Serenade would have been in Battle Network 6. It makes sense though, as the threat of the Psybeasts is very much in line with Alpha, both of them being super powerful threats from the early days of the Cyber World. Maybe Serenade would have given us a new, more powerful program to defeat the Psybeasts, similar to the Giga Freeze? Maybe they would have been found guarding over the graveyard area? 
Who knows? EXE is linked to the X and Zero series. This entertains the idea that Battle Network is connected to the original Mega Man timeline. Outside of the various cameos of non-Battle Network characters in EXE works, we can connect the two timelines together thanks to Battle Network 4 and Mega Man Zero 3. If you link the two games together, you can send battle chip data between the games and give a Z-Saber to your copy of Battle Network 4. But doing this also causes viruses from the EXE series to show up in cyberspace during Mega Man Zero 3. I know what you're thinking, though. The entry says X and Zero series. Yes, that is true. Cyberspace existed as a concept in the classic timeline way before Zero 3 came out. The first time we accessed cyberspace was in Mega Man X4 during Cyber Peacock stage, and the entirety of the game Mega Man Extreme, otherwise known as Rockman X Cyber Mission, takes place before X4 and inside the mother computer. This actually may have been inspired by the Battle Network series in some way, or vice versa, as the first game in the EXE series was slated to be released the following year. While I don't have any concrete proof that these two do exist together, other than the Z-Saber being a constant throughout the games, anime, and manga, I'd like to think that if there is a gateway between timelines, this is one of the possibilities. Some more possible evidence for this theory could be the fact that Tadashi Ikari is practically identical to Thomas Light. In addition to that, both of them digitize their personalities and continue to live on as some sort of cyber ghost, with classic series Dr. Light becoming a recurring character in the Mega Man X series, and Tadashi Ikari appearing at least in Battle Networks 3 and 5. I don't necessarily think that this adds more credibility to the theory, but it is a nice reference and callback. 3D Battle Network 5 DS Remember those out-of-place 3D models for EXE that I kept mentioning? Well, in addition to LAN, Mega Man, a normal Navi, and ACDC Town, Several other models and textures for EXE characters and locations have been found as well, supposedly being from a scrapped, fully 3D version of Battle Network 5, which would have been a DS exclusive. This certainly would have been an interesting game, and I can't help but wonder how it would have impacted future Mega Man games. Mega Rock made a video documenting these unused assets, and you can find a link for these in the description. Kalinka in EXE In the classic series, Kalinka is Dr. Cossack's daughter. While Kalinka is never mentioned in the Battle Network series, concept art shows a design for Kalinka alongside Dr. Cossack from Battle Network 3. I guess she was cut because she just didn't fit into the story's narrative. Such a shame to see these designs go to waste. Kalinka also apparently makes a small cameo in Mega Man Legends 2. Serenade's Operator Even though Serenade appears to be a solo navi, it's been rumored for years that the Underking's Operator was Mamoru. This theory arose from a rather large pile of evidence. Firstly, Mamoru's father built the Undernet server. Secondly, Mamoru's last name is Ura in the English version, and Urakawa in the Japanese version. Additionally, the Japanese name for the Undernet is the Uranet. But the biggest piece of evidence is the fact that Mamoru's wheelchair has Serenade's emblem on it. We also know that Mamoru has an interest in net battles, as he asks Len to get him an Ice Ball battle chip, which would be useless to him unless he has a Navi. While they never spell it out directly for us, this theory more or less got confirmed by Masakazu Eguchi. I think a nice, subtle piece of confirmation would have been if they gave Serenade an Ice Ball attack during the boss battle. Too bad Mamoru and Serenade never made another appearance in the later games, not even in Battle Chip Challenge. This does raise a few questions, though. If Serenade claims to be a Dark Navi, then why would they allow themselves to be operated by a human child? I really wish that we could have seen some sort of interaction between these two. Battle Network is on a separate timeline. As the entry says, Battle Network, and consequently Star Force, have to take place on a separate timeline from the rest of the Mega Man franchise. While it's confirmed that at least Classic up through ZX are on a linear timeline, with Legends speculated to be off in a distant future, just given the different world build and calendar dates used, Battle Network and Star Force have to be on a separate timeline. Both EXE and Classic take place in 20XX, and Star Force takes place in 22XX, which is when the very end of the X arc and the majority of the Zero arc take place, so it's impossible for them to both happen at the same time. As much as I like a unified timeline theory, I just don't think it's probable. Blackbeard's real name. Another character from Battle Network 6, Blackbeard is the operator of Dive Man. It seems that Blackbeard is just a stage name, taking inspiration from Edward Teach, the real-life Captain Blackbeard. I always thought this was weird, since the World 3 operator doesn't even have a full beard, and his mustache is more gray than black. There are some art books called Rockman EXE no Himitsu and Rockman EXE no Subete. I'm sorry if I butchered the pronunciation, but these books contain some trivia that hasn't been localized, though based on the fan translation, they seem to confirm that Vic was in fact a meteorologist, and Blackbeard's real name was in fact Taihei Izuzaki. These books also state that Al Ferry, Chargeman's operator, was a train conductor who was always on time, and Mr. Press, Dustman's operator, is a student studying abroad from Netopia. These sources are cited on the MMKB. Other dubs use North American footage. 
Besides English and Japanese, the Rockman EXE anime was dubbed into other languages as well, and several of these other dubs apparently used the censored footage from the North American version, as well as keeping the name changes. This is evidenced by the Region 1 DVDs containing a Spanish audio track, and other language DVDs still bearing the title of NT Warrior. Even outside the DVDs, the alternate dubs of Access also use the North American footage. I actually remember seeing a post in the Latin American Rockman EXE fan group on Facebook, and someone asked why all these changes were made from the Japanese version. I'm not sure why the other dubs did this. I don't really know a lot about licensing or how adapting foreign shows for TV broadcast works. Robot Master Sharkman Believe it or not, Sharkman is not a Battle Network original. Sharkman was a Robot Master before the Battle Network series. So, why don't you remember him? Well, because like Torchman's first Robot Master counterpart, he was exclusive to Mega Man 3 for DOS. I honestly didn't even know this until I started this whole Iceberg project. Credit to the Venom Spino for bringing this to my attention. But I don't think that the DOS games actually count, so nobody really counts these Robot Masters as canon. Heck, four characters from the DOS games, Wave Man, Blade Man, Oil Man, and Torch Man, all got remakes in the canon classic Mega Man games. Metabots crossover. Man, these crossovers just never end. In addition to Duel Masters and Boktai, Rockman EXE has also done a crossover with Metabots in the game Metarot S Unlimited Nova, another Japanese exclusive mobile game. The collaboration with Rockman EXE was very recent, taking place from August to early September of 2021. The crossover featured three new Metabots to collect, one based on Rockman, one based on Roll, and one inspired by Forte GS. In addition to that, BGM from the Rockman EXE series could also be unlocked. In October of 2022, there was a second Rockman EXE crossover, this time featuring Metabots based on Blues, Serenade, Colonel, and Gutsman, as well as having new costumes for the player characters. This crossover simultaneously makes sense, but is also strange. I can believe that Mega Man should do a crossover with Metabots, but the strange part is that it's the EXE series, one of the few times where Mega Man is not a robot. But thematically speaking, when both series feature kids who can customize their cybernetic companions to fight each other, that seems like a great matchup. Plus, the fact that this was so recent gives me the hope that maybe Capcom hasn't abandoned this IP just yet. Navi Copies There are several instances of Navis being copied in one way or another. The most common way is by the use of image data, which is a copy of a Navi's body and combat abilities, but not their personality. It's implied that this is how Dr. Wily made so many clones of Blaster Man and Stone Man in the anime. They're all digital, remember? Copying them was as easy as clicking a button. This could also be the way that Navi chips are used. While we never see a Navi chip used in the anime, in the manga, Team Style Mega Man can summon a copy of a Navi from the original Mega Man's memories. Toward the end of Battle Network 2, we also see several clones of Navis being used by Gospel in an attempt to stop Mega Man from reaching the Super Navi. In the Beast Plus arc of the anime, the Professor created a copy of Zero called Zero One, who is basically just a mindless drone, and the only immediate physical difference was its right eye. This seems different from image data or the clones that were made of Stone Man and Blaster Man, because Zero One seems to carry roughly the same amount of power as the original Zero. There is another method of copying navvies called backup data. While we never see the process of backup data being used, several times in the games, manga, and anime, we see navvies who were deleted but then revived using backup data. These navvie backups retain the personalities of the original and sometimes have a new title, like adding a 2 at the end of their name. I am curious to see what would happen if backup data were used to create a Navi clone while the previous version was still active. It should also be noted that image data and backup data are different from Navi Ghosts and Asteroid Navis, which we covered earlier. There are some truly bizarre moments in Rockman EXE 4.5 when playable Navis can fight against themselves. The weirdest instance is when you can have three Metal Men in the same area at the same time. One is playable, one is fightable, and the third one blocks your path, wanting you to play a minigame with him. Which one of these is the real Metal Man? Backup data and Navi cloning does raise some questions of ethics around Navi operation and net battling, though. If net Navis have souls, then is it right to just copy their data as though they were expendable? In sources outside the games, most net battles don't really seem to be to the death, especially in tournaments. But in Battle Network 4, Junkman is actually deleted after losing to Mega Man, stating that because he has no operator or backup data, that he can't be revived. If you lose during the tournaments of Battle Network 4 or during the N1 in Battle Network 3, it counts as a game over. So does this mean that every tournament is a net battle to the death, and the navvies are just revived immediately afterward? In Battle Network 4, the announcer does always proclaim that the enemy is deleted after losing. In the first few games, after defeating a friendly navvy, most of the time, the operator won't rematch you until you progress the story some more, sometimes saying that they want to repair or upgrade their navvy. Are you slaughtering these navvies every time you grind for battle chips or bug frags? Who knows? Gauss is a crossdresser. This is something that is exclusive to the anime. 
For some reason, they decided to make Magnet Man's operator, Gauss Magnus, a crossdresser, complete with a frilly dress, wig, makeup, and a fan. He keeps the beard, though. This is often done in moments of peril, and it seems like he's just playing it up in the moment, acting like a damsel in distress, even pitching up his voice. I think it's just meant to be for comedic effect. Otherwise, it may be a reference that I don't get. Out of all the characters that could do this, why Gauss, though? Maybe because he was an elegant and powerful businessman, so it creates a bigger contrast? I'm not sure. His brother Count Zap also cross-dressed once when he was impersonating Mama Zap in front of Lan. They actually did keep Gauss cross-dressing during two episodes of the English dub. In the episode Working for Grave, they are at a costume party, and during the Access episode Commander Beef Returns, in the dub he says that the cleaners messed up his order, presumably that they swapped his clothes with his dress by mistake, and several other characters are dressed up as Commander Beef at that time. They do tone down him acting like a damsel in distress, though, and he doesn't pitch his voice up. I honestly don't really know what this is all about. Bug Riser Bug Riser is a multi-bug organism similar to Gospel and Gregar, who has only had two appearances that I know of. Its image is used for the icons of the Battle Network 6 Giga Chips, Bug Rise Sword, and Bug Death Thunder. Bug Rise Sword turns your charge shot into a Dark Sword, while Bug Death Thunder turns it into a Dark Thunder. Both chips consume bug frags upon use. Bug Riser has only made a proper appearance in a bonus chapter of the Mega Man NT Warrior manga called The Nightmare of Battleship Stadium, and requires the combined power of Mega Man, Proto Man, and Colonel to defeat, as well as the implementation of the unique program advance, Boscano Panic Express. Bug Riser has never been further elaborated upon, but it seems to contain a higher intellect than Gospel, being able to audibly speak and express its own will. I really wish that we had gotten to see more of this character in one way or another. Zoanaroids Navis who have been afflicted by the Beast Factor, causing them to become loyal servants of Gregor or Falzar, and forsake all of humanity, including their own operators. The Beast Factor also grants them the ability to perform Beast Out, taking on a form corrupted by their Psy Beast Master. I feel like I should also mention that there is a Zoanaroid Pharaoh Man, but there is no Beyond Art Base counterpart. I'm not sure if Beyond Art Base would have been born from this Pharaoh Man, or if he just doesn't exist. The Zoanaroids seem inspired by the Zoanoids from the Giver series, who are humans that can turn into monsters. Duo's home planet. At the end of Battle Network 4, Duo introduces himself not as a Navi, but as the operating system of his asteroid, which is actually an anti-planetary missile. This means that he was sent from another planet to destroy the Earth. So the question is, what planet is he from? We don't really know. It is possible that he could be from a world located near where planets AM and FM reside in the Star Force series, but we don't really have a solid answer, at least as far as the games are concerned. In the anime, Duo was created on Earth in the distant past, as shown in episode 45 of Rockman EXE Stream. This counterpart of Duo is considered to be a net navi, created to manage the chaotic prehistoric cyberworld. However, Duo became too powerful and essentially took on the status of godhood. By following the direction of his programming to preserve order in the universe, Duo saw the flaws in humanity and believed that they were headed down an evil path and decided to eradicate the ancient civilization. We're also shown the design of the ancient navis, and they bear a striking resemblance to Slur. Upon finding Lan and his friends investigating the ancient ruins to find a means to stop Duo, Slur destroys the ruins, with our heroes barely escaping alive. Duo being from a super advanced prehistoric civilization plays into the same themes behind Mu from Mega Man Star Force 2, as well as the previously mentioned incarnation of Pharaoh Man from the Mega Man NT Warrior manga. Dragon Ball References there are a few instances that seem like they could be references to Dragon Ball. In the NT Warrior Super Legend bonus chapter of the manga, Mega Man and Proto Man drop off their limiters and start moving faster, similar to how Goku and Piccolo remove heavy clothes before fighting. Of course, this also looks like a reference to Naruto, where Rock Lee drops his weights, given that they make giant craters when they hit the ground. The scene in the anime where Lekman drags Magnet Man into Mega Man's attack is similar to how Goku held Raditz in place so that Piccolo could hit him with a special beam cannon. In both cases, the protagonists were injured and weakened, and the victory required one of the heroes to sacrifice themselves. These may or may not actually be references, but I haven't heard many people make mentions of such correlations. But anime referencing other anime is not new by any stretch. Rockman EXE References in Other Works This one is kind of a broad category, but I think they're still worth discussing. There are a handful of times when Rockman EXE in various forms, games, and anime have been referenced in other works, including Lunar Lux, Restage Dream Days, and Are You Okay With a Slightly Older Girlfriend? Lunar Lux is an indie game on Steam that takes influence from Mega Man Battle Network, and one of the TV screens shows Mega Man Battle Network 6 on it, as well as Lan and Shod's PETs on the wall. You can also find a poster of Star Force Mega Man and another one of Mega Man EXE with... Some character I can't identify. I think that's Roxy from Pokemon Black and White 2? In Restage, there are a few times when one of the characters makes homage to the original Jackin animation used in the early seasons of the anime. In the light novel and manga, Are You Okay With a Slightly Older Girlfriend, the characters are talking about the Game Boy Advance and eventually mentions Mega Man Battle Network. 
This info was shared by the Rockman EXE Zone on Twitter. The references apparently start in Chapter 3, and they are seen again in Volume 6. A few different names are tossed around during translation, from Mega Boy NT Warrior to Mega Man NT Warrior to Rock in EXZ, so I'm not sure how it's actually localized. Either way, the reference is clear. I've heard that there is also a reference in Nyarko-san Crawling with Chaos, but I haven't been able to find that exact episode where the reference takes place. Reportedly, there's a line of dialogue that says, Plug in transmission, while one of the characters is plugging their phone into a speaker. Anime and manga drawing references to each other is nothing new, but Rockman EXE is a very niche community, at least outside of Japan. So unless you are actively looking for these references, odds are that you might not even recognize one when you see it, unless you're a really diehard fan of that series. Robot Master Clockman? Technically, there is no official Robot Master Clockman, but there are some robots who could be seen as Clockman EXE's predecessors. While Clockman EXE's design was taken from a fan submission for a Mega Man Star Force character, in some of the side games for the classic series, we get Time Man in Mega Man Powered Up, which is a remake of the first Mega Man game on PSP, and the Clock Men from Rockman and Forte, Challenger from the Future, for Wonderswan. The Clock Men have the ability to time travel, like Clock Man EXE does, and while the idea itself was recycled, I don't think that this had a direct influence on the villain of Operation Shooting Star. It's kind of like how Clown Man exists in Mega Man 8, but has no Navi counterpart, with the closest successors being Color Man and Circus Man, even if the latter was taken from a fan submission as well. Cash, the final boss and primary antagonist of Phantom of the Network. He was created from remnants of cache data from an older server in Scilab that ran for years uninterrupted. The more he grew and the more he learned about humans and their past, the more he grew to despise them. He created the Jamming Men and uses them and data cache copies of various navvies to attack the cyber world. Cash also appears in the Beast Plus arc of the anime, serving as the final antagonist of the series. He plays more or less the same role as his game counterpart, but nearly succeeded in destroying the world after transforming every human and navvy into cache data. He is destroyed by Cross Fusion Mega Man. Cash's design bears some resemblance to Copybots. I'm unsure if this was intentional, however. Maybe because Cash could control copies of Navis, the Copybots were designed in reference to Cash. Link Power is based on Soulnet. Well, the two do seem to have some great similarities to each other. The purpose of Soulnet was to link together mankind's souls via a special wavelength to allow greater bonds to be formed. The original incarnation of Soulnet was developed by Tadashi Ikari and Dr. Wily, both deciding to let their descendants finish the project. Link Power and the line of study that would lead to the creation of Brother Bands were developed by Lan, as evidenced from his diary pages in Mega Man Star Force 2. Lan was present during the activation of Dr. Regal's Soulnet, and he managed to form a deep enough connection with Mega Man, his brother Hub, to defeat Nebula Grey. Maybe this incident inspired Lan to pursue this idea, but to use it for good? Even the ending scene of Battle Number 5 and Star Force 1 are nearly identical, with each respective Mega Man's friends sending their power to him via a bond as friends. It seems pretty open and shut to me. Hub was an eternal life project. Out of all of the oddities in the EXE series, one of the strangest instances has to be the digitization of human souls. While it's presented as a means of a father reviving his deceased son, what if there was an ulterior motive? Remember Tadashi Akari's Cyber Ghost? He knew Lan and Hub's names, meaning that prior to his death and digitization, the twins must have been born, or at the very least had their names picked out. Since Hub died as a baby, it seems to be possible that Tadashi helped his son digitize Hub's DNA, and would later use the same procedure on himself, inserting himself into the Guardian program and then going into slumber alongside Alpha. But, despite Alpha disappearing, remember that during the ending sequence of Battle Network 5, Team Proto Man more specifically, we can hear Tadashi's voice. It seems that the digitizing actually did make him somewhat immortal. I wonder what happened to Tadashi's soul during Mega Man Star Force. We don't really see this idea explored in the manga as far as I can recall. Although in the anime, Dr. Wily preemptively digitized his personality data and current memories, putting them onto a chip, and ordered the X-World 3 members to find it. The chip was lost in the ocean after falling off of Gauss's blimp during a fight between Gauss and Count Zap. It wasn't necessary though, as Dr. Wily was still alive. If he was able to do this, I wonder if this means that Hub does exist in the anime. Trill another anime-exclusive character, and one of the few instances where we have a confirmed child Net Navi. He first appears in the Beast arc, and is found by Bubble Man, who delivers him to Net City. Not knowing his name, Roll temporarily named him Beep. It turns out that Trill was created by the Beyond Art version of Tadashi Akari in order to harness the power of the Psybeasts so that Gregor and Falzar could be defeated. This is seen when he gives Mega Man the ability to Beast out. He is called the Synchronizer by various Zoanaroids because Trill's true reason for existing is to neutralize the Psybeast factor that has afflicted so many navvies in Beyond Art. 
Trill also appears in the final episode of Beast Plus, serving as a deus ex machina to save Land and Mega Man when they'd already been converted into cash data. It's implied that this version of Trill is actually a cash copy, since the real Trill should still be back at Beyond Art. The word Trill is also a musical term, used to describe when the instrument player rapidly alternates between two adjacent notes. This is reflected in how Trill gives Mega Man two separate side beast forms. Sigma Virus in EXE Given that the EXE series takes place primarily inside a computer world and other characters from the Mega Man X series have made an appearance in this universe, several fans expected to see some incarnation of the Sigma Virus in Battle Network. However, this never came to be in any form of EXE media so far. The closest thing we get are the Zero Virus, as during Mega Man X5, the Zero Virus is described as a merging of the Sigma Virus and the Eurasia Colony Virus that has the same data reading as Zero. As far as a stand-in role goes, Cybeast Falzar and the anime version of Pharaoh Man actually share some similarities to Sigma. Both were created to help protect humanity from threats, but circumstances led to them becoming too powerful and uncontrollable, consequentially making them a primary antagonist. Despite these similarities, Sigma sadly never had a proper appearance in the EXE series. Such a wasted opportunity. Navis that outlive their operators. Kind of a sad concept, but because Navis are data, they age at a different rate than humans do. We have seen a few instances of navvies outliving their operators, like Yuko's navvy Ponta or Tadashi Akari's navvy in Battle Network 5. In the case of Ponta, we can assume that Yuko's dad took care of him after she passed on to the afterlife, unless he was deleted during the battle with Lan. Ponta never does have any dialogue before or after the match. In the anime, both Gauss and Magnet Man are sentenced to 931 years in prison, and Magnet Man was stored inside a navvy prison vault still inside his PET. If Tesla hadn't busted them out, Magnet Man would likely have survived the sentence, but Gauss definitely would have died of old age. Theoretically speaking, if a Navi's data is maintained well enough, then they could potentially live forever. But looking at one specific example, we do have an estimated potential lifespan for Navi's. Taking Tadashi Akari's Navi into account, if we assume that he's been standing in the same spot for 20 years, as the game has led us to believe, and lacked the basic maintenance, given that his operator was now a cyber ghost for at least 10 of those years, it seems that roughly 20 or so years is the average lifespan for a Navi, since this one turned into a pile of data ruins after Mega Man received the pass key from him. Either way, this does present a sad scenario for Lan and Mega Man. Since Hub is now Data, he will most likely outlive his twin brother, as long as his Data is properly maintained, assuming that Lan doesn't digitize his own personality like his grandfather did. Mega Man is an IP within EXE. This theory supports the idea that other Mega Man works exist as an intellectual property within the universe of Battle Network, similar to how they do with the Dead Rising games. Think about it. How many different throwbacks to other series do we see? We have posters of Classic Duo, as well as Vile and Zero from the X series, and we have toys and dolls from the Legend series, talking about the Casket Kids, Family Bon, and Go Bon Go. The Bon family was apparently popular enough to not only get three TV shows, but also a ton of merch beyond toys, extending to a rug in Yai's house, and even a full-sized real servbot appearing in Battle Story Rockman EXE. We also see that Data has made several appearances as well, from a doll in Yai's house, to the TV in Lan's house in Battle Network 2, and being on a painting in Lan's new house in Battle Network 6, and in Battle Network 1, Lan has a Mega Man Legends 2 poster in his room, and Dex has a poster and welcome mat with the servbots on it in his room. Having a reference or cameo is one thing, but with this many stacked up, it makes you wonder if other Mega Man references are meant to be taken literally, meaning that Mega Man does exist in-universe as an IP, similar to how in Digimon Tamers, Adventure 01 and 02 were a TV show. Well, in the EXE anime, the Japanese name of the company that Yai's father owns is called Gabgom, which is a reference to Capcom and is a game company, and in Mega Man Legends, we hear about how both Mega Man Legends Slash 64 and Resident Evil exist as games in-universe there, so... Capcom Multiverse confirmed? Maybe? Mega, Giga, and Terra Class In terms of computer technology, a megabyte is 1 million bytes, a gigabyte is 1,000 megabytes, and a terabyte is 1,000 gigabytes. We have two instances of the EXE series using these terms as a method of scaling power rather than capacity. Once is in the manga, during Mega Man and Proto Man's rematch after the battle with the Psybeasts. The two of them have grown so powerful that the battle arena itself can't stand up to the fight that's being had. With both navvies now moving at blinding speed, the Mega Buster now resembling an artillery cannon, and Proto Man's sword slashes teleporting. The onlookers described the match as a Giga class and then as a Terra class, which the author's notes described as being 1,000 times greater in magnitude than the previous level. The other instance is in the Battleship Stadium arcade game, where different program advances are given these rankings. I'm not sure what the criteria for these rankings are, aside from their sheer power output. Shugo Zenin Gagti Rockman. I am so sorry for butchering that. But, the title for this one translates to Everyone Gathered Gag Rockman, 
Written by Senkichi Hinodea, this manga was serialized in Famitsu Comic Magazine. While no official English translation exists, the Rockman Scans Facebook page has posted these with Spanish text, so I have been able to decipher the dialogue after putting the text through a translator. Basically, the premise of this one is that several Mega Man characters, including Mega Man.exe, Tron Bond from Legends, and Prometheus from ZX, are all attending the same school together, and one of the staples seems to be toy humor, as exe Kun has fart jokes and craps his bodysuit, leading to him to cutting off its lower half. Gutsman also is apparently exe Kun's mother. I think we're better off with this one not getting a localization. EXE is first in the Unified Timeline If we are to believe the theory that all Mega Man series are on one big linear timeline, we need to consider the idea that the EXE series may be the first in the greater Unified Timeline. The presented evidence is that navvies being installed into copybots eventually leads to robots with personalities becoming commonplace. Robots do appear in the EXE series, but they're never more complex than a security drone, Navis themselves have souls and personalities, some of which are based on human DNA, which could have led to the classic series Dr. Light developing Mega Man and then later on Mega Man X. But where did Dr. Light come from? What if Lan grows up to be Dr. Thomas Light and uses his scientific career to develop robots? Or what if the role is assumed by Lan's father, Dr. Ikari, instead? And what about Dr. Albert Wiley? Clearly, Lord Wiley from the EXE series would be too old to fill this role. But remember, Dr. Wiley has a son. What if Dr. Regal became Albert Wiley after having a relapse back into his evil ways? After his brainwashing in Battle Network 5, he does go on to work with Lan's father at Scilab. What if Hub, being inside a copybot, eventually turns into the household robot named Rock? It's an interesting theory, and I even entertained the idea myself when I was a kid, but Mega Man Star Force pretty much eliminates this possibility, as it's the canonical direct sequel to the Battle Network series. But, remember the time paradoxes we talked about earlier? What if we consider Operation Shooting Star as the canon sequel to Star Force 3, and Clockman meddling in the past caused unforeseen changes to the timeline, causing Battle Network to turn into classic Mega Man instead of Star Force? Probably not, as we see Geo and Sonya safely return to their own time with seemingly no negative side effects. But if this theory were to be given any serious consideration, this is how I'd do it. World 3 was targeting Lan. This is the idea that the central focus of all of World 3's crimes was Lan and his family, and... Yeah, I believe it. Lan is the son and grandson of two very prestigious scientists, one of which, Dr. Wily, the head of World 3, had a deep-seated grudge against. Why wouldn't Tadashi Akari and those he loves become a target of World 3? It makes perfect sense. It actually makes other seemingly random instances make even more sense. Why else would the small suburb of ACDC Town be a repeat target? If the World 3's goal was to destroy or conquer the world, then why do they keep doing small-time crime like setting ovens on fire or taking over schools? unless the Akaris were the target the entire time. If we consider that Wily was behind Gospel as well, then Airman attacking Yai's house, as well as Speedy Dave trying to flood the Akuden Valley campgrounds and Gauss hijacking Lance Flight, while the leader of Gospel was on board, all of these seem to be just random and somewhat nonsensical instances that Lan just so happens to get caught up in, unless it was deliberate. They were all specifically targeting Lan and his friends. Otherwise, isn't it just the luckiest thing in the world that Lan just happened to show up to stop the disasters? Dragon Poker Dragon Poker is a Japanese exclusive mobile game that released in 2013 for iOS and Android. In 2018, they did a crossover collab with Rockman EXE, where a wide variety of characters from the EXE series are playable in the game. These characters include various iterations of Rockman, Blues, Forte, and several other navvies and viruses, and it seems that Serenade is a costume for a character named Machika. Battle chips and mystery data also serve as support cards. This game had a crossover with Mega Man X as well. Robot Master Judgeman While the design of Judgeman EXE is exclusive to the Battle Network series and is based on a fan-submitted Navi named Bookman, there does exist a classic series counterpart that shares the name. In the manga Megamix, during the Ultimate Robot Championship, we can see this scale-shaped robot under the name of Judgeman. Unfortunately, Judgeman, along with Buildman, get torched by Flameman, so they clearly didn't win this tournament. Base died in Battle Network 3 I had wanted to make a full video exploring this theory, but I may as well unpack it here. This theory is that the original Base.exe that was created by Dr. Cossack canonically died during Battle Network 3, either in the underbelly of Alpha, or after his and Mega Man's rematch in the secret area, when he charges up an Earthbreaker but simply disappears. What if the base that you encounter in every subsequent game was not the real base, but rather is a leftover clone from Gospel's base project? We see that at least one was hiding in the World 3 area before being blasted to pieces by the real base, so who's to say that more didn't escape and are still out there somewhere? If you recall, base doesn't appear in the story again after Battle Network 3, and is relegated to side quests and post-game. 
but every time he does appear afterwards, it's always very strange. In Battle Network 4, he's sealed away inside a statue. In Battle Network 5, he appears using a warp hole that looks like the portal to the Nebula's Dark Galaxy universe, and the Chaos Lord can take his form later. In Battle Network 6, he first shows up inside a gravestone with an epitaph reading, Here lies the Cyber World's God of Destruction. Later on, though, he does just teleport in whenever he appears. After the battle against Base BX in the Underground, we see him finally explode, seemingly being permanently deleted, even though Mega Man and Land say that Base is still out there somewhere. More than that, after Battle Network 3, he never seems to recognize Mega Man, even if Mega Man calls him by name. I know that in Battle Network 3's postgame, it said that Base GS was suffering amnesia, but if this is the same base, then he should have at least some reaction, right? After being defeated following such a huge power buff, that would leave an impression on anybody. Even if he didn't learn Mega Man's name, he should at least acknowledge that he has seen Mega Man before. If we want to take Rockman EXE 4.5 into account, you can play as base and fight at least two other bases, one in the Chaos area, who gets called a clone by the playable base and then also explodes and dies, and another one that shows up in the Under Tournament. Sure, this game isn't canon, but you get the idea. And though base appears in Battleship Challenge as his normal self and base GS, again, I'm fairly certain that this game is non-canon due to characters who are supposed to be dead actually showing up, like Arashi and Inukai. Further still, base's boss fights in the first three games were pretty consistent. He always had an aura shield and different types of buster attacks. In Battle Networks 2 and 3, he could use Earthbreaker, and base GS and Omega in Battle Network 3 had the gospel weapons. That all changes in Battle Network 4. As stated in base's entry on this iceberg, he now has different buster shots, Dark Arm Blades, Hell's Rolling, and Darkness Overload, but lacks his defensive aura or barrier except as base double X, but he's been stripped of gospel's powers. The fight in Battle Network 5 is nearly identical, but with the addition of Chaos Nightmare, which basically replaces Earthbreaker. I could believe that the base in 4 and 5 are the same entity, but the one from 6 seems very different from these two. His boss battle again underwent heavy revisions, now incorporating several battle chips. Remember what Shaw said about Gospel's base clones? The ability to use battle chips at will, despite being a solo navvy, is one of the Super Navi's theoretical abilities. And again, the whole gravestone thing just seems weird to me. Like, why is base in there? We didn't see him die in Battle Network 5, so what's up with this? But anyway, that's my theory. Base died in Battle Network 3, and the bases you fight later on are just leftover gospel clones. I'm sure that I'm not the only one who's had this idea, but I don't recall seeing it posted on any major forums or discussion boards, so it's likely just an instance of us having a similar thought process. Do I actually think that the developers intended this? No, probably not. Since Battle Network 4 served as something of a soft reboot of the series, given that all of the character development from Battle Network 3, like Land and Mega Man becoming highly ranked in the Undernet, Dex becoming a great net battler, and us actually meeting Tamako, or all reset to zero, I think that they just included base as an added challenge and just decided to not acknowledge our history with the character. As I've said before, I don't think that any of the post-game in the Battle Network series are meant to be taken as canon, with the exception of Battle Network 6 because it is the final game, and back before Battle Network 4 came out, I think that 3's post-game could have been canon as well. But since we're not the Underking anymore, I think that that's been retconned. Garuru Rockman I had to probe the deepest parts of the cyber world to find this one, and even then, I only found the title. Garuru Rockman EXE, meaning Growling Rockman EXE, was featured in a 2006 issue of Koro Koro Magazine. However, LB Men was kind enough to direct me to scans of three pages from this obscure little manga. I'll have a link for these in the description. All I can really tell here is that Mega Man is trying to fight the Psy Beasts, and Lan uses a battle chip that makes him super buff. And Base also beats the snot out of him. Aside from that, I can find next to nothing on this comic. If anyone has any more info or scans, then please share your findings with the community. The same can be said for another entry on this tier, Bakusho Network Rockman Yaro EXE, which, I'm not even kidding, translates to LOL Network Rockman Bastard EXE, according to Japanese Wikipedia. All I can find for this one is the Wikipedia page and a single screenshot that was shared on Twitter, as well as the author's name, which is Yuji Ida. The reason I posted them here, despite having almost no info, is to draw attention to them so that someone else with better resources than me can possibly dig up something. Neither of these are mentioned on any of the Mega Man wikis that I frequent, and I personally would like to learn more about these obscure comics. Thanks again to LB Man for sharing scans of Garuru Rockman, as well as those from the obscure Rockman Duel Masters manga and this fine little advertising comic. Trojan Horse, the final boss of the second Rockman EXE mobile game, Legend of the Network. The Trojan Horse was created 3,000 years before modern civilization by Dr. Troy. The character known as Nobody, who is from an ancient Atlantean civilization, revived the Trojan Horse in an attempt to destroy the modern world. This monster is deleted by Mega Man and Lan. 
Earlier in the game's story, a new character, Rideman, is infected by a fragment of the Trojan Horse, leading to him becoming Reverse Rideman, which is a horse-like form, and Mega Man was given the new Transarm program, which also contained a fragment of the Trojan Horse virus, attempting to corrupt him as well. The Trojan Horse itself shares a similar color palette to Life Virus R, but this seems to be unintentional. The name of the Trojan Horse is an obvious reference to the real-world computer virus type called Trojans, and its design reflects the Trojan Horse from Greek mythology. Just the same, the character Nobody's name is a reference to the same myth. When Odysseus was fighting the Cyclops and said his name was something similar to Nobody or No One. After Odysseus blinded the Cyclops, the Cyclops' friends asked if he was being attacked, to which the Cyclops answered, Nobody is attacking me, leading to him not receiving any help. The more I learn about the mobile games, the more I long for the preservation project to be successful and hope for us to see a playable ROM or full remake in the future. Nation Z we still don't have a concrete answer for what country Nation Z could represent, unlike several other countries in the EXE series that are all stand-ins for real-world locations. In my first Iceberg video, I jokingly said that it might be Germany because of a very weak JoJo reference, but I actually may have had a point, though for a different reason than I intended. You see, Dr. Regal, who is said to be from Nation Z, is the son of Dr. Wily, and in the classic Mega Man series, Dr. Albert Wily was designed as a reference to Dr. Albert Einstein, who is from real-world Germany. This is reflected in several pieces of media that give Dr. Wily a German accent. So if we translate that to the EXE series, maybe Dr. Wily and Dr. Regal are from the EXE equivalent of Germany? Again, probably not, but you never know. It's not likely, but it could be possible that maybe Nation Z is actually meant to be Zanzibar Land, a reference to the Metal Gear series, since Hideo Kojima does have a cameo in Battle Network 4. I mean, we're already referencing Boktai, so why not reference Metal Gear while we're at it? Another country we know next to nothing about is Nation R, which is mentioned in the Japanese version of EXE-1, and Wily mentioned that he wanted to launch a hacking rocket towards the nation's satellite to start the endgame. Its mention was not made in the English version of the game, however. Pocket Pickster I think Proto Dude said it best. The rarest piece of Mega Man merch? The Mega Man NT Warrior Pocket Pickster. This was an entertainment toy from Fisher-Price that featured characters from Mega Man Anti warrior as the name implies. As far as I'm aware, the toy was never released, but the patent exists, and you can check out the instruction manual in this neat little PDF. It looks like a pretty basic electronic edutainment toy, with a drawing program and a few minigames, like a maze, a memory match, and a virus catcher. Nothing special, but it is an interesting piece of lost Mega Man history. Male Cameo in Powerpuff Girls Z Remember that Powerpuff Girls anime? Yeah, that existed. Anyway, in episode 19 of Powerpuff Girls Z, when this big piano monster is terrorizing the town, it eats a lot of people. One of the kids it eats seems to be based on male Sakurai. This can't simply just be a coincidence and has to be a direct reference, since male is known for playing the piano and the main villain of the episode is a piano monster. First a cameo in ZX and now in Powerpuff Girls Z. Male must be working overtime. Gotta do something while we wait for another EXE title to be announced. Mecha Anime References there are several times when various mecha series are referenced throughout the Rockman EXE IP. In the anime, during the episode Wacky Madness and Blazing Battles Part 1, Sharkman knocks out a Red Navi who seems to be inspired by Shin Getter Robo. Credit to HFRMDL on Twitter for finding this. In Land's Room and Network Transmission, over on that poster in the corner, if you zoom in, you can see what appears to be a reference to Grandizer, albeit with a color palette similar to Sigma from the Mega Man X series. This next one is probably just a coincidence, but remember that toy robot in ACDC Park in Battle Network 2? If you look closely at it, it sort of resembles Mazinger Z. This one is probably just meant to be a generic super robot toy, though, because I do also see a bit of Voltron in there. That said, though, if it is Mazinger Z, given how its mouth grill looks, it makes me wonder if Detective Oda's Navi from the manga is meant to be referenced to anything. There are other mecha references in the Battle Network series as well. In Battle Network 2, Gundam is referenced by the Quiz King as the series of Rondam. If we wanted to stretch logic here, then perhaps the legendary program advance in the anime could be an homage to the Shining Finger Sword from G Gundam? Nah, probably not. But X using Shining Finger in Day of Sigma is definitely a G Gundam reference, but this iceberg is about Battle Network, not X, so I'll leave that topic for later. There are probably some other references that I missed, but I love seeing famous mecha works getting shoutouts in other franchises. Gekito, EXE Kyodai Rockmin. This one is a comedy manga whose title translates to Fierce Fighting, EXE Siblings Rock Mean. It was published in Besatsu Korokoro Magazine and was written by Kawano Takumi. The Mega Man knowledge base states that the main characters are twin brothers named Neta and Neji Rokuta, and they are both players of the Rock Man EXE series. So far, all I can find for this one are three scans, and I can barely tell what's going on, though it looks like they pulled down a girl's pants, and appropriately, she looks like she's about to murder the twins. Currently, I can't find any more info on this one, and I'm not sure I want to. 
There was also apparently a follow-up called Laugh Attack On Air, Shooting Star Rockmean, which takes influence from the Mega Man Star Force series. Mega Man Jr. The name of the Navi belonging to Patch, Lan and Mail's son. Mega Man Jr. is said to be designed by taking the best parts of Mega Man.exe and Roll, but we never see what Mega Man Jr. looks like. But if I were to speculate, I would guess that it would likely be some offshoot of Roll Soul, since he was created from Mega Man and Roll's data, but maybe with a different color scheme. Another thing that not a lot of people seem to think about? If Mega Man Jr. was created from Mega Man EXE's data, aka Hub, then that means that technically Patch, his operator, is also his cousin, since he is Lan's son. And that would mean that Mega Man EXE is actually Patch's uncle. That's gotta be kind of awkward. And, as I said earlier, in the Rockman OSS vs. manga, though Patch made an appearance, he is operating Mega Man.exe instead of Mega Man Jr. Speedy Dave is based on the Unabomber. This is probably the biggest conspiracy point on this list. It seems that Speedy Dave, the operator of Quickman and member of Gospel, share some similarities to a real-life terrorist named Ted Kaczynski, more widely known as the Unabomber. Both of them were moved to acts of terrorism after witnessing the destruction of nature, both of them are known for using bombs, and both of them are known for being very intelligent, as Kaczynski was a mathematics professor, and Speedy Dave claims to have an IQ of 170. According to one source I found, Kaczynski's IQ was 167 when he was tested as a child. Additionally, Kaczynski has a brother named David, a name that is often shortened to just Dave, although Quickman's operator's name was Daisuke Hayami in Japan. So, I'm not sure. Are these similarities coincidence? Was this deliberate? Who knows? I think it's time we had another interview with the developers. All EXE works are canon. This delves into the idea that every EXE work is canon to each other in some way. A multiverse theory. There are various incarnations of Mega Man.exe and its friends, and each of them has their own adventures, but they are also all interconnected together. Some evidence for this could be that the Rockman EXE Wonderswan game is based on the anime, which is based on a game, and because the anime was being developed alongside the third game, and airing slightly before, some of the roles have been shared between characters. In the anime, how does Proto Man have a Z Saber battle chip if Zero, the one who gives this battle chip, doesn't appear until Beast Plus? Does the Gundo Soul showing up in Battle Story Rockman EXE mean that the Boktai side quest is canon? Do the arcade games count as well, since Battleship Stadium is featured in the manga? Why do action figures or posters of non-celebrity characters from the EXE series exist? Is it like Transformers, where some of the entities are singularity points that exist across all incarnations? Or perhaps like Digimon, where Adventure and Adventure Zero Two exist as an IP within Tamers, and yet they are all interconnected? Multiverses are often a tricky concept when it comes to works of fiction, and I don't really know if I'm the best one to tackle this particular subject. I personally don't buy into this as being an existing possibility, simply because every incarnation of the series is too different. Character motivations, battle mechanics, world build, power scaling, it's all too inconsistent in between versions to try to make it all work as one big narrative. I would love to see a Battle Network multiverse explored, though. Maybe give us a fan game that takes influence from the manga and anime, and let us fight against characters exclusive to those versions, like Bug Riser and Slur. But in defense of this idea, the anime does give us the world of Beyond Art, which has some elements more faithful to the games than the rest of the anime series up to that point. Maybe the games and manga exist as their own versions of Beyond Art, just parallel universes to the main Earth from the EXE anime? Who really knows? Finally, we've reached the end. If you stuck with us through this multi-hour chronicle of varying trivia, I want to extend my most sincere thanks. This has been the most ambitious video project I've undertaken to date, and it certainly wouldn't have been possible without the many contributors to this iceberg. Special thanks to Memer Deluxe 1111, Kaisan, LB Man, Shadow Rock ZX, Alicia Pixels, Emmanuel EXE, Celtic Guardian 1020, Taraj 42, The Venom Spino, Net Ghost, Bigfoot Hunter V2, Robofur, Joel Baker, Light Blue, Luminator, Y-Chan, Race, People Who Play With EXE, Chaos Max 1268, Brain Gumpack, Halbertier V2, Nerdler, Natalia, Blake Blast, Arquay Brunstud, Archmage MC, Adel Flayed, Hyper Encrypted 12345, Igor Lopes, Dante Copy, Aura EXE, Bembo Quest Guy, Adamant Capone, Kaiden X, Model R, Blubbery Blub, Luis Lopez, Triggs, Pluck Inc., Danny Jenny Arts, Pick Angel 13, 010 Last, Just Chill, Adam the Game Boy, Mara Knight, Golden Gamer 170, Kurao X56S, Dog Vader, Dark Neutral Guy, Zyro, Mercenary Tigre, Romanki, Flangley, Pedro Rivera, Alexis Ramist, Hero Ron, Midnight WV4, 
MHF Silver, Debonair Livestreams, Action Esports, The Mega Man Knowledge Base, The Rockman Corner, The Rockman EXE Zone, and you, the viewer. It's been a very eventful year, hasn't it? When we started this project in January of 2022, who could have predicted how far things would have come, not just in this project or here on the channel, but for Rockman EXE as well? The anime is currently on YouTube for the public to watch for free, even if only temporarily, some of the manga is on the official Capcom website, and we're mere days away from the release of the Battle Network Legacy Collection. The past year has been incredibly kind to us as fans of this IP, and I think I can say without hesitation that there's never been a better time to be a fan of Rockman EXE. Going forward, I hope that the community will stay linked and continue to grow closer via our cyber society and online net battles. Once again, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you all so much from everyone here at Flashing Blades Productions. We'll see you on the grid on April 14th. This has been Blade Cross EXE, and remember, no matter what, we're always connected. Done. Finally. Uh. <laughs>